I think we'll get started. I first want to thank all of you for, for making it here at 8.30 a.m. This is a welcome to the first session at Java One, at least as far as I know. Uh, my name is Hassan Shafi. Um, I'm a director of research and advanced development at Oracle Labs, and with me is Yi Wu, who's the architect uh, at, uh, at the Oracle uh, Space Home Graph team. So we're here to um, conduct this tutorial on um, building a, a Java recommender uh, system in 15 minutes using graph technology. This is gonna cover two topics. Um, one is introducing you to graph, um, what it's about, uh, what are some of the use cases for graph. Uh, we will talk about um, a product we have in this space, uh, which, which will, will show how we can use this product to build, to build uh, the, these recommenders. Um, so before I start, I wanted to take a quick poll. How many of you guys are familiar uh, with graph and graph topics, graph technology, graph analytics? Show of hands. Okay, cool, nice. And how about recommenders for machine learning? Okay, cool. So, uh, so hopefully uh, those of you who are familiar will learn uh, a little bit more and, and uh, it will be a good introduction for those of you who are not familiar. So with that, I'll kick it off. Um, this slide will probably get familiar to you. Uh, by the end of the um, conference. Uh, so here we'll talk about some stuff, uh, special, essentially some advanced features, and so uh, those, those might not be reflected in, in our product yet. So here's the agenda. So we'll first introduce a graph, what's a graph, what it's about. Then we'll talk about the common graph use cases that, that we're, we're, we're encountering, that we're thinking about. Uh, we'll go over um, a, uh, the product we have in this space, Big Data Spatial and Graph, uh, some of the features uh, it has, and we'll intersperse that with uh, demonstrations on how we can use the graph uh, to build these recommendation engines. Now, even though we're using um, uh, our product, uh, you can actually you know, use other tools. This is still going to be very useful to you in general because the, the, the approaches we're going to talk about are very general in terms of building recommendation engines. So what, what's a graph? So a uh, graph is basically a collection of, of, of vertices and edges. Vertices are, are essentially can represent anything. Vertices can have properties. And then edges are how these vertices are connected. So you can think of a graph as simply as linked data. Um, and so why do we care? Well, graphs are everywhere. Um, you think about road networks, um, social networks, uh, knowledge graphs, these are all examples. I mean, the web, when it's uh, the, the citation graph in the web, these are all examples of graphs. Uh, if you think about whenever you think of a problem, you start drawing on, 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 the, on the whiteboard. You typically draw a graph when you try to model anything. So, so graph is really just a, a more natural model than if you were to store things, for example, as tables. And tables that have foreign key constraints have graphs hidden in them. Uh, and so graphs are intuitive and they're flexible. 
Um, and let's talk about why would you want to model your data as a graph. So first, graph allows you to deal with unstructured data. Typically, graphs have a flexible schema. You don't have ahead of time to decide, here are how all my tables are look like, here are all how all my columns are going to look like. You can just start creating a, a, a data model, add vertices, add key value pairs to the vertices, connect these vertices, post facts. Uh, you don't have to really settle on a schema. Long, you know, after a while, you may want to decide to constrain things uh, just to, to kind of make yourself sane, but graph strikes a really nice balance between uh, schema freedom and, and the ability to, to, uh, to, um, to still take advantage of that data sorting edge. Uh, because of that, it allows you to easily integrate various data sources. So because of that flexible schema, you can gradually bring more data into your graph. You can start with a graph of just people. You know, let's say you have a, uh, a, a data set about transactions, let's say. You know, you're, you're, you're a retail store and you have transactions. Well, you can start building a graph with who's buying what. Right? And then let's say you get, you, you, you do a partnership with Twitter, you now are able to uh, connect, figure out how these p people that are purchasing items in your store are connected together, so now you, have, you can add that information. So you can just keep adding more information to your graph. As you add more and more information, the graph itself becomes value, more valuable, you can ask more, more complicated questions. And even though the graph is, uh, schema free or flexible in terms of schema, you can still execute if you have a specialized graph engine, you can still execute very efficient graph queries against your data. So you can still query your data very efficiently, um, essentially ask very complicated questions and, and have the results uh, um, be returned to you. Uh, and it also enables new kinds of uh, anal analytics. So recommendation would be one. We're going to cover all the other ones, and then we're going to show you in more detail how you can build a recommendation engine using uh, a graph. So I want to place the graph in, in the context of big data. You know, everybody's talking about big data. So, so if, if you're thinking about big data, well, where does graph fit in my big data toolbox? So just, uh, just to remind everybody, well, what, what is big data? Uh, big data is whenever you have data that has a few of the characteristics we're displaying here. Volume, you get lots of it. It doesn't have to have all of these, but some of them, right? Uh, velocity, it's coming at you fast. Variety, it's, it's different kind of data. You can't really kind of put it into some kind of structure. You have to deal with, with, with with forms and veracity, or sometimes called value, is that they're, they're, the data is valuable. The data, you can do something with this data. The problem with the big data problem is the size of the, and the amount of data you have, right? So you basically have to store this large amount of data, and typically big data has a low value per byte. That's why people are trying to, you know, that's why database, for example, is not a good approach to storing these big data problems. It's an expensive solution, so people are figuring out less expensive ways of storing these large amount of data. Okay, but storing the data is not sufficient. Now you have to get the value, squeeze the value out of this data, and the data have low value per byte. So how do you get useful information out of these huge data sets? Well, there's many methodologies. One is classic OLAP, so you're basically doing kind of analytical queries, uh, statistical analysis, machine learning, uh, as some of you may be familiar with. And so this is where graph fits in. Graph is just yet another tool in your toolbox to squeeze the value out of your data. Uh, and uh, people refer to the case where graph analysis is useful to this idea of valence. If you remember your chemistry class, electrons have, uh, atoms have valence electrons around them. Those are the electrons that connect uh, the two molecules together. So data that has high valence means data that is highly connected, that's where graph can help you. A easier way to think about this, for those who are familiar with machine learning and, and build predictive models, graph can just enhance these existing pipelines. So typically you'll have some raw data, your big data, you'll extract some features, you'll extract some columns from this data. So for example, if you had logs, you would extract the source, the destination, uh, the size of the, you know, the length of the connection. Um, you may also, uh, you may, so you may have features. So for example, also you could have uh, items that represent houses. The features would be the price, the square footage, how many bathrooms you have. 
So you can take this data and essentially cast it into a graph if it's appropriate, if it's connected, if, if you can link the data together somehow. And once it's uh, connected into a graph, once it's, it's, it's passed into a graph, then you can generate some new features out of this data, including, for example, how connected is an individual node in the graph? How many, what's the in, uh, average degree, or what's the number of people connecting in? What's the number of people connecting out? What are, well, how influential is this graph? What's the page rank value? So you can derive many more new features, and those features are gonna lead to better predictive models, because you just have more signals now that you can feed into your predictive model. So if you're already used to building predictive models, then graph just adds more signals into that, and, and thus can, can potentially increase accuracy. So we're gonna now looking to uh, give you a little bit more detail in terms of, okay, I have some data, why should I, create, why should I bother creating a graph out of it? What are some of the uh, use cases? What are some of the questions I can start answering? And so we'll go over uh, these use cases. Uh, and what we'll do is present general high-level classes of problems you can solve. So these are not specific to any particular business problem. They're general cases. And then you can apply them to many, many different domains. And so we'll give you the general use case, the general uh, area, uh, the general analytic, and then we'll give you an example use case within this use case. So the uh, four things we'll discuss is reachability, uh, anomaly detection, centrality analysis, and, and, and recommendation. And so we'll go into some detail on this. So the first, the first one is reachability. So in here, once you construct a graph in a large data set, you want to ask the question, given a particular node in this data set, what are the other entities uh, that are connected to this given node? And how are the entities connected? How, do, how can I go from this node to, the, to this other node? or which nodes are reachable from this one node. And the approach is, once you have uh, the, the data model as a graph, then you, you simply just traverse the graph starting from a given vertex. Typically, if you have a graph engine, it's gonna give you uh, many different kinds of traversals. So, okay, so what is this useful for? What are some of the use cases? Well, there's many use cases for, 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 for reachability. I'll give you a few. So one is supply chain management. So if you basically uh, can construct a, a graph of your supplier. Let's say you're a company and you have a bunch of suppliers, then you can, for example, uh, look at which products are affected by which supplier quite easily. You can start answering these questions. You can answer the question of what's the, what's the, what's the <coughs> risk? You know, uh, do I rely too much or too many products relying on this one supplier, right? Uh, if you're a big company and you're acquiring companies and then you make an acquisition, if you take the two supply chains, put them together, then you wanna ask the question, what has happened to my overall supply chain? Do I now have more risk, okay? So this is, this is one use case. Uh, cyber security and cyber threat analysis graphs are used quite a bit now in figuring out, in both defending, basically figuring out, let's say one system gets compromised, what else could it reach? Do I have one system that is essentially uh, more central and you don't want that. You don't want a you know, heavily central system in my network. And so if that, that system goes down, then more of my network is exposed. And if you cannot avoid it, then you better, better make sure that system gets more attention in terms of security uh, prevention than other systems. Uh, once an uh, incident occurs, then you can start doing forensics with the graph. Okay, they were here. Which parts could they have reached? Uh, you can trace through the log you know, their, basically uh, their progression in your network. So this is, this is a key use case for, for graph. Border protection. Uh, so basically uh, you have use cases where you have, a, for example, a suspect or, or, or a member of a cartel or criminal gang or criminal network. And you're trying to, trying to establish what other potential uh, cohorts or collaborators or, 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 or associated people uh, can you find uh, from this one person or set of people? So you can start answering with this reachability use case, start answering questions to deal with that. And then national health use cases. Uh, we are all aware of some recent national scares from the Zika virus, the Ebola virus. Sometimes you have the issue of someone traveling in identified as, as being infected. Now you have to trace back and find out, well, who were they in contact with? Who? flew together with this other person. 
Okay, that's one level. How about the second level, the third level, right? So, so this, is, this is where we're asking about for this particular use case. So that's one. The next important use case that's kind of a, a graph special, not, you know, very few other uh, machine learning techniques can give you this answer, is given a graph or given now that you have this network, identify the vertices that are relatively more important than others in the network. And so the way you do this is once you construct the graph, there are a variety of algorithms. So again, if you're using a, 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 a good graph uh, engine or a good graph package, it will give you many such metrics. And there's not just one, it's a whole theory. There's, there's papers coming out every few years on how to compute centrality. This is what we call it, the centrality. Uh, here's a few examples. And just to show you some of the differences between them, so on the, the figure below, so these are some of the examples. PageRank is, is the most famous. Uh, hopefully, uh, probably many of you have heard of PageRank. PageRank is, is what enabled Google to essentially, you know, become the, the billion dollar company has become. It's, it, it approached the problem of giving you uh, or ranking the websites as a graph problem, right? So they, they connected all the websites together, they devised this algorithm called PageRank, and now they're able to, uh, they're able to show you list, uh, the graphs listed in, in, in order of importance as opposed to the previous methods, which was just directory. So that's PageRank. And PageRank is shown, it's a little bit like Eigen Centrality, so, uh, so it's, it's a little bit like the picture on, on, the, on the right, where uh, you see here some red, some the, 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 the pieces that are red, hopefully you can see that. The definition there is if I'm connected to someone who's important, if someone who's important is pointing to me, then I myself am important. That's the measure, that's the page rank measure. Um, if you contrast that with between the centrality, between the centrality is a measure of whether I, essentially I'm a broker, whether someone has to go to get from point A to point B has to go through me, right? So that's a different measure. Um, and so, 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 so depending on your, 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 your use case, you may want to try different ones and see which ones make sense. So one use case uh, for applying this is, is customer churn analysis. So customer churn analysis, you're, you're a mobile network company, you have a data set that, that is, you call relationship between customers. So every time a customer calls another customer, that's an edge in your graph. And in this case, you want to identify important users among your customers. Who are the customers that are most connected, <coughs> that actually call the, many, the most people? And those guys, you may want to try harder to keep because they talk to a lot more people. So if they, you know, especially in, in the U.S., it's not a big deal, but in other co countries, it's very competitive. The mobile space is very competitive. So if someone leaves, then they may pull other people with them because maybe they'll have this, you know, free call my relatives kind of plan, which are very popular overseas. You can also use this, for example, uh, for a, a human resource kind of application where you're trying to determine who are the most uh, influential people within your company, who is talking to who. So that's, uh, that's influential uh, identification. The next one is anomaly detection, okay? So here, given a large data set, you wanna identify entities that stand out, vertices that look different than others, especially in their relationships, okay? And two ways of doing this. One is a pattern-based approach. And so this is, for example, PayPal uses a graph to represent every single transaction. They have a, uh, whenever a transaction comes in, it's actually represented as a graph. This person is connected from this IP, is purchasing at this, at this merchant, here is the item. And then they have specific patterns that they flag for fraud and then kind of your transaction will be delayed or won't go, go through. So that's kind of pattern-based. And, and also, uh, for example, uh, this is applied for money laundering. So money laundering has specific patterns that people look for in a transaction graph. For example, if money is moving in circles, you know, typically that's a sign that uh, money is being laundered, okay? Uh, so that's one approach. The other approach is computing metrics. So you have a bunch of analytics and you take groups of people that are supposed to be the same. For example, uh, you take a bunch of uh, 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 people of a certain age, of a certain a demographic, of a certain in a certain location, of a certain level of income, and then you look at the items they, they're purchasing, okay? And if you compute some metrics, if the metrics are different for some of them, that's a flag. That means this person is behaving differently than the group that you think they should belong to. 
So how do, how do we apply this? What's the use case? So one, one uh, application we've done uh, with this recently is looking for uh, potential fraud in uh, medical, uh, medical records, Medicare records in, in particular. So here we took uh, the, the Medicare uh, provider record and we've constructed the graph out of it. So basically the graph has the medical providers and their operations. And then the question is, are there any medical providers that are suspicious? Medical providers that perform different kind of operations than their peers, okay? So for example, eye doctors doing a lot of plastic surgery. And so the approach is here is you create a graph between doctors and operations. This is referred to as a bipartite graph. There's two sides to it, left side, right side. Uh, and then you can just take groups of doctors that are in the same specialty and run personalized page rank on them. And what you would expect is that those doctors would have the same or close page rank value. So if you notice a doctor has a much lower page rank value in that set than the other doctors, that means they're behaving in a different way. So that's, uh, that's, an, that's something you can do. And then recommendations, that's another key use case. So this is, uh, again, that same bipartite setup. So here, given a bipartite graph, it could be a customer item purchase uh, uh, record graph, where on the left-hand side you have customers, on the right-hand side you have items, and then the links are whenever they purchase something or whenever they've rated something. And you can put information on the edge. For example, what was the rating? You know, how, 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 big, how big was the number, right? So once you can do that, then you can start, once you set up the graph and you have, for example, uh, then you have a few ways you can predict links. You can predict essentially uh, appropriate purchases for your customers, or this could even, for example, in some applications could, could, could be outcomes, right? So uh, here are these people, here's the outcomes. Well, do I predict a certain outcome for a particular uh, user or, or item on the, on the left? So there are a few techniques, and we're gonna actually show you three ways of solving uh, this problem of building a recommendation engine, which is pretty hot topic these days. So uh, we'll close with the, the first one, which is collaborative filtering, which is one of the more powerful techniques. Um, and there, we're trying to find similarity signatures, and we'll cover that. Um, and then there are other techniques that we'll go over, for example, personalized page rank, and we'll explain why that works, uh, as well as uh, search-based techniques. So one use case you can, you, can, you, can, uh, you can take this a step further with is once you have recommendations, uh, you essentially can, can think of the, the, the vectors that result from the collaborative filtering, which again we'll, we'll look at in more detail, as signatures or ta taste signatures. Basically these are things that are telling you what a particular user it is like, right? It's kind of like the, the, uh, the checksum of the user, right? And so you can take those signatures and then use them to cluster your users. Basically, you run another machine learning algorithm like K-means, which tries to put these users into groups. Well, why, why would I care about doing that? Well, you use that for segmentation. So if you're interested in, for example, figuring out are there groups, are there you know, specific groups in my customer base? You know, they're buying stuff and I build this recommendation engine. Now, what are the groups? Once you figure out the groups, what can you do? Well, you can try to understand what these groups are. How would they be different? Why would I care about that? Because then you can have better messaging. You can have more targeted marketing campaigns. You can have more targeted experiences for these users. And so that's why, why this would be useful. Okay, so that, those are the, the, the general use cases. Uh, so now we'll talk about what we're, Oracle is offering in this space to help you solve some of these use cases. Uh, and, and we'll go over uh, some of the uh, some of the some of the product features we have, as well as demonstrate uh, how we can build these recommendation engine using these th three three different approaches. So our, our strategy in the space is to support graph data types on all of our platforms. Uh, so we basically want if you're a database user, if you're an Oracle database user, for example, you're going to have some graph support there. If you're a Java user and a big data uh, kind of user, so we ha we're going to have an offering for you. And we're going to talk mostly about our big data offering, which is uh, an offering that's integrated with Hadoop and Yarn. And so if you're a Java developer, it's going to get you started really fast. You're going to be able to essentially run these analytics really fast and, and, and build your application. 
So one key decision you have to make if you're interested in graph is what kind of data model you want to uh, essentially use. And there are two data models. We don't, we're not going to talk about the other one. There's the RDF data model, which has kind of uh, been around for a while and is, is actually a standard-based model um, that's used for um, cases where you have many data, many types of uh, sources of data and you need to connect them or you need to do inferencing, you need to do these kinds of things. So basically, this is a model, if you, if you will know you need it, if you need it, you'll find it. Uh, but the model that people are getting excited about, at least in, in kind of the Java community, is the property graph model, which is a lot more flexible, a lot more easier to use. Uh, it's, and that's a little bit, uh, a little bit, it's uh, the con, is, is it doesn't say much. It's very simple to use, so there's not a lot of, a lot of built-in, uh, uh, you know, features around just the model itself. So, so the model is just, you have a set of vertices, basically, or nodes, and each vertex has a unique identifier, and then, you can connect these vertices together via, via edges, and the vertices can have arbitrary key value pairs. So this is, think of this as a key value store, except you have entities, and then you can connect those entities via sets of edges. The edges themselves have uh, arbitrary key value pairs. Uh, and then that's what most people agree on, but then that's, also, that's where the diversion starts happening. Some people talk about labels. Labels are types, so you can have Vertices have different labels. Some people support labels on vertices. Some people don't. Some people support multiple labels on vertices. So this is where kind of things get a little bit different. Uh, so we're keeping track of kind of uh, and, and leading here in terms of uh, our support in terms of, uh, you know, from the use cases, what, what's needed here. So property graph model. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it uh, to Z, uh, who's going to talk to you about uh, our big data spatial and graph product. And then we'll also demo uh, one approach to building the the the, the, uh, the recommender. So uh, this big data spatial and graph model has we've released this 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 was work that essentially started uh, with our uh, or part of the work at least the work I work on is uh, started at, at at Stanford when I, when we were working on our PhD we came up with this domain specific language for for property for 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 graphs and so we, we kind of evolved that and built a very fast analytical engine. Uh, it's it's um, uh, essentially, we think, is the fastest commercially supported um, analytic engine. It has 39 built-in uh, algorithms. So like some of the examples we, we've shown, and uh, just, just lots of useful stuff to build your app. So we'll go over some of the features. Thank you, Hassan. Can you hear me OK in the back? OK, great. Now let me, uh, before I dive into uh, the details of the recommender system, let me give you a quick a feature overview of uh, big data spatial and graph. So here is an architecture diagram, okay. At the bottom, um, we have different choices of backend data sets. Right? On the big data platform, you can store the graph data in Apache Edge base or Oracle NoSQL data. In the middle, we have a common data access layer. It implements Java interfaces, um, Blueprints APIs, also it has integration with uh, Solar Cloud and Apache vSync. So those are for indexing uh, graph elements. On the very top, we have a really powerful graph analytical engine. We call it Parallel In-Memory Graph Analytics PGM. As uh, Hassan mentioned, uh, we support 39 plus, you know, really powerful parallel graph analytics, okay, out of the box. Um, if you are building a web application, we also have REST interface, we have Python uh, interface. As far as the uh, graph format goes, we support the popular GraphML, GML, GraphJSON, GraphSyn, and Oracle defined um, so-called flat files, okay? So for each graph, we can encode the property graph using a vertex file and an edge file, okay? Those two are nine by nine records by records. It's really simple to use, really simple to parse and generate. And we also have utilities to help you to convert 
from CSV files or from relational data sources into Oracle-defined topic runner <coughs> format. This is really important because a common question we got all the time is that, how do I start, right? I have this bunch of data sitting somewhere. How do I turn this into a graph? So that's why we are having these utilities to help you to get started. Now, I have described the, uh, the architecture for big data platform. For the upcoming 12.2, okay, so we are going to introduce additional backend. So the backend is Oracle Database 12.2. If you are Oracle Database user, once you have 12.2, then you are going to have profit graph feature in the database. Okay, so this is additional backend. Now let me first describe quickly uh, what are the formats. Right? As I mentioned, we support the typical formats, GraphML, GML, and JSON format. Okay. So here I'm giving you a, uh, uh, an example of the flat file for what is this. It's nine by nine. So in the first nine we have, can you see it in the back? Is it too small? Oh, it's good. Okay, so the, uh, you see this uh, one comma, okay, this guy, okay. One comma name, one Barack Obama, right? So this means that, uh, this is a vertex ID one, the key, right? We are talking about property graphs. So there are key value pairs associated with vertices and edges. So in this case, there's a key value file name equal to Barack Obama. So there's a little bit of encoding of spaces, commas, uh, but this file is UTF-8 based. It's really easy to use and pass, okay? And we uh, support daytime, uh, different uh, booleans, different numeric types, um, and even serializable. So it's really flexible format with strong data type support. Now, this, uh, we are providing this utility to convert from CSV to property graph flat files. Here is a quick example. You have a CSV, right? Um, column, the first column uh, is a numeric column, and the second column is a person name, like this one, one, John, and then a few numeric values, right? So we have this utility to help you to define the mapping, right? So which column in the CSV goes to a uh, uh, key value pair in the uh, property graph data model, which column becomes a relationship in a graph, okay? So you define this column to attribute a uh, mapping, and then by invoking a simple, a single API, you can produce a uh, graph output. Similarly, we have a uh, relational table to graph uh, conver converter uh, is a utility, right? Take this employee table, for example. You have employee ID, you have name, you have age, salary, etc. right? How do we convert this into a, a graph format? It's really trivial, you define a mapping. So again, which column goes to a, a key value pair, which column becomes a relationship, right? And then, after you're applying a, uh, after you're invoking the Java API, you get a graph like this, right? So different vertex IDs and different key value pairs encoded using the serialization that Oracle defined. Any questions so far? Yes. The original file can be just columns, like it was you described, right? The, col uh, the uh, name, the uh, salary, the date of birth, right? And then you define a column to attribute a mapping, right? You map the second column to a salary key value pair, right? You map the third column to a date of birth uh, key value pair. So that's how you define the mapping from your CSV or from your relational columns into a property.
Oh, it's, it's really simple. For example, right, uh, if you have, oh, yes. How do you um, define relationship, right? Um, for example, in your CSCV file, you have um, friend, right? Two friend column, right? So John and Mary. And then you can easily define a mapping, okay? We treat John as a source vertex. We treat Mary as a destination vertex. And there you go, you have a relationship, okay? So quickly for the, uh, so remember in the uh, architecture diagram, we have uh, in the middle, right, a uh, uh, data access layer API. Okay? So this is a common set of APIs that covers all those different ba um, backend databases. Okay? So for this core API, Java APIs, we support blueprints. So this is kind of like the de facto property graph um, Java APIs. Um, we also support Gremlin, which is a traversal language. And uh, because you know, Rexter is a technology stack on top of uh, Blueprints and Gremlin, we also support uh, Rexter. So this gives a uh, REST interface. If you are a C-sharp user, right, you don't have to use the Java APIs, you can use the REST interface to interact with the uh, property graph functions that we have. So this is an example of how to use the uh, REST interface. You start the REST interface by kicking off the Rexter via shell script. There's an XML file, which is the you know, configuration file. You define which database, right? For example, if you are using an Oracle NoSQL database, now what's the host name, what's the port, what's the key value store name, right? The edge base, you define Zookeeper, the port, the quorum, et cetera. So you have this configuration file, and you say, hey, let's start the Rexter interface. Okay, boom, we have the REST uh, API up and running. So once you have that, right, it's really easy to create a vertex or create a new edge or, or delete something or to run some simple queries. So here, um, we are using a few curl-based uh, examples, right? To show you, for example, how to create a new vertex without anything, right? I just want to create this new vertex with ID 1001. We also have a Python interface. You know, uh, when we are talking to some of the internal sales guys, sales consultants, right? Many of those people they use Python to build some quick uh, POCs, right, for the customers they are interacting with. So Python binding is kind of uh, really useful for them. So for that, we have uh, a set of Python binders. In this case, um, this chart shows, you know, in IPython notebook, right you can easily use property graph functions and then do some charting. So we have a nice, really tight integration with Apache, uh, Solar Cloud, and Lucene. Lucene is really uh, a widely adopted uh, open source text engine, text search engine, right? How many of you have used Lucene in your projects? Probably many people. And uh, you know, as you know, here we are talking about big graph, right? On big data or on Oracle database, we are talking about a huge amount of graph data, right? Sometimes if you say, if you want to build a recommended system, you want to recommend something for a person, but how do you locate that person, right? So you need a text engine to help you define your starting points. So that's why we have this uh, tight integration with those two popular uh, search engines. The way to use them is really simple. You just create an index, right? So you call this API, create an index <coughs> on a particular property. Say you have vertices, right? Vertices have names or salaries or location, so you can create an index on those different columns or different key value pairs. Once you have that, then you can do wide card query. For example, find me vertices that start with a keyword something or contain something or have some, you know, do some fuzzy matching, et cetera. Now, solar uh, is a technology uh, built on top of uh, Apache Lucene, right? One of the really nice thing about solar, it has, you know, distributed sharding of the text index, okay? And it also has faceted search. 
So that's a very nice uh, if you are building something, uh, building a nice application in the recommender system. Um, here is just a few quick examples of uh, the solar capabilities, right? For example, you can do this, you know, uh, chief officer tier the one, right? This will match not just the chief officer, but also match chief security officer, right? So one position away of your query, okay? So you can do range search, like uh, if you have a title attribute of your vertices, right? Then you can search from bold to bolder, right? It matches all those keywords and the keywords in between. And if you have uh, index <coughs> on numeric um, key value pairs or the properties, you can also do numeric search uh, with the uh, like 12.99 to 14 something or from a starting date to an end date. Okay. So this is this one I want uh, I want to call out. It's called customized boost. Okay. So what is this? Our products or users have different key value pairs or different attributes. When you do a query, sometimes you want to say, hey, well, I want to give a little boost of a particular attribute, right? So there's this syntax. So say I want to find a, um, something with a title cool graph that includes the two keywords, cool graph. And also description, cool graph. So there are two fields. This cool graph can show up in two different places. But I want to give more weight to the document that have cool graph in their titles. So there's this, you know, uh, particular syntax you can boost. So this is important. If you are building a recommender system, if you have many features, many signals, sometimes you want to fine tune, right? Because you get user feedback about your recommendation, so you want to tune, hey, I think this signal matters more. So you can use this kind of syntax to give more boost to a particular feature. Yes. It's a great question. So it's more about you know Elasticsearch versus Solar. Why did we pick Solar? Okay. Um, to be frank, so one of the reasons we pick uh, Solar is you know our product, right? The big data spatial graph goes with Cloudera, okay, CDH. Cloudera has built-in Solar Cloud, so it's much easier for our customers to set it up. Okay. And uh, at the feature side, both Solar and Elasticsearch are sitting on top of uh, Apache VC. So they're feature-wise, they're very similar, but Elasticsearch is now a little bit more hard and more sexier than uh, Solar Cloud. Okay. So we are, we are looking into Elasticsearch in the near future. Great question. So now, so let's uh, get our hands dirty. Um, let's talk about how to build a recommender system with properties. So this is the first part. So what is a recommender system? So everybody here understand what a recommender, sy recommender system is. Every day we open up Netflix, right? So you, as soon as you finish one movie, you better start recommending new stuff. You may also like this, right? Because you have watched this and that movies in the past. Similarly on Amazon, right? Ever since you uh, start purchasing a book, or some digital SLR, you will see all kinds of recommendation, okay, once you open the page. Usually, we adopt a simple graph model here. On the left, you see a set of users, right? On the right-hand side, you see a set of services or products or items, okay? So the relationship is a user click on a particular page, or user purchase a particular item, or user subscribe to a particular service. Okay. Really simple graph, really simple relationships. For certain algorithms, you may also want to put a rating on the edges, right? For example, if you have purchased an item, if you also have the rating information, right, you can associate and weight or rating, a rate equal to 3.5, right? on the edge relationship, linking the user and a product or a user to a service. Okay, is it clear, the graph model? Excellent. So we have, we offer quite a few different approaches out of the box. Okay, 
So that's why we have this uh, build a recommender system in 15 minutes in the title. Um, to be honest, you know, there are many, many different approaches to build a recommender system. Here we talk about three that are really relevant to graph technologies. And here, all these three technologies can be mixed together. So, so these days, when people are building a recommender, sy recommender system, they sometimes use a so-called ensemble, right? They use a few different algorithms, right? And they pick the majority of the vote, right? If the system one vote, hey, you may, in you may be interested in item one, system two disagrees, but system three agrees with the first one, then two out of three, right, we can pick that recommendation as the final output. So here, there are three uh, ap approaches. The first one is content-based uh, recommendation. So the idea is really simple. Um, given a, a product or service, that usually are uh, some descriptive text, right? For example, if you are looking at a, a pair of shoes, then in the dis descriptive uh, text you may have, this is the leather shoes, this is the color is black. So you have a descriptive text uh, with some keywords, right? Content-based filtering essentially look at the text, and based on your past uh, purchase history, because you have interested in an item with this description, and this new item has similar description, right? So we can recommend this new item to this user. Make sense? The second <coughs> approach is collaborative filtering. Okay, so in this case, right, um, we have a matrix in the middle. So rows are representing a user and they are rating for different items. The columns are representing different items or services. So as you can imagine, uh, in a large uh, e-commerce system, right, you may have millions of users and millions of products. Right? For each user, that user may have only purchased or used 10, 20, 100 different services or have purchased 100 different products. That's, that's impossible for a particular user to have purchased every single item, right? It's just too much, okay? So let's use one million user and one million products, for example. So this matrix, right, is really sparse, a sparse matrix. But there are tons of data inside. If you store that in a naive fashion, right, you will have one million times one million, that's a training sales. Even if you just encode each cell using one byte, there's a lot of uh, disk space, a lot of memory space you have to allocate. So with um, a graph, right, we can encode this structure really efficiently in a very compact manner, okay? And this CF algorithm, collaborative filtering, right, we are use some mathematics using matrix factorization, right? to come up with a too much smaller matrix. In a way, it's like compression, right? It kind of encodes the signature, the paste signature that Hassan mentioned, right? Of the users and also of the products, okay? And then once you have computed those two, matri uh, two much smaller matrices, you can then do multiplication, right? To predict, okay, the rating for a user and uh, between this user and uh, all those uh, new products this user has not purchased before. Okay. The third approach is to use personalized page rank. Hassan talked about page rank, right? Page rank is a very interesting algorithm you can use to identify influences in a graph. So personalized page rank is similar, but with a small twist. So basically you start from, say, a user, right? We want to do recommendation for user job. User Jiang is encoded as a vertex in our graph, right? So from Jiang, we start to perform random walk in the graph, right? From Jiang to the products Jiang has purchased, right? And from the, those products, back to some other users who have purchased that particular product, okay? We do this kind of random walking, right? From user to products, back to user, back to, and then to another product, right? With a random, jump back to jump. So as you can see, so this kind of random walking with restart back to jump, right, is pretty good at exploring all those products that jump has purchased and all those users who have similar taste to jump, okay? Now, 
Let's get to the first demonstration to build a content filtering based recommendation using property graph and solar cloud. Any questions so far? I'm going to sit down, if you don't mind, it's easier for me to. Um, so here's the setup, right? Um, we have a movies data set. Okay? Um, the original data is in relational form, and we convert that using the utility I was uh, talking about, right? Just with a single API call, you get the graph format. So the original movie data is about, you know, movies. Movies have different uh, attributes, right? One of them is plot. So we have a really nice description of you know, what this movie is about. Okay. And also we have this click relationship. So a particular user click, click is an edge and a movie. Really simple relationship, really simple graph. And in addition, we have some metadata about user. You know, what's the name, uh, what's the age, you know, where is the user located. So the flow starts with the you know, original data set, right, in relational form. We perform a simple uh, conversion. We store the graph in uh, big data spatial and graph. Here we pick an uh, Oracle NoSQL backend. Um, behind the scenes, we take care of the property graph schema storage. So you don't have to worry about how to define a table in NoSQL database, right, how to store them. We take care of uh, all those things for you. And then the uh, third step is to build a text index, right? Um, as I mentioned, movies have plot, right? Here we want to recommend movies based on their content, based on their description. So we build a solar index of the plot field of those vertices representing movies. Okay. We also build a, a solar index um, on the first name of the users so that we can quickly pinpoint. So which user do we want to run recommendation for? And the final name, so we can use this uh, Groovy script to, uh, to show the, uh, uh, find, uh, uh, to show the uh, recommended movies. So here you are looking at the screen, right? This is a big data light uh, virtual machine. Uh, it has the whole big data technology stack, the Hadoop, CDH. It has also uh, Oracle Relational Database and some tools for Oracle Relational Database. It's free for download if you want to give it a try. So it's on Oracle uh, OTN uh, network. Uh, Mr. Hong, uh, for instance, uh, when you download uh, some data from the Oracle Relational Database, uh, what is the data that you have? No, sorry, uh, we don't have this. Uh, this demo hosted uh, in the cloud or on OTN. But if you like, we can send you a pointer offline. Yeah, okay. yeah we can share some uh, of that information with you. Okay. It's an incentive for some of you to come and leave their business cards with us. We'll send you a link. <laughs> awesome. So we're going to use the Python, um, the so-called IPython note notebook. Okay, so you set up the class pass, and that's it. You click off the uh, IPython notebook uh, script. So I apply some notebook. So is this font too small for people sitting in the back? Yeah. Well, it's pretty hard for me to, to increase the font. So I, I try to uh, talk a bit more, okay. So the first chunk of code, right? This is really boilerplate. It's just uh, setting the UTF-8 encoding, okay. Um, this line is interesting, so we this is one of the Python wrapper we have, right? We connect to Oracle NoSQL database, right? This line of code. So the, uh, the property graph has a name movies, okay? This is stored in this particular database. So KB star, and this is the host name and port. So it, this is just to make a connection to the database. Okay. And then we're going to load up the graph data as I mentioned that we have this so-called flat files, right? So we have uh, one vertex file and one edge file. To load it up is really trivial. We just say load data. Here we uh, comment out because the graph is already loaded, okay? 
there's this argument number four. This says, okay, I want to load up the graph in parallel with a degree of uh, four threads into the backend database. So you don't have to worry about, you know, how to load up this data really efficiently in the backend, right? You just set, you know, uh, a single uh, degree of parallelism. So after we are done uh, loading the data into Oracle NoSQL database, right, we do some basic information collection. I say how many vertices here and how many edges, right? So it turns out we have about uh, 10,000 vertices. So this is a user movie graph. So this set of vertices um, consists of the users, a set of users, and a set of vertices, uh, and a set of uh, movies. And uh, there are about you know, 300,000 edges. Okay, this represent a user click on a movie and also a movie clicked by a different user. Okay, so two kinds of edges. Okay. So just to show you some of the details about, yes. Yeah, it's a different edge. So a user click on a movie, so this is the one edge, right? We have a movie clicked by a user, this is a different edge. But, the, but the edges are implicit, so basically, if a user clicked on a movie, that means there is an edge clicked by a user. Yes. Yeah. So you don't have to, you know, that, that we've created that. There is support for by direct uh, for uh, undirected graphs. So basically, you have directed graphs where there is a direction to the edges, and then you can take a directed graph and undirect it, and then remove the direction. Okay. Yes, but in this grid, uh, in this case, right, for this particular graph model, we we did create two edges okay, yeah. between a user and a movie. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, good question. Um, we've clarified the uh, the graph data model. <coughs> so here I'm showing a a vertex that encodes a, a particular movie. So the movie name is called Crank. Anybody watch mm -hmm. this movie before? Crank? Okay. Awesome, okay. And then it has a budget, right? Has growth. This, uh, from this part on, uh, this point on is the, uh, the plot, right? Crank is a 2006 American action film written by, you know, this is a, a few, quite a few paragraphs. The type is a movie. Uh, the year it was released is in uh, 2006. So this is a, a vertex representing a movie, right, with attributes describing this particular movie. Okay, let's move on. So here, uh, next I'm going to show you a, uh, an example of an edge, okay. So the edge has an ID number one. So it starts from a particular user I'm going to reveal the details of the user later on. The relationship is click. Okay, there's an edge from this user to this movie, and the edge has a label, click. Okay. And the destination vertex is that crank movie we just saw. Okay. Now, to give you an example about uh, a user vertex, right? So this vertex uh, represent, uh, represents a particular person called uh, Pat Vakan Bucci, right? So as you can see, the fonts are small, but this is a property about age, age is 33, and then, you know, uh, he's located in uh, you know, this particular city in Europe, countries in Italy, and street address is this one, <coughs> okay? And um, so this set of key value pairs describe a particular user, yes? Yes, so the question is, you know, we are showing the, uh, some serialization of the vertex and edges, right? Is this form, is this serialization form an industry standard or just pretty print? So answer is, it's just pretty print, okay? Because you can easily pull out all those properties, right? You can get the property with a name or get all properties, right? And you can choose whatever serialization that suits your application. 
So next, we are going to prepare to build a solar cloud index. Thank you. So for those uh, who are familiar with solar, you know that you have to define a node set of solar, and we hide a lot of the details behind the scenes. So the key APIs is to, to build the solar, uh, it creates the parameters, right, that are necessary to talk to a solar cloud. So now we are going to create an index, um, solar-based index on the plot. So this is the plot property of vertices, right? Remember, only movies have this plot attribute. So now we have the text index. We can run some uh, simple query to say, hey, find me a, a movie uh, which contains a keyword action. Not just contain keyword, but the, the keyword can show up anywhere okay, in the plot. So now it finds me a movie, okay, with a really long plot. It took me quite a while to pinpoint where the uh, action shows up. Mm -hmm. Okay, turns out it's uh, in this uh, receiving mixed reactions, right, because I'm using a wild card, right, so it finds this one. Okay. So this is just to demonstrate, if this is, uh, we are building a text index, you can do this kind of wild card search. Still has not much to do with a recommended system. So now, uh, we want to uh, say we know that a movie uh, uh, with a plot uh, contains this British hitman, right? We want to recommend, can you find similar movies, right, which have similar plot, okay? We are building a search term, okay? Um, if you are familiar with solar uh, uh, syntax, so this, you put them into a parenthesis, okay, British hitman, okay, then we have this API for you to create a solar query and then execute a solar query and return back the vertices that, that match those uh, particular query. Okay. So the first match is this crank, right? Crank actually contains this particular uh, keyword, British hitman. So given a movie, right, that we know we can start recommending uh, movies with similar plot. So second one uh, is a Japanese movie, again contains, um, it doesn't contain the keyword uh, British, but it contains the keyword Hitman. Okay. Then we have a, a third match, a third rec recommendation. Um, the title itself is Hitman, and also Hitman is in a plot. Okay. Now you get a rough idea. Okay, so we now know, you know, given a plot, how to find similar mo movies, right? But the goal is not that. The goal is that given the user, right, how do we recommend? So remember we have uh, thousands of users. How do we pinpoint a user, right? Again, we are using a text index. We create a text index on the first name um, property of vertices. Then you can find, you know, give me, uh, find me a person with name John, start with John. Um, then you find this uh, Johnny uh, with, uh, with age 30. <coughs> and uh, this is uh, the, uh, the address that John is located in. You can also say, hey, find me a first name. I remember a person um, whose name starts with Clarib, but I forgot the full name, right? So you start with C-L-A-R-I-B, you put a stop there, right, in this particular line. So we found a match. So there's a Clary Bell. Uh, it's a young uh, woman, uh, 24 years old, female, uh, located in Brazil. And uh, there's uh, quite a few other uh, properties describing Clary Bell. Now we want to do a uh, recommendation for Clary Bell. We assign this uh, vertex to variable Clary Bell. Okay, you can print it out. So now, how do we do recommendation for this particular user, Clary Bell? We can look at the, uh, the click history of Clary Bell, right? Because Clary Bell is a user in this graph. So what we look at, we examine the movies Clary Bell has clicked. Because those rep represent what she is interested in, right? <coughs> so here we are doing a little bit of a graph navigation. Start from this vertex, we follow outgoing edges, right, to the movies. Okay, that's it, so very simple. And then we can <coughs> list out all those movies, 
third vial has click. In this graph, <coughs> Clarivel has clicked three movies. <coughs> Excuse me. The first one is a risky business, <coughs> second one is a quiz show, and the third one is final destination. Okay. Now what do we do? We know uh, what movies Clarivel has clicked. Okay. It's really simple. We just grab the uh, plot of those movies and throw them to the solar cloud and say, hey, find me similar movies. So now we take the plot of the first movie, right? The risky business, and we put the the, uh, the plot here, and we build a query stream. <coughs> Excuse me. So the uh, <coughs> the uh, the query stream contains a risky business is a 1983 American teen comedy film written by yada yada yada. So we don't care about the details. Construct a query and send it to Solar. Okay. So this is all using the uh, the big data spatial and graph APIs. <coughs> we uh, send this to the Solar Index, and we get back results. Guess what? The first one is a uh, is a risky business itself, right? Because it has the exact match. Right? We took the plot of the first movie, Clarabel Click, right, which is risky business, and then we send it to the engine, Solar Cloud, say, hey, you know, we found a perfect match, okay, which is risky business. Of course, it is not that useful, right? We know that Clarabel has already clicked on that movie. So we move on to the next one. So the next one is never talk to strangers, okay. <laughs> Um, so if you look at the plot, you will understand why this is a match, why is it considered a match uh, by Solar Cloud. Okay. If we move on, um, you will find that Mission Impossible 2 is the third um, kind of recommendation. So here we find quite a few similar movies based on the content. So this is why this name is called content-based uh, uh, filtering, right? You look at the descript descriptive content, and then you recommend similar products. Of course, with uh, solar, you can do boost, right? For example, I care about final destination. I really love this, right? I want to give this term a boost, right? Or I don't care about team movies. I want to say not, the plot does not contain team, this keyword. Or if you say, hey, I care about movies before a particular year, right? So you can add this year from the very beginning to 1995. So you get the idea with the solar cloud integrated with big, uh, big data spatial and graph, you can easily build a recommender system using um, this text engine search combined uh, with a graph uh, structure. Okay. Okay, so so uh, Z demonstrated one way to search, right, using the built-in um, uh, solar uh, feature. Um, we also provide a much more graphy way of searching. So we provide an actual graph query language. This is in the, the most recent uh, release of our product. Uh, it's called the Property Graph Query Language, uh, PGQL. And uh, it provides you with a SQL-like syntax, uh, but with uh, graph pattern uh, description and property access. So we'll, we'll see an example. So this is an example query. Um, here I'm selecting, so if you've ever used SQL, this should be very familiar to you, except for the middle part. So here I'm selecting from a social network graph, um, a friend of a friend name and a friend of a friend age. And so where is that friend of a friend coming from? Well, it's from the, the pattern in the where clause, where I'm essentially sketching out my graph pattern using a little bit of an ASCII art. So if anybody is familiar with Cypher, so this is quite inspired by that, but it's combining both SQL and Cypher uh, because we believe that's the best is to actually take all the things that SQL already does and then just put a little bit of a, a graph pattern matching in there. So here, I'm looking for person. There's a colon there, colon person. That's the label. 
So I'm looking for a node that has labeled person with name equals Paul, and then there's an edge that has a label likes to a, uh, to a friend. Here, friend does not start with a colon, so I'm essentially binding that node. So once you find a, that particular node, I'm gonna bind it to the variable friend. Now, friend is my handle to that node, uh, which has a labeled person. So I'm finding a person that's named Paul that likes another person, okay? And I'm binding that person that is liked by Paul to the variable friend. And then I can continue, okay? And friend likes a friend of a friend that's person. So I'm trying now to find all the people that the friend of Paul likes, right? So I just, just, just kind of draw it out. Say, okay, friend, this friend I found likes this other person that is a friend of a friend. And then I can specify constraints. I can specify constraints on both the friend, the friend of the friend. I can specify cross constraints. Uh, so it's very natural once you kind of get your data into a graph to write these kind of queries. And this is, I think, a key advantage to the graph. It makes kind of complicated queries, especially in a complicated graph, you'd have to write like a lot of SQL uh, if you wanted to express a, a very graphy pattern. And this, this actually uh, helps you quite a bit there. And so, can, you, can, you, can you go more than one? Absolutely. Yes. Yes, I think, uh, let's see, do I have that? I uh, don't have that, but yes, we, we actually support very complicated uh, path. We even support regular uh, path queries where you can say uh, red, blue, star. Like actually a sequence of red, blue edges, right? Like, you know, clean closure of that. So, so we're, 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 we're really, really happy and excited about this query language and we're also um, uh, open sourced it, uh, the, 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 at least the, the language itself, the front end, the parser, the test kit. So, any, so we want basically, you know, if, if you are implementing a graph engine and you want to support this language, it's open source under a very permissive license, BSD license, and uh, we're excited to work with anybody who wants to contribute. Uh, what's, and we're, what's the name? Uh, the name you just Google uh, Oracle PGQL or PGQL Lang and you should be able to find it. So the, the website is pgql-lang.org. Um, you should be able to find it. Um, yes? This allows for pretty simple, just for something like Paul. Does that automatically block that, or do you have to add other conditions? Uh, so so we, we, will, we, we, we break cycle, so, so I mean, if what there's a circle. The, uh, the, the question is, this will create a circle if, uh, if the friend Basically, if the friend of the friend likes Paul, right? So if that is the case, we would, so anytime actually in this case, this is, uh, yeah, so then you're bringing us the, the issue of homomorphism versus isomorphism. So, uh, so basically, depending on your semantic, your matching semantic, you may treat that as a cycle, or if, because these things are named differently, uh, because friend of a friend is named differently than friend, right, then we could treat those separately, right? We actually support the former homomorphism, which means that unless you specify that friend of a friend should not be the same as friend, then we would print those out. So we would print. Right, Paul, correct. So you could specify that this, uh, you could, for example, bind uh, Paul to Paul, just, just introduce a variable Paul, and just add a constraint that says friend of a friend is not equal to Paul. That's how you break it. Or you could just say these are not the same vertices. So yeah, so this is an issue. And actually, some engines differ on how they would match this, right? Um, and so, so basically, with PGQL, you specify this pattern, and you can get very complicated, and you can throw it at a really large graph, and we can uh, essentially find this pattern. Uh, and, and, and this is actually quite, quite difficult. The, 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 the problem that this is trying to solve is NP-complete. Uh, but however, in practice, as long as your queries are well constrained, uh, essentially we can, we can quite efficiently uh, handle them. And if anybody has used Neo4j, uh, we don't show any performance numbers here, we're orders of magnitude faster than Neo4j in answering these queries. Yes? So, excuse me, in order for that knowledge language to be uh, performed, do you have to put indices to those properties? No. So there, this, there is no, sorry, to repeat the question, uh, basically, basically, are there indices involved here? Uh, so uh, we construct some indices automatically for you. For example, the labels, which are typically, um, uh, typically what, 
the, the right thing to construct. In, but we do, you as a user do not have to construct any indices. The, the, there's an optimizer that's deciding the right matching order, like what, what part of the graph to match first so that it can be very efficient without the need of the user having to worry about indices. But for like your example, you were mentioning uh, the index for Yes. Uh, no, you don't need an index for that. Well, you can't, yeah, I mean, you, yeah, it'd probably be better, but our, 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 um, our right. engine so far is. A billion, a billion versions. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, you could, you, you, you could use an index on that. It's just, we're very, very efficient in how we, 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 we find this. So the need, because it's in memory, uh, so we hold the graph, so this query, we have basically an in-memory accelerator so we can load the graph, part of the graph in memory. And uh, essentially it's a scan, uh, it's a very efficient parallel scan across the data and we can find, we can find these vertices uh, efficiently. But, but you know, we're looking at, at, at supporting indices as well. It's just practically in all the queries we, we found, no matter how complicated they are, uh, you basically uh, find very efficient, like sub-second uh, answers on all the queries. So, so, so far, uh, we've tried to shy away from, from indices and, and as opposed to just having to hold the graph in memory and doing in-memory parallel processing. Uh, so, yes? Uh, you mentioned scanning. Like, how can you move forward from speed? Yeah, so, so that's a good question, right? So, uh, I mentioned very early on uh, about the, this data model called RDF versus uh, property graph. Um, so, um, there are no really standards for property graph query languages. Cypher is not a standard. Uh, that's, a, that's the Neo4j language. So, so we are doing, we're essentially working with other players in the industry to march towards a standard. It's still very early days. Uh, we're involved in uh, uh, a, a, a community, a consortium called LDBC, which has a task force that's looking at these query languages. Part of our effort in putting this as open is, is having that be an input to, to, to this effort. And hopefully the industry will come together you know, as graph uh, becomes uh, more and more used to create the standard. But Oracle always believes in, in uh, you know, and always advocates open standards. So we're, we're really gonna push hard for an open standard here. Okay, so this is showing a little bit more complicated, right? So we talked about, can we go multiple hops, right? So here, you can essentially keep drawing this out, but you can also uh, add patterns like, you know, just find me, you know, basically any path from A to B such that the path includes an edge or someone with age bigger than 10. You can kind of get pretty wild in terms of expressing these graph queries. And again, uh, uh, our graph engine holds, um, essentially is just very efficient in how it represents the graph. It's really chasing pointers, it's not doing joins. So it's, uh, it can answer lots of these queries very, very efficiently. And then on really, really large graphs. So that's the query aspect. Um, we also provide many algorithms uh, to get you started. And we add new algorithms all the time. So if you're looking at uh, open source offerings out there, they'll give you like five or six or seven algorithms that don't scale. Uh, we have close to 39 algorithms and we, every release we add a few more. Uh, and really, we're, we, we always love to work with our users and customers and, and, and whenever they have uh, an idea or, or they feel something is missing, we, we quickly can add algorithms and, and, and we have a very fast release cycle. Yes? Uh, I, I have another, I have an, uh, it would be from another deck. Uh, offline, if you'd like to come, I, I can show you. Uh, um, yes. Oh, tell them? Well, okay. So, yeah. So basically, on, 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 in terms of the algorithms, so the other issue to, to, to understand is there's different kinds of uh, approaches. So Neo4j, for example, is a graph database. It can do queries, but it cannot do analytics. It does not support analytics. So it depends on what you're interested in. So for, for example, for graph queries on Neo4j, we're typically one to two orders of magnitude faster than them on, on large graphs. Um, like uh, hundreds to billion, billions of edges, doesn't matter. That, that, that gap actually increases the larger the graph gets. So you have two orders of magnitude. Oh, 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 no, so, 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 so on the 
OLTP queries, meaning you're inserting nodes, that's happening against the uh, scale out, uh, the scale out store, right? So in this case, HBase or NoSQL or the Oracle database. So whatever the Yeah, so, as long, so I'm talking here about updates versus reads. So read-only queries, those, th that's the numbers I'm talking about. So read-only queries, the more analytical queries. If it's just a fast lookup, it, they're, they're both going to essentially answer that, you know, depending on whether the data is indexed or not, right? Yeah. For example, um, if you are looking at <clears throat> find uh, adjacent uh, neighbors of a particular vertex, right, usually it's sub-segment, whether you are using NoSQL database or using HBase or Oracle database. Right. Really fast. So OLTP is kind of right in the old apps where you're asking these heavy analytical queries is where there's a, you know, there may take many, many seconds or never finish uh, in, in Neo4j's case. So that's on the database side. And then you have analytics, like what we're going through here. There, you have to use something else like Spark or GraphX, right? So against, for example, GraphX, we're two orders of magnitude to three orders of magnitude faster on running these analytics. And one of the benefits of, of this is actually you can do both graph queries and analytics as opposed to having one system that does the analytics and another system that does the query. So I'm just looking for a benchmark in terms of what's considered uh, concurrent queries, analytics, and graph. Uh, I'm trying to see benchmarks for both of those methods. Mm -hmm. right, so concurrent with each uh, type of scenario. Yeah, so we can take it offline and, and talk about it, yeah. So, so here we have a bunch of uh, algorithms, uh, essentially uh, social network algorithms, uh, so different classes, so for example, algorithms that help you evaluate the structure of the graph, algorithms that help you find communities, algorithms that help you find influencers, that's the ranking algorithms we discussed, uh, algorithms that help you find paths or reachability. Uh, algorithms to help you uh, with recommendation uh, and then uh, also finding related nodes and related uh, entities in the graph. So very, very rich set of algorithms that, that, that's out of the box and uh, always adding to it. So with that I'm going to show you now the next demo which is using these algorithms to uh, build a recommendation engine. So in particular we're going to show how we can use personalized page rank to build a recommenda uh, recommendation system. So we'll go over some of the theory behind personalized page rank, or at least how it works. I think Z covered it quite well, so I'll, I'll go through that really quick just to remind you. So to remind you, once I have a graph, um, uh, a bipartite graph I have on the left-hand side, basically, and, uh, and I'll sh we'll show you how we organize this. So you basically start with a graph and then you create a bipartite graph. On the left-hand side, you have one class of things, and on the right-hand side, you have the second class of things that, are, that you're basing your recommendations on. So back to the movie database, on the left-hand side, you'd have the users, on the right-hand side, you'd have the movies. And we'll show how we create this. Um, and then someone asked a question about uh, directions of edges. So in this case, we represent the, you know, the direct, the, the, essentially the, the uh, directionality is two edges. There is a purchased or clicked by, or click and a clicked by or purchased by, right? Um, and this is the algorithm that uh, that we will be using. So it comes built in. So just go over uh, uh, the the parameters. So you invoke personalized page rank. You give it a graph. You give it the uh, the the vertex set, the starting point of the random walk that we talked about. The max error, which is essentially the, um, the point at which the algorithm will stop. The algorithm is trying to keep iterating until it notices that the values it's trying to compute no longer change. So that, the, that uh, parameter tells it what is the mac maximum difference or the minimum, uh, the, the difference at which it can stop. The damping factor, we talked about this algorithm is randomly, some guy starting from the vertex set, randomly walking over the graph, right? So the damping factor is uh, essentially the probability of 
continuing the walk. Meaning, if you take one minus this, which is 15, so there's a 15% chance of teleporting back. So in the case of page rank, what does teleporting mean? In the case of page rank, teleporting means teleporting to any random node. Why do you want to do this? Because you don't want to get stuck in some, some like, you know, like connected component. So you need that random teleport so you can get out of the, the, you know, the stuck component, right? So in this case, in personalized page rank, the teleport is back to one of the nodes that you're starting with, okay? So now you guys kind of are experts in what these things are. And the last parameter is just the maximum number of iterations. So the algorithm stops two ways. One is it reaches convergence. Basically, it notices that now the difference is less than the, the max uh, difference or the min difference. And then 1,000 is the, the maximum number of iterations it's going to run. That way you can control uh, it stopping both ways. And once you have this personalized page rank, then you just can get the top K values. So these would be uh, the top uh, recommendations uh, or the top, the top vertices that you've encountered in your random walk. Okay, so with that, we'll go through the demo to show you how easy it is to, to use this stuff. So is this, yes, okay, cool. So let me, is there a way to zoom in? Yeah, zoom in a little bit more for you guys. Then I'd have to find my play button. Okay, so it's the same setup, the same graph. We start with this movie click. We essentially create this, this graph out of that data. We load it uh, into, the, into the big data spatial and graph. And then we're gonna show how we're gonna uh, run personalized page rank on this resulting graph. I'll zoom in when, when we need to look at some code. Okay, so this time we're using uh, the Groovy shell. So we're also trying to show you that there's many ways of interfacing with the system. Uh, Python uh, that we've shown, that's just a wrap around the Java APIs. So there's a Java API you can access from Python using this Python wrapper. You can access via, obviously, using Java, or you can access within Groovy, uh, you launch a Groovy shell. I guess when JShell comes out, you can use that. So here, you are starting a Groovy shell and using a big data spatial graph uh, with HBase combination. So the first thing you're doing is you are uh, essentially creating um, uh, the configuration for connecting to uh, the HBase and also to create the, uh, um, uh, to, to, to essentially connect into the, the, the HBase database. Okay. So here we get an instance of the, um, the property graph using the configuration uh, file we've created. Now I'm going to create an in-memory analyst session using our in-memory analytic engine, which is PGX. So we've created a, uh, we've created a session. Uh, once we have the session, that's kind of our our, our workspace. That's where we will uh, that's what will hold our values. So the nice thing with our in-memory analysts is you can have many people using an, uh, an analyst server. They can connect. They can have their own sessions. So it's kind of you can have uh, essentially each individual analyst uh, hold the graph, uh, the graph is shared. If we're computing any values, those will be uh, stored in your session. So create an analyst. And now you read the graph into this, uh, the in-memory analyst. So you just, uh, so normally you'd have to configure this, but because we're starting, uh, we've already have a handle to our uh, graph from, from uh, from, uh, from the data access layer, we can grab the configuration from that handle, pass it to the in-memory analyst. The in-memory analyst now will load the graph. Okay, and the in-memory analyst loads it, uh, tells you uh, how many elements, how many edges, and uh, or, uh, how many vertices and edges it has. So this is the same numbers we saw earlier. We're setting up a, a text index, uh, again, so we can grab our starting point. So this is very s similar as we, we saw before. So we create a vertex on first name, the, 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 the property first name. And now we're gonna get Nathan. Uh, we're searching on, based on the, 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 uh, uh, the, the property key first name for someone called Nathan. We're starting with Nathan, right? So exactly the same and we have this first user, Nathaniel, again, this is very similar to what we've done before.
Okay, so now given Nat, uh, Nathaniel Erling's existing clicks, what new movies can we recommend? So first we're gonna create that vertex set. That's the left side, right? So we're gonna create a vertex set where we put, uh, where we put a Nathaniel in there. So that, that will be our starting point of the random walk. In this case, the only one person that's in that set. And then we run personalized page rank using that set. So we've gone over the, all the parameters. So as you can see here, this is uh, the same as we've discussed. You run personalized page rank, you pass in the graph, the vertex set that has Nathaniel that we just added to that, and then you specify the parameters, the max error, the damping factor, and the max number of iterations. And then it runs, okay? And then you get uh, here the existing clicks that Nathaniel, so here we wanna see What's, what are some of the movies that Nathaniel's already seen, just so we understand some of the recommendations, okay? So here we're using a Gremlin query to grab that. Okay, and these are, these are the, uh, the movies that they've clicked. These are vertex IDs of the movies, so we can display some of those. Okay. And then what we can do is just grab the page, personalized page rank values we've, we've just computed. So we're gonna print the top 50, and we iterate over that, and then we print, pretty print, the, 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 uh, the vertex we got. Okay, so the first one is the time machine. So the first, what, what is our first one actually here? The first one is Nathaniel himself, right? Because if you think about it, it's a random walk with a teleportation, right? So the teleportation probability is 15%. So the result of the personalized page rank is the probability, each node will have the probability of, of essentially visiting that node within a random walk, right? So if you're teleporting 15% of the time, that means your node, you have the highest page rank value, okay? So we skip that first one, because that's us. And the second one is Time Machine. So Time Machine is the first movie uh, that we're recommending. And the nice thing here is we're also getting a value. So this is kind of telling me a percentage chance of me visiting. So I can even ha have a ranking, but not just a ranking, a ranking and kind of a, a, an idea of how strongly should I recommend one movie in another. So if I have a ranking and I see suddenly a drop off in, in page rank values, I know to, to cut off there. So another interesting, th uh, the next movie is, is Dirty Dancing, which has a lower uh, page rank uh, ranking. And then another, uh, so that's the next movie, and then another interesting one is, is, is Finding Users. So let's see here. So this is uh, the other next movie. And this is interesting because we're walking through the graph, so we go through the movies, but Remember, there's an edge going back to the users, right? So we're walking through movies and then users and movies back. So not only are we getting recommended movies or movies we're associating a page rank value with movies, but we're also associating a personalized page rank value with users. So now not only can you recommend movies, but you can also recommend similar users uh, because those are the users that you would have encountered if you just randomly walked through the graph. So you can use that to essentially create a, here are similar users to you. You can create a profile of users. Exactly, yes. So you can suggest people, if you had a social network around this, you can suggest friends, for example. Okay, so now I'll just gonna skip through. So this is doing the same thing in Python, and just to show you, so this is the distribution. This is the distribution that you get uh, from the, uh, the personalized page rank. So on, on the bottom here is, these are all the movies that we would recommend. Number zero is obviously my, is Nathaniel. And then you can see here how there's a, is a drop off. So sometimes the drop off is, is, is uh, you know, a lot of times it's gradual. Sometimes it's kind of a clear cut. And so you can, you can even decide, okay, here's my threshold. If it's any lower than that, you know, I'm just not gonna bother recommending. So that's, uh, that's for using personalized page rank to, to build recommendations. Uh, now I'll pass it back to Z for a final way of, of building recommendations. Back to you. Thank you, Michelle. So, so far we have covered 
two um, approaches, right? Um, those two approaches are kind of using apparent information, right? Content-based, right, we'll look at the description. Content-based approach, we'll look at the description of the items and start recommending. The personalized picture rank, we'll look at the topology of the graph. <coughs> Um, we'll look at the topology. So those are uh, apparent information. So collaborative filtering, at least the, uh, for the matrix factorization-based approach, is kind of looking at some of the hidden information. For example, why, if you think about it, right, why do these two users, right, click on similar items, right? Could it be that they both like uh, classic music? Could it also be that they both have uh, a son in the same high school, right? So there are a lot of hidden things we don't really know. But those hidden features may drive that to make these two users to make similar purchase or similar service subscription, okay? So this um, matrix factorization basically captures that intuition, right? We have a matrix here describing user products ratings, right? It's a sparse matrix as I explained. So there's quite a bit of mathematics, but then at the end of the day, it will come up with taste signatures for different users and also for different products, okay? So once you compute these two sub matrix much smaller in size compared to this sparse matrix, right? You will be able to multiply these two together and then find out all those potential ratings of a user for all those items, okay? If you have a million items, there's no problem. After you finish this matrix factorization computation, you will be able to, kn to know the potential rating of this user on all those one meaning items. But then guess what, right? For most of the ratings, will be close to zero because the guy may not be interested in those things, right? So you take the top 10, top 50, or whatever, so those will become your recommendation. So let me, uh, let me just add a little bit here to remove a little bit of the, the, the magic from how we compute this stuff, right? Uh, so basically, I mean, like we, we talked about, we're starting out with this sparsely filled matrix. Anytime a user rates or purchases, we have information in that cell, right? So we start with that information. And now we say, and this is not a one shot, we iterate. We say, okay, in order for me to get that information, I want to factor, essentially extract the W and H that if I were to multiply, gives me those same values, okay? So I, so I go through one step, I say, okay, well, this would give me the same value. Okay, and then, I, and then what is that, once, I, w once I've done that and I recompute, part of, part of those other cells now starts getting filled in, okay? So I say, okay, let me try to do it again now, you know, iterate one more time, get a little bit more, more refined, and every time I'm doing this, there is an error. There's basically the error of like, well, am I able to compute the right values? Is that getting closer to what I expect or not, right? So that's how you're filling in. So it's not, it's not there's one shot, it just keeps, trying to figure out this W and H for you until it can notes, it can get very close to the values that it started with. And once you have that, you can fill in the rest of the matrix. Yes. Okay. Very good point. So in a way, it's like a training a neural network, right? So you have initial <coughs> weight assignment and then you gradually adjust those weights, okay? In this case, we gradually adjust W and H until we reach that uh, fixed point that this predi prediction gives you a uh, really similar rating to the original assignment. Okay. So now let's switch to the demo. So this is using <coughs> collaborative filtering. Um, the setup is exactly the same, except there's one little difference. Because with content-based filtering, we don't really care about the topology of the graph, okay? And with personalized page rank, 
we care about the topology, but we don't care about the properties on the edges, right? We just care there's a link from this user to a movie. There's an uh, edge, you know, from this movie back to a user, right? But for content, uh, for collaborative filtering, we do care about the rating, okay? A user click on a movie, but the original data set doesn't come with a rating. So what we ended up doing is we assign a equal weight, equal rating for all those edges, meaning that if you click on something, we think you like it, okay? Of course, in practice, if you have, you know, real user rating, that will be even better. So the uh, flow starts with the movie. We store them into the SQL database in BDSG. We pull them out into the in-memory analyst. And then we run the collaborative filtering. We train the model and then given the user, we can say, hey, now for this user, we know what, what are the new items this guy or this gal may be interested in. Okay. So again, here we are using the IPython notebook because the, um, you see all the steps in a web page. <coughs> We set the class pass. <coughs> Kick off the, uh, <coughs> the notebook. The first part is the boilerplate. You set the UTF-8 encoding. We pull in a few of the uh, Java packages. Those are just uh, cut and paste the stuff. <coughs> we create a configuration and create a uh, property graph instance. Okay, so here we are using the same movies graph. <coughs> We count the vertices. <coughs> count the uh, <coughs> excuse me, count the edges. So there are about three hundred thousand edges. Now we build a graph configuration to pull in the graph into the in-memory analyst. Okay. So we start the uh, the uh, in-memory instance, the uh, in-memory engine instance. Okay. Create a session. So from this session, you can run all kinds of analytics, okay? So we read the graph into this session. So now we have the whole graph in memory. So we first build an edge filter to say, hey, I only care about the customers. Uh, remember, right, this uh, graph has two parts. We're talking about a bipartite graph, right? Left side, the customers. Right side, uh, movies, right? So we filter out customers uh, on the left side. So there are about 3,000 vertices, okay? We create an analyst. We just do a simple uh, triangle counting to say, hey, whether there are triangles uh, in this graph. In this graph, there's no triangles because we only have user movie uh, edges, okay? So now we build a bipartite uh, graph from customers on the left-hand side. Um, it's really trivial to run this um, matrix factorization. There's one single API call uh, in the uh, analyst Java API, matrix factorization. Okay, you give the graph, give the, uh, uh, the rating property on edges, right? And uh, a few other parameters. Okay. So after you finish the, uh, the training, you can say, hey, how good is the model, right? You can get the uh, mean square error out of this. Now, say we want to recommend, we know there's a user, right? Um, this is Mr. Uh, Bucci. We want to recommend uh, movies for Mr. Bucci. So this is the, we take out the vertex from the graph with the uh, particular vertex ID. You can also use a solar index, right, to find this particular user, okay? Now, given Mr. Bucci and given the <coughs> already trained model, you can say, hey, what are the top 10 recommendations for this user? So we pretty print all those top 10 uh, out of this, this iterator. So this is the vertex IDs and also the, uh, the rating, right? The estimated rating uh, for this uh, Mr. Bucci and um, between this uh, Mr. Bucci and uh, certain movies. Okay. It's similar to Netflix, right? It will not only recommend, you may like this movie, and also, I believe your rating for this movie is going to be 4.3 stars, something like that, okay? 
So this is our top 10 recommendations for Mr. Bucci. Now you can go back to the um, data access layer to say, hey, I want to find out more information about those recommendations, right? You get the, uh, the Vertex ID, send it to the database, say, hey, to find out all those details, right? The first one is Grace Anatomy. The second recommendation is uh, this uh, Selma and Luis, so on and so forth. So any questions so far? Yes. Yes. So if you have a large graph, right, because the in-memory data, data structures we are using are really compact, so on a decent machine, we can easily fit in uh, billions of edges, right? We also have distributed in-memory elements. So you can run PGX on a set of nodes, right? So that will easily scale up on the graph you can handle. Correct, yes. So everything is uh, uh, transparent. So if you have a really large graph, right, you can store them in a horizontal fashion across all the shards in edge ways, right? When you pull them out, you can set up a PGX cluster. You can have a cluster of in-memory nodes, right? Those jointly can serve all those analytical functions. Any more questions? So this ends the uh, demonstrations. So let's switch back to our presentation. So now we are near the end. Um, let's give a quick overview of the features. So we talk about the graph, the notion graph analytics, some use cases, right? And then we have demonstrated building recommender, recommender system using graph and graph analytics. So just to wrap up, um, this slide shows some of the features we provide in Big Data Spatial and Graph um, version 1.2. So this is the, not the latest, but the sec, uh, second latest, okay. In this one, you have PGQL, the first release of PGQL. Um, you have distributed in-memory uh, graph analytics. So that gentleman asked about this uh, question. And then you have uh, Graph Builder. So you can build uh, in-memory graph by using APIs, okay, directly. So we have label support, we have uh, security enhancement, and uh, recently we released a Big Data Spatial and Graph version 2.0, okay? So this is uh, coming with Big Data Appliance, BDA 4.6. <coughs> we have uh, updated PGQL, we have Node.js client, so if you want uh, uh, to use JavaScript to interact with the property graph functions, you can use that. We also have integration um, between Apache Spark and the in-memory analyst, okay. Um, we upgraded the uh, solar cloud support in order to support uh, Horton Works. So now um, uh, Big Data Spatial and Graph is certified on Horton Works as well as Cloudera. <coughs> and um, for the upcoming uh, Oracle Database 12.2, remember at the beginning I mentioned there are two kinds of uh, backend databases, right? <clears throat> One on the uh, big data platform. So you have a choice of Oracle NoSQL database and Apache Edge base. And also we are going to have property graph in Oracle database. So the version is 12.2. Um, for property graph in Oracle database, we are going to have in-memory <coughs> analyst, of, of course. We also, because the data sits in relational database, right? All those existing tools, like um, Oracle Data Mining, Oracle BI, BIEE, those will work automatically with the graph data sitting in Oracle database. We're going to have spatial support. We can uh, store geospatial information, points, polygons, lines, etc., with the property graph data. So for the text engine, in addition to Solar, Lucene, we're also going to have Oracle Text. One of the unique features will be SQL-based graph analytics and SQL-based graph query. So some of the graph functions, navigation, um, 
you know, uh, pattern matching can be implemented using SQL as well. And of course, because the data sits in the database, you inherit automatically all these great features um, that comes with Oracle Database Network Enterprise Security. So we have working to support the uh, integration of label security with Cloudflare Graph. So with that, we're going to close it. Um, just for your information, so today we're going to have another session um, at 4.15. Uh, in, this is a, a conference session 6.445. It's going to talk about graph and link analysis. And we're going to have demo booths in Moscone South. There will be two parts, one in the database area, the other one in the uh, big data area. And um, so there's a lot of demos going on. We are going to uh, have partners from Tom Sawyer and Data Ninja. And there will be uh, SIG user community meetings. Um, and the uh, BUA Summit is coming. Okay. Yeah, so now we are ready for questions. Give yourself a hand for. <laughs> Hopefully you learned something. Okay, any, any questions, final questions? Yes. So the question is about triangle counting. Uh, the way we do triangle counting is we turn the graph into undirected and then we measure how many triangles, right, from A to B to B to C and C back to A. And then we count the number of triangles. Any more questions? Yes. Um, during some of those demos, would it be nice to visualize some of those results? Right. Is there a, a logical thing that we can set up for that? Because someone mentioned Tom Sawyer there, yeah. and that was sort of yeah. the backwards one. Yeah, so we support uh, a few integrations. Uh, one is with Tom Sawyer. Uh, we also are shipping uh, with Cytoscape, or we, pr we provide integration with Cytoscape. Uh, so those things are available in the product. We're working on other things as well. Uh, feel free to come and talk to us about that. Could, could you just go back two slides? Okay. Yes. Yes, so like our breadth first search or a depth first search, you can, you can provide a vertex filter. Obviously, when in the query language, obviously you can provide a bunch of criteria uh, to guide your search. So if I wanted the, the vertex stock at a certain point in the graph, I can do it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it will stop traversing. Uh, there's, there's no way to globally stop it. There's, you know, you're just basically saying when to stop visiting, when to stop going any further, right? So you say, okay, this is where I'm going to stop my bread first search, but there's no global like uh, global stop. It has to search through the whole graph. Yeah, if you only want to say uh, navigate the three hops away, right? You can also do that, right? From this uh, uh, vertex in the outgoing edges, right? Follow through that and do another hop, right? You can do that in a controlled fashion. And I just want to invite anybody who's who's inter interested in this topic and want to work with us, please uh, just let us know. We're, we're happy to work with you guys and interested in graph. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you. Anything is fine. For example, CSV is here, uh, and our relational tables are here. And then we also. No, no, no. We allow you to say, hey, this column goes as a label, right? This column becomes source vertex. And this oh, column becomes so a destination, so it's quite flexible. Yeah, let me, let me give you that's, my that's what I was going to go for pages. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
do have APIs that we can send you something. Uh, send them, shoot me a question. Hi.
Check, check, check. Check, 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 check. Check one, two, three. Check one, two. Check, 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 check.
Hello? One, two, three, testing. Can you guys hear me? Yes? <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. We're not starting yet. It's just that microphone test. <laughs> but good morning, everyone. Have, hi, everyone. Yes, hi. Hi. Oh, he's talking to other, someone else. <laughs> okay. Testing, one, two, three. Okay, so now he's trying the microphone on the flag, so let's see how that works. Okay. 
two minutes. We're going to start on time, right? Yeah, maybe, yeah, there's two people coming here. Hello. Oh, you're starting. Okay. Yeah, I can at least I can I can at least say hello, right, before we start. So, so good morning, everyone. We're here to talk about Docker and Java E. So, who uses Docker here? Everyone uses Docker. So, who uses Java E here? Everyone uses Java E. All right. Okay. That's a challenge. So you know everything, right? <laughs> no. So we gotta we gotta we gotta let lots lots of times for questions then. So because you guys know everything already. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Morning. Okay. Okay. All set. Can you go? Time, time, time to go. All right. Okay. Let me just press start here, right? So we know when it's about to finish. Okay, good morning, everyone. So thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for, for you know, first sessions at Java One. Let me ask one thing. Who was at, at Jug Sunday yesterday? A few of you. So thanks, thanks for you guys for, for being one day early at Java One. And we had some very good sessions at Jug Sunday yesterday. So um, we're going to talk here today a little bit about, uh, about containers, the importance of containers. And you know how how we can use uh, Docker and Java EE together, um, and uh, this so this this session is based on an article that is online right now. So if you want to take a look, uh, that's the URL right here, uh, and it's uh, it's actually a series of three articles that's going to go that's they're going over at at the OTN website, and uh, it's just the first article is up. Uh, I think they're putting the second article in a few days. And um, so we're going we're gonna to talk about all those things uh, here today. And uh, with me, I have two uh, good colleagues um, here. Uh, we, I have Elder Moraes. Elder is a, a Java architect uh, in Brazil. And he's been working uh, with Java and Java EE uh, for a long time. Uh, and he's been working with containers you know, for about a year now, right? And so. Put your hands together to Elder. Thank you. And, and here to my, uh, my other side here, um, I have uh, André. Uh, André Carvalho, he is, um, he's working with me at Tools Cloud for a long time. And he's the guy that's, that's uh, implemented our, our, our container solution. Uh, we're going we're gonna to briefly uh, mention this at some point. And so he's been working with, with uh, Container, Docker, and Ansible uh, for quite some time now, right? And Andre is a, is a Java consultant at Sumo Technologies. So put your hands together for Andre. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm, I'm Bruno Souza. I'm known as the guy with the flag. And there is a reason why I'm known for, as the guy with the flag, right? So, you know, and I'm a Java developer uh, for a long time. And uh, I've been. Well, you know, my, my main focus in, in, in is, is uh, help you guys improve your developer career. And I think that's, that's what we are trying to do here uh, in terms of co with containers. Uh, containers are, are, are probably one of the best technologies right now uh, in terms of career discussions. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that too. Okay. And uh, so, you know, 
all of you know Java EE. Uh, most, you know, most of you raise your hand saying that, you, that you're using Java EE. So you've, you're very, very familiar with that, with that image and how we package things uh, with, with Java EE, right? We know we have all the containers. So you know, we're t this whole discussion about containers, it's funny because um, uh, we, we've been talking about containers on Java and Java EE for a long time, right? So what is, what is uh, the relationship between uh, the Java containers? One, one interesting thing is that uh, this, you know, how many of you remember this image? It says Java 2 EE here, right? That's from the sun time, right? You know, that's, that's, how, that's how things were, were, were shown at the sun time. When Oracle took over, things got a little bit more boring. It's exactly the same image, but it's just like, no, no fun, no colors. So I kind of like this one here better, right? Okay, so, uh, you know, so, so we've been talking about containers for a long time. And the whole discussion here, you know, what, what the idea uh, that we have in terms of containers is that, you know, you, you, you package your application. Uh, and there's a lot of things your application needs that's, that you don't package with it, right? So you, you package your application, and then it's, it's just the smallest thing that you can have that's, that's, you know, different from whatever is in the container. And then you can easily move your application uh, from one container to the next container, right? So, it's, so it makes things a lot easier. Um, instead of we moving things like big stuff, we just move what we need, what our application is, right? That allows this whole discussion of containers is what allowed uh, Java EE to be uh, available everywhere in lots of different uh, servers. You know, I'm just showing a few here, but you know, you guys, uh, we're actually gonna, sh we're gonna use uh, Tom EE in the, in the demos. So, uh, you know, you can actually have, uh, uh, you, you can move your application from, from those different containers very easily because uh, on, on the application, you know, what, on your packaging, all you have is the application itself, right? The container has lots of more stuff, but you don't have to carry all those things around. That's really good. It's very helpful. Uh, we do this all the time in, in our houses, right? You know, when you open up your, your refrigerator, I'm sure there's lots of little containers there, right? Because you pack things inside, so you can take from the refrigerator, put in the microwave, take off the microwave, put, a, put somewhere else. It's very easy to move things around. And, and um, so, on the software word, uh, we, we also have this, the same notion in Java EE word. Now, uh, the problem is that, okay, so we are moving things uh, inside, inside containers, moving from one Java EE server to another Java EE server. It's more or less easy, it's not, not, not uh, such a big problem. But there's many more other things, right? You know, we have uh, OSs and we have the application server itself. We have you know, a lot of libraries. We have the Java virtual machine. We have a lot of configuration that needs to that we need to do. So if we're going to move, so it's easy to move, but if we to set up this whole environment, it's not so easy. It's you know you have you have all this work that you have to do to configure uh, your application server again and 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 in, in another place. So if you want to move, you know instead of moving from from wide flight to web logic or something like that. If you want to move from, I don't know, from Amazon to your laptop, or vice versa, right? Maybe to, from your laptop to Amazon, that might make more sense. Uh, or if you want to move, you know, if you, if you, have, some, you, know, if you have something running your laptop and you want to put on, on a test machine, on a test server, it's, it's a lot of work to recreate this environment, right? And, and lots of things can go wrong and everything. So uh, we have, you know, we have thought about maybe one interesting thing that we could do is we could pack things even more, right? So we are packing things inside, our, inside the, 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 the jar and the ER file, the WAR file. Maybe, maybe we can pack more stuff inside a container, right? So, maybe, so basically, um, that's when the, soft, the, the, the software containers came about. Uh, and Docker, well, actually, software containers are not a new thing. They've been around since the late, late 70s or early 80s. Uh, we, have, we have containers. Um, um, more recently, I remember when I was working at Sun, uh, Sun had, you know, on, on Solaris, on open Solaris, we had Solaris zones. It was a pretty cool uh, container technology. All of this was really good, but let me ask one question here. Who here, who here consider yourself a developer? Write code, yes, okay. Now, that's Java one, right? Most of us are here. Now, who here considers yourself an operational guy? You see, very, very few, right? That's normal. So those guys that raise their hands, they know about containers for a long, long time, right? Because containers has been mostly 
an operations thing, right? A lot of times, so we've seen many, many times you go to a company and we start talking about containers and the developers are like, oh, we have no idea what that is, it's very cool. And then you go talk to the operations guy and say, oh yes, we use containers here, right? Every time we give a virtual machine to a developer, it's not a virtual machine, it's a, it's a container. And they just think it's a virtual machine. So yes, it is, the operations know about containers for, for, for usually a lot longer. But for us developers, containers are new because they're really, they were in the past, they were really hard to, to, to work with, right? It was hard, you know, those guys know very well. Um, it was, you know, it's, it's, it was even Solaris Zones, it was actually very easy. It was pretty hard, right? You know, it's, it's, it was hard to use, it was hard to package things, and it was especially hard to move things around. It's not so, so, so cool to move things around. So then, that's when Docker came about. Docker showed up, you know, maybe two years ago, um, about two years ago, and uh, and Docker came with a, with a proposition that was, you know, that we should standardize, or actually, they, they came up with a good packaging for containers. So Docker doesn't use anything, uh, you know, that's, that didn't exist before. So a lot of people think, oh, is Docker ready for prime time? Well, Docker uses Linux containers that's been around for a long time, so you know, should 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 be okay uh, to run. Uh, but what Docker introduced was a packaging standard, right? That was that, that didn't exist before. So now, it was, it, so the same thing that, that that happened, I think this is the similarity with Java EE. The same thing that Java EE introduced, it introduced WAR files and ER files uh, that allow you to package applications and move your application from one container to the next. That's what Docker did, right? It, it, it created a packaging standard that allowed us to, well, it wasn't a standard right, and when it started, it was just a Docker uh, packaging. But now everyone uses, it's an open source, everyone uses, everyone agrees that's a good one, or it's a reasonable one at least. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's available everywhere, and that's, that's what makes it powerful. Uh, especially when we are talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, we're gonna talk about in a, in a minute how, 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 this, how this benefit, but if you think about the word, the real life containers, right? When you're talking uh, right after the Second World War, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about, like those big uh, metal boxes, right? That you put things inside. You all know, you all, you all here know how we we shipped things before containers existed, right? Because you all here watched Titanic, right? So you remember Titanic and Jack and, Jack and Rose, they're running. Uh, uh, un, in, un, under the ship, and they're like, you know, the hand in the, in the, in the, in the mirror or in the, in the glass of the car. You all remember that scene, right? The thing that you may not remember very well is that behind them, there's all kinds of boxes and things tied up by ropes and nets and all those kind of things, because on that time, the way you moved things around, made just shipping things, was putting in all kinds of different sizes of boxes and, and put one box by box inside the, inside the ship. And so you have to tie things up in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a specific way and put things in the right way. And that was time consuming, it was hard, you know, it was expensive to do, you have more, a lot of labor uh, to do these kind of things, right? And then what happened? Right after the Second World War, we, we came up with a standard, right? What is the standard? Like we can have a big box. Instead of lots of small box, let's put a really big box. And so they, you know, you can imagine that, you know, he thought a big box was this big and, and he thought the big box was this big and someone else thought the big box was this big and so at some, at some point we agree, okay, let's have the same size of big box and we put everything, so now it's easy to put things inside, right, so he might put bicycles inside the container, he might put meat inside the container, he might put, I don't know, toys inside the container and it's, it's easy. In the, in the docks, there's a guy with a big crane that he moves boxes around. He doesn't care what's inside. It's in very interesting that once we have that, that, that agreement, uh, we jump it from, uh, uh, you know, containers today, it's so, it's so important that less than about 6% of the ships in the world carry containers. And they carry 90% of everything that we use. So that's how powerful the shipping uh, industry become because they standardize on the size of the container. Why, why, why I'm talking about real shipping? Because that's exactly where we are right now, right? We are, we are, we finally standardized it or we agreed on a size of a box for software containers. 
And if you think about this year, you know, 2016, it's when Google announced, you know, uh, uh, put up their, I think, I think they, they did in the, la in the last month of, of 15, but you know, in the last 12 months, Google announced their container ships, right? Uh, Amazon announced their container ships early this year. Um, uh, who else? Microsoft put their container ships early this year. So we're in the first lab, you know, the first uh, uh, wave of container ships, right? The first container, the real, the first real container ships were able to carry hundreds of containers. Today, container ships are able to carry tens of thousands of containers, right? So that's where we are in the software industry right now. We're in the first ships of containers. And a lot of things are gonna happen in the next few years. A lot of things are gonna, you know, a lot of a lot of people are not using containers today. A lot of people have still lots of different, lots of questions. Is it secure? Is it the right way, the right way to do it? And so in the next few years, containers are gonna completely change the way we deliver software, right? Because, because once we're able to package things, and what, what this has to do, right? You know, when we're talking about, um, you know, you, you, let, think about those few guys that raised their hand, I think most of them are right here. Uh, they raised their hand, they're operations guy, right? How do they work, right? It's like, okay, so um, I have to, you know, you, you say you're a developer, developers want change, right? And the operations guy wants stability. So you're a developer and you say, okay, you know, we are doing this Java thing, right? We're gonna run an application on a Java VM and the operations guy, okay, it's so a Java VM, I know I, I start like this, I, I stop like this, I back up the Java VM this way, I know how to do disaster recovery, that's okay, that's good. And then you say, okay, so now we wanna use this application server, so can we use Widefly or Glassfish here? Okay, well, Widefly, Glassfish, is that run on top of the JVM? Okay, so I, I, I kind of know how to do this, it's a little bit more, more different. I learned how to do this, I, I, I arrange things, I can back up, it, back up things. Okay, I know how to handle the, the application server, that's good, all right, I can do that. Okay, so can, can we run out now this PHP application? Well, PHP, well, PHP is Apache, right? So I can just run Apache, the same thing. Okay, we can run PHP. And then so, oh, we have this now cool stuff here is gonna be uh, to do a small application that we're gonna do. Let's use Ruby. Oh, no, no, no. Stop that, I'm not gonna use Ruby. I've learned a Java. I've learned a Java EE. I've learned a Apache. I'm not gonna learn everything that you guys throw at me. Let's standardize things, right? Now we're gonna have this one, you know, this particular version of Java, this particular version of application server, you can't run anything else because you're making a big mess here, from, not confusing for me, right? Isn't that how it works? And now we are stuck in, in Java 1.5, right? <laughs> that never gets upgraded because the, the operations guys say, oh, you know, you can't do anything like this. So what containers bring to the table is that, you know, once you have the containers in place, once you have the cranes that are able to handle the containers, your operations guy, they can handle containers. So if you get a Java application put inside a container, you get your, your, your Java E application put inside a container, you get your PHP application put inside a container, you get a Ruby application put inside a container, you give to the operations guys the container, right? So he, they know how to start the container, stop the container, how to back up the container, how to do disaster recovery of the container, how to get the container that's running locally and move it to the cloud, how to run the container on Amazon and Azure at the same time, right? They know how to do all of those things because they have the tools to run all that. And once they know all of these, you know, you are free to innovate as much as you want inside the container and the operations guys are, are, are free to handle and manage the containers as much as they want, right? So I think this is, the, this is every, everyone here is talking, you know, the, one of the bigger words that's, that we see everywhere, it's, it's DevOps, right? You know, everyone talks about DevOps, and there are some companies, they're doing DevOps in, in an interesting way. They get everyone, they put everyone in the same room, and they say, okay, so this is the small team here, and you will, you'll handle everything, right? That's a good way of doing DevOps, because then you don't have Dev and Ops, you just have one team. That will, but most of us are, not, are not, not working like this, right? Most of us have a Dev team and an Ops team, and we are now trying to work together. What is the best way to work together? Containers, right? Because containers are the right interface between operations and development. Instead of you, we have like this crazy weird interface that we know I send you a jar file and you run wherever you are and that doesn't work very well and things like that. You know, we have the right, the right, uh, the right interface. And so now we can work better together. So 
That's why it's so important to do this. Now, uh, the thing is, when you tr start tr tr trying to do containers, right, you're already doing Java EE. So, okay, so how am I gonna start? Right, there's lots of different ways. We're gonna talk about uh, some other crazy things that you can do. But, you know, how do you start? Let me, let's make a very simple step-by-step -step way that we can start getting your Java, the existing Java E application and put inside a container just so you can see how that works. Okay? Oh, contrary. Yes. Control or whatever. How that, that. So, uh, can you hear me? It's okay. okay. So, uh, let me show you a little, a little demo, very simple demo. How do you get started uh, with, uh, with uh, Docker? And you have your first containers running in a high available environment, okay? So, first of all, you need an image, a Docker image, okay? So, <coughs> uh, you need your Java application. Yeah, you need, a, you know, of course, you need a Java application. So you have your Java application already running, maybe a WAR file, a JAR file, a ER file, okay? <coughs> so we will build a new Tommy image running your application here. So we choose our application here, java one appwar um, We will tell the Docker to build this image and we will give a name to this image. Okay, so here we are customizing an image with Tommy, Apache Tommy, and I will show you how, with my own application. Could be your application. Your application that's running right now, you could put and uh, replace on this comment and uh, create a new image with Apache Tommy. Uh, at the end of the comment, we have a dot right there. Uh, this dot is showing to the Docker that we have a Docker file. Here is what the, all the magic happens here. So we are telling the, the Docker how it should build our, our this image, this Apache Tommy image, okay? The most important part is at the, the, the beginning, very beginning, from command. This from command is telling Docker, hey Docker, we have at the Docker Hub an uh, image, a Apache Tommy image that is already done, it's already built. So we don't need to start from scratch, okay? We can reuse uh, an image that's already, already done and <laughs> Keep, keep customizing it for our, our application, okay? So at the second, we have the, the add uh, comments, put a server XML file, where we put some setup for high available environment, okay? Uh, so we'll basically, we have a cluster, Apache Tommy cluster. <coughs> then we put Tomcat users file to have some users for administration. We have uh, Tommy XML file to put our data sources the JGBC jar file for Postgre. Uh, at the end of the command, we have an environment variable where we inform previously our, our application. We are set the things up here, okay? So we are back to the, to the command. So we build our, our image. So, okay, we have an image right now. Uh, how this image will begin in a container? We can create containers. So based, in, based on our, our own image, okay, so we use docker create, we have a name, we expose the ports, and based on Tommy War at the end. We want a cluster, so we'll do it three times, could be 10 times, thousands of times. And we'll put a load balancer here. Uh, the interesting, interesting thing here is that we don't need to, to build the image as we did with our Tommy image. We can reuse it directly from the Docker Hub. So in the end, we have a tag because I don't need to, to customize this to, uh, Nginx uh, load balancer. So we just refer to him to it and build our image for our, our, our container for Nginx, okay? So we link to our hosts, Apache Tommy hosts, and then we have, oh, let me show you. We have that end file argument. It's, uh, we, can, we can work with environment variables in the, the create of the, our containers. So we have these variables pointing to our containers and giving a name to our application so the, the Nginx could, could, could see the, the, our containers, okay? So then we start our containers that we, we already created. Uh, 
we split the create and the start steps. We could do it in a, with just one step using Docker Run. So we create and start the, the containers in the same way. All right? So at the end, we have this architecture. Uh, we have a browser pointing to our application. We have a node balancer pointing to our three hosts running Apache Tomi. All right? So I will show you right now this little, little demo running here. You guys see this or it's too small? Yep. Too small. Too small. Crazy font. Yeah. This okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, first of all, we need to build our, our image. Let me check. This is the common that I show you that we built our image, so I will just run it. Okay. Uh, interesting part that you, you may you may notice, uh, we have the steps, and the Docker is saying remove intermediate container, remove intermediate container. Docker uses container to build containers. Okay, so in, in each step that, that it, it run, it will do a, a, a little container and it's an intermediate to, to another steps. Uh, this is important as you, if you have a new version of your application and you rebuild the, the image, Docker doesn't need to, to run all the steps again. He will cache the steps that don't, doesn't change, that didn't change, and just run the, the step that changed that's your application. Yes, two, two interesting things on this is that for, uh, as you can see, we are, uh, we are putting the application inside the container. So uh, as, first of all, is the last step of the Docker file is, the is, is adding the application. So what we are doing is that we are not having a, an image that we add the application when it's running. We are, we are building what we call an appliance, that is an image that has the application. Of course, it's a simple application, but it could be a very sophisticated configuration. So your application is already configured running inside the container. So you don't need a step to install the application in the container when it's already running. So we, we're gonna do this whole thing at one thing. And we are adding the application as the last step. That means, you know, once you, you, once you put this in your build pipeline, uh, you, you don't have to recreate the container, you know, the whole image all, every time, because Docker is gonna cache uh, all these steps and just gonna add the application in the end. So it's a, it's a, it's a good way to do it. So once we have the image, we will create the the containers. Uh, let me show you. Okay, so this is a, the the comms that we just show you. So we create three Apache Tommy com, uh, containers and one Nginx load balancer. So. Okay, my containers are just created, and I will start them. So right now, they are starting it up in three containers and one. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, Docker starts, Docker starts, Docker starts. Okay, let me show you the application running. Very simple, it's showing you the, the IP that's is answering the, that request. And the, 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 the load bus will do a round robin. It, they are already starting, so it may take a while. Here. Now they, now they are there. So the IP is changing, and one is already, one is to 
starting. Okay, we are good now. now. So, we are there. The four, the two, three. So, the 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 load balancing now is doing the route routing and showing who is answering that request. So we have this. This architecture is a very simple demo, okay, but showing you this high available environment. In very, very few commands, very simple way, very fast. You can run four containers and even more uh, just in your, in your own computer, okay? I'll give back the word to Bruno. And so one of, one of the things that's, um, that's uh, uh, it's, it's hard, well, first of all, He's running on his laptop, right? So he's running a full, um, uh, you know, like four machines in his laptop. And uh, containers are, are it, it reuses the kernel of the operation system that you're using, so they're very light. So it allows you to do development uh, in a very easy way. And now, once we have those containers, uh, we, can, we, can, we can do the, the next thing, that is move them to, to a, a much better. Of course, it's one, you, you don't have high availability in a, in a single laptop, because the laptop fails, everything goes, go, goes uh, you know, everything disappears, right? But, but you, you, can, you can now move the same containers um, to a, a real environment where you can separate these containers in multiple machines, and then that's where the orchestration tools come, uh, come uh, uh, make, get the things even more interesting, because the orchestration <coughs> tools can separate uh, those containers in different machines, even automatically for you. So we're gonna talk about, about this in a minute. But you know, it's really good to, that you can actually have a, uh, a, a complete environment uh, with everything that you need for your development uh, machine. And now if you're gonna do this, the testing, for example, let's say you have uh, your Jenkins uh, doing a, your, your build pipeline, you can have the same containers running on your test, your test environment. You can have the same containers running on your Q, QA environment. It's, a, it's much easier uh, for you to handle the whole pipeline li like this. Now, one of the th interesting things uh, is that, um, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you're gonna do, uh, uh, well, the most interesting thing that we were talking about earlier is the packaging, right? Containers allow you to package uh, those applications, right? And so, uh, and, and the, the biggest innovation that Docker uh, did was probably not, uh, not simply the packaging, but the idea that once you have an application that's packaged, you can now put, this, put this, those packages available somewhere, right, and, and, and have a list of uh, existing uh, 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 pre-configured containers that you can reuse, right? So you basically have like a huge amount of containers that, that either you develop and you put in your own register or it's available uh, for you because other people did like open source containers. Uh, today you have, uh, I'm not sure if you, if you guys uh, took notice of this, but Oracle did this, uh, announced it yesterday on the keynote that they're gonna have like the Java, um, you know, Java's gonna be available in a Docker uh, image, right? So um, as far as I understand, Oracle's gonna have their own register Right where you can download the, the 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 Java VM. If you go for Red Hat, for example, Red Hat has have, have their own register with all the Red Hat um, uh, products, for example, that you can uh, download as a as a container image. But uh, you know you, you can also go to Docker Hub. There is the the center where you know everyone has uh, can put your your uh, containers there. So you know you have register for uh, Amazon have register, uh, uh, Azure have Azure, has their own registry. Uh, Google have their own registry. So you have, we have more and more registries where we have those containers, those images, ready to run, put available. And if you, if you do, uh, if you're in your uh, development pipeline, you do uh, a repos uh, artifact repository like Nexus or Art Artifactory, those guys today, they, they also have a Docker registry inside. So you can actually put your, you know, your, the ends of your build process can be a, a, a container image that you, you upload your Nexus repository, for example, and then when you're gonna put this in, in, uh, in for testing or QA or production, you can actually download this from your Nexus repository and, and, and run it locally uh, in, your, in your environment. So containers make it very flexible for you to uh, package your whole application, move the application uh, to, to different places. The same thing that you did before with your jar or ER file on 
uh, your application server, right? That you would have your application server and you would download your jar file from your Nexus or repository just to run it. Now, you do much more than that. You have the whole thing, the whole infrastructure. Actually, you can have the whole, you know, the whole package, all the containers that you're using together uh, to make that run. So if, if, that's, if, if that's like this, uh, the application that uh, Elder sh uh, showed was very simple, just a, a simple application that doesn't have any dependence and everything. But we can, we can do better than that, right? So let's say you know, we have the term EE application server, like we just got one of those containers from one of those registries. And you know, every application requires a database. So let's get a, a Postgre uh, container for another registry, for example. Uh, every application, every corporate application also requires uh, some kind of, of messaging query. So, mm -hmm. so there is a very cool active MQ container that they have everything uh, together we can use. Uh, but you know, today f the best applications today also do uh, NoSQL, right? So let's get a, a Cassandra uh, NoSQL uh, container. So we can connect all of those guys, right? And uh, together, we just reuse those, those Redis use containers, and we can have a much more sophisticated uh, architecture just by reusing infrastructure that has been uh, created, either, either because you created uh, uh, before in, 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 you know, in, in you, you prepackaged you pre those containers and you put in your registry, or you're downloading from uh, Docker Hub or, or whatever uh, other registry that you're using, right? Of course, you know, we also, we, we're going to keep our and Giant's uh, load balancer um, and, and pointing to all of those, uh, our Tommy E containers. So you know, you can have this whole uh, infrastructure that we, that, that we can run, right? Now, once we, and we're gonna show this in a minute, but I'm, I'm just gonna, gonna uh, finish these slides here. But so once we have all of these, that's the cool stuff is that we can, we can now have a, 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 a several ships Right, there are providing uh, container infrastructure. Several ships that are providing, uh, uh, you know, the, the the tools and the cranes that we need to actually uh, manage our containers. So I just put a few of them here. Uh, some of them are open source. Some of them are, are products that, that 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 you can that you can acquire. Uh, you know, as I said, Amazon uh, has their 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 container service up and running. Uh, Google has their container service up and running. Uh, if you want to do uh, also IBM uh, does the same. If you want to do an open source uh, a, a, a project, for example, you know, OpenShift uh, is running uh, with Kubernetes. Uh, you know, so so it's, so you can have an open source uh, uh, infrastructure that you can run your containers. So basically, uh, right now, the the biggest problem that we that we have to, that, that we that we have to start doing in, in our projects is to start implementing those. Uh, uh, you know those container platforms inside our, our our companies, so our operations guys can actually manage and run all of those containers. Because of course, it's really good that you can you can package things in a very big iron box. But what happens if you get to the docks and you only have people carrying uh, carrying big boxes, right? So you're just gonna have you know those of people to carry one one box, and that's not gonna gonna be good, right? It's, gonna, it's actually gonna be uh, even more. Uh, uh, it's going to be even harder, right? So we we do need to implement those those infrastructure. We have open source uh, infrastructure like OpenShift and Kubernetes, for example. We do have products. Uh, you know, oh, uh, I, I don't think I mentioned that. So Jelastic is a is is a product, for example. It's a it's an orchestration tool that that is a product that you can that you can install and you orchestrate all your machines. So once you have those orchestration tools, then you can decide um, where your containers run. Or actually, you can even uh, let the infrastructure decide where the containers run, right? So both Kubernetes or Elastic or, or OpenShift, uh, they're gonna do. You know, you're gonna upload your containers, you're gonna set the parameters that you want, uh, and you're gonna let let the the the, inter, the, 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 the infrastructure manage. Uh, we use Elastic in our in our container infrastructure, all Docker uh, images. Uh, the cool thing about you have an orchestration tool uh, like Elastic is that once you, Jalaski uh, uh, has a, what we call, uh, what they call uh, a live migration of containers. So basically, once you start uh, your container, the infrastructure decides where the container is going to run in all the machines that you have available. So uh, if, if a machine fails, it, it's, since you have the live migration feature, it automatically uh, restart your containers in all, in all the infrastructure without losing data, without losing uh, uh, even the session of your users, right? So users don't, 
don't realize. Uh, we are able to do today things like migrating from one cloud to the other. So you can, you can get your container in, in uh, migrate from, let's say, from, from Azure um, to Oracle Cloud, for example, or from Oracle Cloud to, to Amazon. You can migrate a container live. It doubts, uh, you know, it, it, it migrates to the same IP, keeps the same connections, it migrates all the data that's in memory, right? So, you know, those, the orchestration tools uh, allow the operation guys to handle uh, the infrastructure any way they want, right? Because they, they're the ones that are gonna decide where things should run, where, uh, uh, how big the, 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 heart, the machines are, where, where is the, the cloud provider you're gonna run at, it's gonna run in-house or, or external. Um, you know, you put in the hands of the operation guys all the operation that you need, right? But developers can actually create uh, their containers and put the containers over there. And one, another thing that you can do with the orchestration tools is that you can separate your environments. You know, you can have like a developer environment, a, a, a QA environment, a production environment with different, uh, um, 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 you know, with different users having access to each one of those environments. So you can do things like, for example, you can migrate your, um, uh, you know, you're, you're having a development environment, you, you de developers are experimenting with things. Once things are ready, you can migrate that to your QA environment. And so once it's in QA environments, developers don't have access to that anymore, and the QA guys can actually work on this. And the same thing for production. You can actually move uh, things into production, and just the, the, the operation guys will have access to that. So, it, it, and, and then you're gonna move everything your application needs, not only the, your jar file, but every, absolutely everything the application needs, right? So, uh, with that, of course we are here uh, at Oracle Open World, and, uh, Oracle is talking about a lot about Oracle Cloud. Uh, uh, they, uh, Oracle has acquired a company that does uh, co uh, container orchestration. So you're gonna very soon you're gonna see uh, their orchestration tool also. So, but we're gonna show how we can get the same containers, exactly the same containers that we're running on Elder's machine, and we're gonna run this on a cloud environment. Um, uh, you know, so actually, just just to show here, you know, you're gonna have, of course, your your, your cloud environment is gonna have some kind of orchestration tools or kind of some kind of management. In this case here, uh, we're just starting a, an environment and we're gonna run this exactly same containers on Oracle Cloud, just to show how, how that works. Okay, we're gonna sh sh switch to his laptop right there. Let's see if it works. So, because the, 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 the yes, go, go ahead if you keep, keep preparing here, but the, because the, the, the biggest benefit that we have with containers is, how, is, is to ease our shipping process, right? And when we, sh when we ship, we're gonna put in a different environment than our development. So he developed on his laptop, we're not gonna put in production on, on a cloud server, and it's not showing over there. Oops. You know, realize, realize that, right? So we're gonna put in a cloud, on a cloud environment, and, <laughs> and, uh, and we're gonna download uh, this, these containers, uh, since most, and, and we're gonna show here, okay, no? So we're gonna, we're gonna show here all of the, the uh, uh, you know, we're gonna download all of those containers from Docker Hub, right, because we're not, we, don't, we don't have our own register here. There's a question. You mentioned uh, that you stored something in Nexus. Is that the images and the versions of the images? Yes, we can, on, on Nexus, uh, on Nexus or Artifactory, but Nexus, we use Nexus in particular, but yes, you, you, you upload um, your, the, whole, the whole binary of the images, Right, so um, so Nexus is is, uh, to, is today a Docker registry basically, right? So it uploads all the layers of the images, and so it's a whole binary of the image itself. And so when you when you're gonna do this thing here, um, I'm not sure we didn't show this, but I'm gonna show. Uh, we, we're gonna download the image, right? Uh, it's already downloaded, right? Some. Hmm? They're already downloaded. Okay, so so when when you when you name an image on Docker, it goes to a registry and downloads the the, the image. Uh, to run your, on, on your machine, right? So you can, you can that register where you download to, from, you can point to your Nexus server, and then you download from your Nexus server instead from Docker Hub, okay? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I will start to... Have to load. Okay, let me hold this. Ah, I can't. You hold. I'm tied here. <laughs> oh, 
Thank okay, you. yes, you hold, hold for him. Uh, it's technical problems with the mic. Uh, let's do an SSH to Oracle machine. We have a, a prepared instance to, to run the containers. Let's start running the containers. I have to remember the commands somehow. Docker run dash dash name uh, post grief. We we are starting the post grief db sql db. We, set, we are setting the port. Uh, oops. There's a mistake here. Oh. And I will set the, the image name is Postgres Java 1. So that's, the, so that's the image that you prepared to run here, right? Yeah. It's, it will run in foreground. I will just, oops. Oh. It's easier to see. Let's run the ActiveMQ container. This machine is an Oracle Linux 6.8. Uh, we have pre-installed Docker here. So you are downloading uh, another machine from, from, from Docker Hub, right? Not another image from Docker Hub? And now we will run Cassandra DB. Let's accelerate this a little bit. Let's make a copy paste from here. Yeah. So all all of these, all of the commands and and all of this, those images and everything is on is on, on GitHub, right? So uh, you know if we it's all here. Yeah, all so the commands are here. Yeah. So if you wanna if you wanna take it, you know I saw some people people taking pictures before, but you can go to GitHub and you can download all of those images, all 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 those files. Uh, and you can run all these yourself, right? Yeah, so let's do copy paste, and I think it's better than, than me. So you're, so you're running the Cassandra uh, image, right? Now I'll run Tommy. Application image. It is a Tommy E with the with the application. Oops. Yes. No. It's this one. Right. Uh, I will run three comments at once here. It will be. Oops. Okay, imagine is this. You have to view the image first. Okay. okay so one, 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 thing that we, one thing that we didn't do here is that um, Elder did not uh, Elder did not upload no. his finished image to Docker Hub, right? Let's so check. Instead of we instead of we downloading from Docker Hub the image, we're just gonna build here. But if we had an access 
container co uh, connected, then we could we could do this. So oh. just preview the image. I have a previewed image. Oh, you have a preview image. Okay, so run this. Let's run this instead of the order. Test. Test. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is test. Oops, I forgot the user. Okay. Nope. Oops. Typo. All right. You're in the wrong machine. Yeah, this okay. happens a lot. <laughs> okay, when when you go to the wrong machine, that's that's hard to that things works. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, now it works. Okay. Okay, so now you create you create the containers. Right. So again, all of this is on GitHub, and he's just going to create the the. The NGX container to be the load balance for everything. And now we can access the application. Sorry. I I, I don't. I, oh, GitHub. All right. Okay. Yeah, so Elder Moraes, let's yes, let's just let just he finish working here and we run. So, um, <coughs> running? No? It's loading. Okay, demo modes. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, we still have a few minutes for questions here, but basically, uh, we, we, the, the whole idea is that it it's uh, makes it very easy for you to, uh, to, to create your infrastructure and move your infrastructure uh, you know, from, your, from your development environment to your test environment to your production environment, even to different cloud providers, right? And um, why he's, he's still working here, let me go work on the questions. Uh, so you, uh, I'm just going to put the URL in a minute as soon as he, he finishes here so, I, so everyone can see. Question here. Okay, so basically what, what we're we are doing here, so, so Tommy, well, we're using Tommy to, to do the simple demo because Tommy, is, you just need to copy this, the, the, the jar file, right? But if, you're, if you have a more sophisticated way to install it in WebLogic, for example, uh, you could do the same thing, right? You could, but you, you're going to have to use whatever your application server needs to install the application. But usually, uh, what, what you usually do is that what we do today, right, is that you create a WebLogic application server, for example, you install it, and then when you have a new version of your application, you upload this new version of application to, the, to a running uh, web launch, right? So what we are doing here is that we are creating a immutable server, that's the container, right? So, so basically when we start, we, st we configure the container on your Docker file, you would do whatever web logic you need to install the application on web logic on your container, and then you're gonna, you're gonna generate an image with that application already installed on web logic. Right? And once you have that, then instead of starting a web logic and then install your application, whenever you, you need, for example, you, you, you're having too much traffic in your website, you need, a, you need to, to handle more, you just start a new image with your application already installed. But uh, specific to your question, how do you install web logic? You need to use whatever web logic provides you to install it. Right? So you can, you can run this on Docker, no problem. It's, there's, it's not, it's, there's not a problem for you to run whatever it is. Uh, but on Tomcat, it's easy because it's just copying the file. Okay? I think he's the first, right? So, I have two questions. 
Explore what? Rancher. Rancher. No, no, I have not. Okay. okay. But and the second question was what please show <coughs> how we monitor these con uh, containers? That that like how, how what is the memory utilization? How do we Oh okay, yes. Okay, we we could we can show that. Uh, so so his question is, uh, no, the Ranger, I haven't used the Ranger. So, uh, and if we can show uh, how you orchestrate things. Yes, we can show that. Let me, let, can, can you log into? Yes, so I'm going to go to the next question while he logs into, to, can, can you show to, uh, log into Jelastic uh, JCA? Okay. So he's going to log in and uh, I'll get back to you. Next question, there's some more, here, right here. Okay, so uh, his, uh, I have to repeat the question, of course. So, so his question is about licensing and uh, and how the Oracle license changed. So, so licensing is important. You have to consider because you are installing and running whatever application. So, uh, so if you're running an open source project, you should you, you don't have to worry. But if you're running something like Oracle WebLogic or Oracle da Database or even Oracle Java, right, you have to worry about the licensing and. Uh, I don't know what the license is for WebLogic in particular, but uh, Oracle has been announcing that they are moving and to create their own Docker images for everything. So they have created the Docker image for Java. They are creating Docker images for uh, for Oracle database and, and WebLogic. And so actually, uh, Bruno Borges has uh, a, a a a Oracle WebLogic uh, Docker image. So uh, of course, if Oracle provides that to you, they're going to provide in a license that allows you to run. Right. The one thing that you, you probably cannot do is download yourself Oracle, put an image, and well, actually, you, let me rephrase that. You can, if you have a license for Oracle database, for example, or Oracle WebLogic, you can install Oracle WebLogic in a container and put that container in your internal infrastructure. What you cannot is get get that container, upload that container to, to Docker Hub, for example. You cannot do this because then you would be distributing Oracle WebLogic, and you don't have the license to do that. Right. But you can do this in your internal infrastructure if, if you know, if, if you have a license uh, for the product. So, uh, but if Oracle provides you the container, then you know it's it's whatever license they have. But I, I don't know the details of Oracle's licensing in, in particular, right? But in terms of Oracle, you can use Oracle uh, GlassFish, and that works fine. Okay. Hmm? Yes, we have we. Okay, no, you ju just JC it. Uh, uh, the JC. The JC, yes. Uh, question was. They're too strong. JC is too strong. Just like that. Okay, yes. All right. So, more questions? Here. So, maybe I missed it, but what orchestration tool do you use? So, we use, we use JLASC in our environment. So, Tools Cloud uses JLASC in our environment. But uh, uh, you know we do have several customers running with Docker Swarm as an orchestration tool. Uh, we do have customers using Kubernetes as orchestration tools. Uh, but we ourselves in our infrastructure use. Can we run? Yes. Okay. Actually, I, actually, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to have because we don't, we are running out of time. But I'm going to have to show you later. Okay. But basically, uh, or let me see if I have time to. Where's my phone? Uh, is there any more questions while I try to log in? Yes, go ahead. Okay, that's a very that's very good. So we, what we are doing here on the demo is a very simple thing that we are specifying the name of the containers, right? So his question is, if we're using engine nginx, how do you specify the names? Of the several, you know, the several uh, containers or the servers uh, to do this. So we are using uh, a, a this, this a very nice uh, nginx load balancer that it has different configuration. The one we are using here is that we're just passing the name of the containers, right? And so, yes, yes, just the name of the containers, and it, it, it's it's uh, load balancing on, on, on all of those containers. But the same the same image allows you to do a dynamic uh, process where. You know, you, if you name your container, you, you don't have to have any configuration. But if you name your container in a certain way, it recognizes that those containers when they when they they, they get up, right? Because it, it keeps looking at uh, the Docker um, the Docker events. Uh, you know, so so when a container comes up, 
it sees that the container came up and adds to the load balance automatically. So you can do both ways. Yes. Right. So 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 and then you can you can you can uh, automatically uh, redirect for for the containers that you name it. Okay. Right. So w w the, the the configuration that we did here is a very simple one. It's fix it. Right. So we we have just three containers and we fix this. All right. So um, they're not going to keep me out of the room, right? Are we? Can I just show one quick thing? So okay. So before you know, I'm. Uh, because we're, did our, our, we, we're not out of time. We have we have one minute. Yes, we have one minute. Let, let me see if I can log in here. So, uh, okay, here. Log into demo. Okay, so there's one more question there. Uh, before everyone leaves, because we're already out of time, so if you like the talk, uh, vote for us. If you didn't like the talk, come talk to us and complain. <laughs> okay, so, question. Uh huh. Okay, so, yes, okay, go ahead. Okay, so, so, so the first question uh, was, you know, how do, you, how do you manage resources? So we're gonna show this in a minute, uh, how, you know, assuming, assuming he, he logs in right here. But uh, we're going to show you in a minute how we can manage uh, uh, the resources and how you can, you can do. In terms of the load balance in particular, uh, as, as I said before, you, can, you know, d depending on the configuration of your load balancing. And, and about monitoring, uh, you can have, either you can have monitoring on your orchestration tools or you can add monitoring, you know, you can have other containers that are going to monitor your containers. You can, you can, you can do a more uh, sophisticated infrastructure, right? So. Uh, in terms of, uh, I'm sorry, I missed. Oh, Gelastic. Okay, so so in terms in terms of uh, of Gelastic, first of all, you, you talk about stateless containers. That's really that's a, that's an interesting thing. Docker is a stateless container, so that means you know if the container dies, that you lose all the information in in, in, in the container. But Docker is not the only con uh, uh, container uh, solution that exists, right? So uh, Gelastic uses, uh, although it works with with uh, Docker packaging. He uses uh, underneath, he uses uh, the Virtuoso containers uh, from OpenVZ, and they are actually stateful containers, right? So you could do a stateful containers. But we are basically using Docker, and, and we can, we're uh, uh, managing uh, stateless containers. But even on stateless containers, uh, what JLSC does, it migrates, uh, you know, when it migrates containers from one machine to the next, it migrates memory and data and everything. Right, so even if the, co the container is stateless, while it's still alive, you can migrate from one machine to the, to the other, keeping all the information. Okay, so uh, yeah, so so this this is like the, the orchestration tool. Uh, so that's the, uh, so you know you have, uh, for example, someone asked about uh, you know can you see uh, the containers and the machines? So you know you you can you can have uh, machines in all different zones. Right, so so here we have machines in all kinds of different uh, different um, uh, hardware zones here, different uh, different cloud providers. So you can see uh, there is uh, AWS, there is Azure, uh, there is OVH. There's lots of different different uh, clouds in, in, in other places. So these are the hardware actually, and you can see in any any one of this hardware, you can see for example all of the containers. They're running on this particular hardware, and you can manage uh, each one of these this containers. You can actually see uh, each one of the containers here, um, and and you know kind of drill down on, on to see how much memory it's, it's running. You can actually put uh, 
uh, limits for, for users, uh, how, many, how, you know, how much memory or how many containers or things like that a user can, uh, can manage. So, so you know, you, those are the, the kind of things that you're going to be able to do uh, you know, either on, on I'm, I'm just showing one here, but you can do this on Kubernetes, you can do this on Docker Swarm. The more and more advanced those, those tools become, the easier it's going to be uh, for you to manage and, 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 and orchestrate all that. Okay? I'm not sure if that's what's, you know, just a quick, quick show because we're totally out of time here. Okay, guys, thanks very much. Thanks a lot. And we're going to be here the whole week, so search for us. Yes. Okay, you have a session now. Thank you. Oh no, 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 it's not a replacement edition. No, no. no Doc, Doc is just is just a place where you're gonna run stuff. Yeah. No, it's not not a replacement like that. No. It actually allows you to run all your tools in a much easier way. So today you today you get a machine. So this is kind of, kind of collaboration tool where you can also for first, as a first step you can patch the code to your code if you choose maybe or as we along maybe hit. No, no, so 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 Doc so Doc Doc is a is a is an environment for you to run things. Right? So basically, you know, today what you do, you, you, you have your Jenkins, for example. So you connect your machine, you install Jenkins, you install Jenkins, you install Jenkins on your machine, and you manage it over. So what we're going to do is that you're going to get all these, all these, you're going to put inside a container. Instead of run, going to your machine, running all these, you're just going to run that container in your machine. So, you know, Yes, and just get it. Yes, and just get get my stuff here so we can get out of here. Hey, Gare, don't go away. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there in a minute. Good? Right. Just one. Okay. The best. The best. Thank you. So we, we searched for your OTN yesterday. We, you weren't there. We searched for you. you we, we didn't see you there. In the row. In the other In the row. Yes.
Yeah, oh, yeah, but is that an HDMI cable? Yeah. Excellent. Can I have that? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Saves me having to drag out yet another uh, adapter. That's good. Oh, finally. Should yeah. By himself. Yeah. <laughs> Life's good. good.
Hey, what's up? My name is Keith. I have hot tea. I'll be fine. As long as the voice holds out. But again, I'm lining up replacements if I can. <laughs> Well, I think we've given enough extra time, right? Um, what? What? Okay. Can you hear me now? Better? No, nothing. Great. Yeah. Hello? We got... Oh, hey, there we go. Okay, so we got the screens up and going, so now we have the mic. Which is good, because my, my voice is kind of going, and I don't think I can shout to cover the room, especially enough for an hour, so this is good. Um, I need to, to take care of the most important part first, which is proving to my boss that I was actually here. So if I can get your picture, that would be great. If you want to smile or make funny faces, it's, it's entirely up to you. Wave, yeah, that'd be good. Wave, here we go. So this is a great, uh, great crowd. 
So, hey, starting off or close to starting off Java 1, everybody's still, you know, awake and energized. That's good. You know, as the week has, goes on, you know, we'll, we'll see. But um, <clears throat> anyway, um, I do have uh, stand-ins, so if my voice gives out halfway through, I can tag in a couple people here in the audience. So you know who you are, and don't make a break for the exit. You're stuck. Um, welcome. Welcome to this afternoon session on uh, microservices minus the hype. Uh, how to build and why. Uh, it's, it's more of a uh, kind of a long-running discussion. Uh, we have about an hour here, which is just about enough time to you know, touch on several subjects and not really to dive into any of them as well as any of us would like. Uh, but if we can get kind of things going and the thoughts going and the conversation going, that's great because we can carry on the, the good stuff later. Um, my name is Mark Heckler. I am a, a principal technologist and developer advocate with Pivotal uh, Software. I um, may have heard of Pivotal for the makers of Spring Boot, Spring Framework, uh, Rabbit, MQ, Redis, Greenplum, a uh, huge contributor to Apache Tomcat, a uh, giant handful of other things. Um, so we like to call it a uh, small startup here in the, uh, the Bay Area. So uh, I blog uh, not as often as I'd like, but as often as I can at thehecklers.org, my private domain. Um, I tweet all the time. I kind of live on Twitter, MK Heck. Uh, is anybody here on Twitter? Oh, come on. That's it? Wow. Okay. Well, for those of you who aren't on Twitter, um, I would recommend you get on Twitter. But other than that, I'm also a member of the slightly older and more established social network called email. So if you, uh, you want to reach out to me, I'm, I'm far better at responding on Twitter because, again, I live on Twitter. But I do check email from time to time. So uh, by all means, shoot me an email. Uh, we don't, again, have a lot of time. There, it's, there's probably a good chance that I will cover something uh, that you wanted to hear not at all, or, or that uh, I don't cover it as well as you'd like. I gloss over it too quickly or whatever, and I'm happy to go into much uh, deeper discussions about anything, uh, spoken here or not. Uh, but, you know, again, time. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, who am I? Well, I'm the author of several blogs and blog posts. Uh, I've co-authored one book already. I have another one in the pipeline. Uh, I've contributed to several others, both uh, text and code. I love to read. I love to write. I love to share. I always feel like the more we all share, the faster we all learn, which seems like a, a net positive to me. Uh, I've spoken around the world on various development-centered topics. Thanks for inviting me uh, back to Java 1. I've been here for several years, love Java 1. Uh, always has a special place in my heart. Um, I, uh, first and foremost, I'm a developer. You know, I use what works, and when I find something that works better, I adopt that. When I find gaps in something that uh, is working, or maybe gaps in functionality that should be working, I try to fill those. Uh, I'm a Java champion, recently inducted, and very, uh, very grateful for that, uh, because it's recognition by the community for contributions to the community. If any of you had anything to do with that, thank you. Uh, really appreciate it. And as I say, I'm a survivor of many monoliths. I was a kind of a reluctant convert to microservices because I'd worked with monoliths for years. Uh, and I could see a lot of the pros and cons, but you know, there's some comfort in what you know, right? Uh, so I, I didn't run embracing, uh, run to and embrace uh, microservices, but I've come to be a, a convert. And uh, I'll share some of the, the rationale behind that uh, today as well. And like I say, I'm a seeker of a better way because I'm always looking for a better way to deploy real software into production, uh, not undifferentiated heavy lifting, as Adrian Cocroft, uh, formerly of Netflix, likes to say. So um, anyway, so where do we go from here? Well, uh, my goal today is this, to stay as close to a purely fact-based discussion as possible while hopefully throwing in uh, numerous interesting or amusing TV or movie references uh, at no extra charge. Uh, but no straw men. I always kind of hate it when people set up easy arguments and knock them down. Uh, you know, sometimes the arguments just kind of present themselves to you, but I really kind of hate to, to, to see when people take the, the cheap shots, so I, I try to avoid that. Um, but I have hum I, I, I'm human. I have opinions. Uh, so if anybody's goal is to find something with which to disagree, I'm going to give you plenty to disagree with. That's cool. Uh, but let's talk about it. You know, let's, let's talk after the fact and keep the discussion going because I'm open. I'm learning. Everybody's always learning. Uh, so hopefully this talk is a, a thought-provoking, uh, informative, and mildly entertaining talk. So this is the goal. 
not this. You know, uh, the, the, the talk, this talk isn't to impress, it's to inspire. I inspire you to think, to consider, and to broaden our horizons a little bit. Um, so again, to recap, the goal is this, not this. Okay, so what is, I'm stepping away with the mic and I can't do that. I, I love to walk around and that's, unfortunately if I walk around you're never gonna hear me today. So what is our goal as developers? Now regardless of what you may have heard, speed isn't the goal, velocity is. Now what's the difference, right? Well, uh, get a little geeky here, spin my microphone. Speed is a scalar property, velocity is a vector property. What does that mean? Well, the simplest way I like to put it is velocity is speed plus direction. So you can run really fast, and if you're running in place, you're getting nowhere. So a lot of the, the, the trade press and articles you read is speed is critical. Speed, speed doesn't do anything. Velocity is what you need. You need speed in a, in a given direction so you can make progress. And that's what we all hope to accomplish, right? So, um, one extra click required. So it's, it's somewhat informative. <laughs> Excuse me. It's somewhat informative uh, if we're considering microservices to kind of know what we're considering them against or in, in comparison to and contrasting. Uh, so what are the alternatives? Well, typically, uh, the alternative you, you typically hold up against microservices is this, the monolith. Uh, and, and as I say, that's one big app. Does anybody recognize this, by the way? I should have asked that earlier, but surely you all recognized the, the earlier two, two photos, right? Okay, good. I was starting to think maybe I was in the wrong room or wrong conference. Uh, does, anyone, uh, does anyone recognize this? Okay, uh, do, you, do you know which Godzilla movie this was from or, or show? What, I'm sorry? No, 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 but no t-shirt for you. Uh, I, I'm just kidding, I don't have t-shirts. If I gave you a t-shirt, I'd be up here naked, and that's not anything anyone wants to see. So um, this is from the 2014 movie. So you know, keep, keep awake, folks, there's a quiz. Um, anyway, so I, I find it instructive when you're comparing, I'm gonna try to move this a little closer, apologies for any noise. Um, I find it instructive when you're looking at, uh, at, at something to try to define it, to look at its characteristics. So let's start with that. Uh, the characteristics of a monolith Yeah, I need to be able to see it too. That's well, I can see that. Okay, that should work, right? Okay. Can you still hear me? No. Oh, come on. <laughs> Everybody else said yes, but this guy. You know, yeah. man. I'm the heckler in the room. Okay, keep that in mind. Okay, um, that is quieter, isn't it? Wow. All right, let's try that. I'll just have to uh, look down here a little. Okay, so the characteristics of a monolith. Uh, typically you have one sh single logical executable. In the Java world, typically you're looking at a jar or a war file. Uh, God forbid an ear file possibly even as well. Uh, but whether it's Java or something else, you know, maybe a deployment bundle or a directory or what have you. Uh, so with a monolith, you have a lot of functionality cutting across several different uh, domains, if you will, that are all bundled into a single logical executable. Typically, there's shared data across functionality. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean a single database or schema, but that's usually the case. And that has a lot of history behind it. I mean, typically, what you see is uh, organizations, well, now I'm getting feedback. Okay, organizations where you have uh, kind of a horizontal layering, right? So you have your, your and, and it actually mirrors your organizations. Has anybody here heard of Conway's Law? Okay, excellent. Yeah, good. Friendly crowd. Uh, Dr. Melvin Conway wrote back in the 60s. He's still active, by the way. Uh, prominent computer scientist. Still tweets, although fairly irregularly. Uh, but he produced a paper in the late 60s talking about uh, how your systems, any systems, will mirror the communication structures within an organization. You just can't help it. Uh, so typically when you have a dev group and an ops group, you have things that shake out like your dev environments and then your ops environments. And um, entering into the old, uh, in, into the circumstances of the environment, uh, the early days of computing where hardware and software were incredibly expensive. So you typically consolidated everything into a single database, into a single app server. And, and you tried to maximize that as much as you could. 
So you, uh, over time, of course, things don't change in many cases. So many times still you have this monolith which has a lot of different functionality bundled into one logical uh, executable and you're running on a single uh, shared data source underneath. It's just the way it has evolved over time. Uh, with a monolith, typically change to the flow of control uh, without modification of the monolithic app is, is pretty near impossible. I mean, you're going to be doing some modifications, possibly to multiple modules within there, rebuilding the whole thing, retesting it, redeploying it. Um, and I kind of actually got ahead of myself in the next point. Uh, modifications to the monolithic application require the rebuild, retest, redeployment of the entire app. And there are tools to get around that, but they are indeed workarounds. I mean, they're excellent workarounds, but, but it's an acknowledged problem, right? Uh, scaling the monolith requires scaling the entire monolith, including uh, modules that you rarely use. Uh, I always like to, to kind of think of, of uh, an order entry system or an online retailer system. And if an online retailer vets their customers really well, they may not have many returns. But, so the return module may be rarely used, but every time you have a change to your ordering system, you're going to rebuild everything, retest everything, redeploying, redeploy everything if it is a monolith. With a monolith, typically, there's a greater attachment or a greater commitment to a particular set of technologies. Uh, there's a language, there's a platform, like an application server, what have you, drivers, third-party libraries. And, and typically, these are, are somewhat problematic to employ. So once they're employed within any area within the monolith, that same library, that same uh, deployment mechanism is used throughout. Uh, it kind of makes sense, especially when you're talking deployment. But even on libraries, typically, if you bring in one library to do a particular function in one module, you're going to use that same library in all modules. It just makes sense. But that also increases your coupling to particular technologies across the board. Uh, there is a much lower cohesion and higher degree of coupling in a monolith. And, and this is something that's, that's always troubled me a little bit. Um, because even if that's not the case initially, you know, sometimes people make the argument that you don't need uh, to break things out into microservices in order to have good design. And that's absolutely the case. Uh, but has anyone here heard of the second law of thermodynamics? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate thing that things are going to devolve over time. Uh, the best example I can think of is, is if a junior programmer is on, on call and it's, uh, let's say it's 8 in the morning uh, in California. Well, let's say better yet, it's earlier than that in the morning. Uh, and and you're, you're looking at the massive amount of people who are going to be coming online and hitting your site, hitting your application within a very short time. And the junior dev is told that the system's down and you need to get it back online. Now, let's say the junior dev really wants to do things the right way, but it's going to take probably several hours to figure out the right way to do it and do it in a way that's isolated and insulated from touching a lot of other things. Or, or, there's, there's a quick fix. But it involves reaching across several modules, maybe digging into two or three tables that aren't typically, typically accessed from the, this particular module, but said dev can get this back online in 15 minutes. What do you think is going to happen? Because if that doesn't happen, if several hours go by and that system's offline, junior dev may be cleaning out junior dev's desk by lunchtime. So it's, it's just a matter of practicality. Uh, Amazon is, is probably the best example I can uh, think of for uh, by, by pushing that and enforcing those boundaries, by creating everything in an API first type of environment where you, you dictate that all business functionality has to be expo exposed excuse me, via an API, and you have to maintain that API as a contract with other microservices. It allows you to... Um, to, it, it enforces a certain rigor upon you. Uh, you can't reach in and access data that is controlled by another microservice because that's your only way in, right? So uh, there is a much, with a monolith, there is at least, even if not initially, eventually, a lower amount of cohesion, a higher degree of coupling across modules. Uh, failure of the part usually equates to failure of the whole. Uh, again, a great example of this is that data access layer because if everything is using a shared data store underneath and that data store goes down, everything goes down. Uh, 
one huge benefit of a monolith is that the mental model is fairly complete for smaller systems. Meaning if you have a fairly self-contained, fairly small monolith, you can reason about the whole thing very well. Uh, and it's, it's easier to kind of keep track of how everything is working and where, where all the bodies are buried, if you will. Uh, the, the problem with that typically is not initially, it's eventually, again. Because what typically happens, if you are told to develop a monolithic application and it's going to serve a work group or a small de department, maybe even a division, what happens when your company buys another company? And this has never happened to any of us, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, and then all of a sudden your 50 users went to 500 or 5,000 users and maybe they were all in one location. Now they're geographically dispersed. What now? So this, uh, the, the, the romantic concept of a very small self-contained monolith, I think in most cases, is just that. It, it doesn't, certainly doesn't stay that way, even if it starts that way. So, uh, in comparison, microservices. More than meets the eye, right? They come together, they, they accomplish a, a greater task. Does anyone recognize this? Okay, which year? Which, which movie? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, okay, well. Obviously there aren't any crazy movie geeks in here. Um, I have another talk later this week where I throw out movie quotes, so you know, if you're really interested in you know, leveling up on your movie, come, come to that one. But uh, this is from Transformers 2007. The subsequent movies weren't worth watching anyway, so, you know. Okay. <coughs> Cough break. All right, so some characteristics of mon uh, microservices. Excuse me, don't want to go back a slide. Uh, typically, microservices are independently deployable and executable services, multiples of them. Uh, they're focused services, very focused <laughs> services in most cases. They provide specific application functionality, uh, this allows you to develop in a way that makes sense for your organization, in a way that makes sense for your need, uh, to provide velocity where needed and stability where not needed. Because again, there are going to be some modules, some, some business capabilities that are going to rarely change, that may or may be rarely used. So to focus, even in, in some tangential way, development resources on those is somewhat wasteful, right? So uh, by breaking these down into focus services, you can focus upon what makes sense, what is more volatile, what needs to be uh, given more attention and developed quickly or revised frequently. Um, control flow changes typically in a microservice architecture are trivial, uh, certainly more trivial uh, due to composition and queuing. You have a lot of things in play that can allow you to decouple things quite nicely uh, and to in effect, create new control flows without having to rebuild, uh, I hate to say rebuild the monolith, but certainly rebuild massive amounts of functionality within your greater set of functionality. <coughs> Typically, a change to any microservice is non-disruptive uh, because, again, the smaller scope, adherence to that contract. If you change things internally, but you don't change the contract that you have with the outside world with other microservices, uh, nobody cares. You know, you're not impacting them. And typically with the tooling that you have, the ability to swap in gradually or to do uh, like blue-green deployments and things like that, nothing even has to notice, even consumers of your microservice. Uh, there's more effective and efficient scaling. Uh, as with velocity in which we, we can develop and iterate quickly where needed, we can also scale what needs it, when it needs it. So if, if there, um, does everybody know what Black Friday is? Okay, yeah, I mean, this is the U.S., you know, but, but sometimes you say that and people look at you really strangely. Um, but with Black Friday, you may have to scale your order entry, your cataloging type of modules. You may not have to scale your returns module. Now, a week later, or maybe the week after Christmas, you may, uh, but, but this allows you to scale what makes sense when it makes sense as well, and to scale dynamically up and down uh, so that you, you can concentrate your computing power where it needs to be, when it needs to be there. Uh, standardizing upon APIs and contracts for interaction provides opportunity for polyglot implementation. It's what I call polyglot plus. So you can uh, choose the proper, the best fitting language, uh, platform, uh, locations, you can deploy things, some things on premises, some things uh, in the public cloud. 
uh, it gives you the opportunity to make those decisions at a much more granular level than, than uh, a monolith could ever do. A uh, much higher degree of cohesion and lower amount of coupling because with bounded contacts, uh, there's an API enforced separation of concerns. Uh, is anyone here familiar with uh, domain driven design, Dr. Eric Evans? Okay, bounded contacts. Uh, single responsibility principle. You know, you're looking at creating a, a microservice around a single responsibility. I always kind of find it a little ironic that single responsibility uh, principle is do one thing and do it well. But anyway, <laughs> some of you didn't get that. Ask your friends to explain. Uh, anyway, uh, sort of like the words hyphenated and non-hyphenated. That's a bit ironic, but okay. <coughs> anyway. So, um, yeah, some of you, okay. We'll, we'll cover that later. Um, <laughs> so failure is isolated in a microservices environment. Uh, in a proper implementation, ooh, sorry, pop. Uh, anticip it anticipates failure because in a microservices architecture, it's, it's built around a different set of assumptions, if it's built right at all. Uh, in a monolithic environment, when the monolith goes down, the business stops, right? I mean, everything stops. And everything is focused before that failure happens on making sure that failure doesn't happen. With a microservices architecture, you typically assume failure because um, Netflix. Anyone here a Netflix subscriber? Yeah, a couple. Uh, so <laughs> on the main page, uh, that is all microservices driven, that single pane of glass, that single application. And would anybody hazard a guess on how many microservices feed that single pane of glass? Somebody? About 500, roughly. Uh, last count, last I heard. Um, so that's quite a handful, right? Now, how would anybody care to guess what the odds are that any one of those microservices is the only instance of that microservice running anywhere on the planet? Probably pretty low. So you have, let's just say for argument's sake, 500 microservices and 10 instances of each. That's easy math, so I'll take that. So that's 5,000 microservices that are having to run together and coordinate and communicate, right? Uh, why, why do that? Well, because you know that you're going to have to have a certain amount of load capability. You also know that at some point you may have outages. You may have a network dropout. You may have an instance dropout. And that's fine because you have a system built around the idea of failure versus the idea of, oh my God, I hope nothing fails. So it's, it's built into the architecture. It's assumed. Um, let's see. So where did I leave off? Uh, manageable mental model. This is something that seems a little contradictory from earlier because with a small monolith, you have a very manageable mental model. But let's go to your typical monolith where you have a rather large sprawling system. And let's say you bring in a new developer, whether it's a junior dev or whether it's a senior dev from another department, another group. How long does it take them to get their arms around and build the mental model for that entire monolith? Forever, right? Whereas if you, if you, if you hand them responsibility for a small handful of microservices, I mean, typically you're looking at a, a small amount of code, a small amount of functionality. It's very easy to spin up very quickly in a microservices world. Uh, Jeff Bezos made the famous comment, two pizza box teams. And, and um, uh, one, of our, one of our engineers at Pivotal made the joke at uh, a recent conference we had that we found that if you drop a couple of pizza boxes into a room, then developers congregate naturally around them. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that's how that works, but... Uh, but it sounds good, and pizza doesn't sound bad either, actually. But, um, but the idea is that it, it makes sense. You have a smaller amount of responsibility. You can get your head around and grok. So uh, sometimes at this point in the conversation, people say, wait a minute. You know, this sounds an awful lot like SOA. Uh, isn't this just warmed over SOA? No. So moving on. Uh, <laughs> You probably want a little more information, don't you? Okay, well, uh, they're conceptually similar. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes you hear the, the people say microservices is what SOA was intended to be. I, I think the implementation draws a really clear distinction. I threw out a couple of quotes and then we kind of dissected mm -hmm. a little bit here. Uh, I like what Martin Fowler uh, says. Microservice style is very similar to SOA, uh, but SOA means too many different things. Uh, and most of the time when we come across something called SOA, it's completely 
it's significantly different uh, from the style that we're describing here. Usually due to a focus on what? On ESPs, enterprise service buses. Um, used to integrate, and this is another thing that I absolutely love, used to integrate what? Monolithic applications. So SOA, even though a lot of people think that's just like microservices, well, no. It sounds like it at first glance, and then when you really kind of peel back the layers, you start to see that it's, it's not really that similar. Uh, he also goes on to say that the fact that SOA means such different things means it's valuable to have a term that more crisply defines the architectural style. That's good, because we don't want one term that people interpret a hundred different ways. Here they say my, uh, microservices is an evolution of SOA concepts. The benefit that they bring, of course, is that traditional SOA uh, is not speedy, it's not agile, uh, it's very more difficult to make changes, and with microservices the ability to make changes with less overall cost and less impact on the existing infrastructure is key, right? Uh, it's a different approach using with different uses of technology. So let's peel back the layers a little bit. Ah, it was just taking too long, so I clicked. And unfortunately, it uh, didn't like that. Wow, let's take our time. I guess I need to redo that slide. Okay. So SOA, what I call macro services, right? Often they're monoliths retrofitted with service APIs and connected via a heavy, smart pipeline. So in a way, it's more complexity and even less nimble. Irony. Um, it's also heavier. The protocol, the formatting of data exchange is heavier in general. You have SOAP, which makes no assumptions about underlying uh, transport mechanisms. You have XML, which is a little more wordy. Um, there's also more coupled ceremony because many, if not m most times, uh, producer and consumer code is generated from WSDL. So clients are tied rather forcefully to the API. And when the API changes, both backing services and clients must typically change in unison. Doesn't sound very decoupled, right? Uh, the enterprise service bus products usually incorporate sophisticated facilities for message routing, coordination, transformation, and applying business rules. And as such, an ESB externalizes domain knowledge while incorporating process knowledge, which ironically increases coupling due to the aforementioned uh, dumb endpoints while decreasing it uh, because the bus orchestrates the processes. So it's kind of a, kind of a mishmash there. Uh, all of these points and more make it much more difficult to scale within a SOA environment. Uh, with regard to microservices, the downside is there are a lot more of them. I mean, again, just in the little example I used for Netflix for a, a quote, simple app, you're, you're looking at thousands, at least thousands of instances of microservices. Uh, microservices are lighter as a rule. They don't have to accommodate multiple transport mechanisms because guess what? HTTP 1. Uh, adhering, uh, sorry, uh, so SOAP typically has things like, you know, support for HTTP, SMTP, AMQP, uh, UDP, what have you, uh, versus REST of HTTP. Uh, applications from micro built from microservices aim to be as decoupled and cohesive as possible. Uh, adhering to the API, the contract, is the only requirement for success. Uh, changes to the microservice don't require synchronized updates as long as the API doesn't change. Ooh, I hear the difference here. I'll try to keep leaning there. Uh, a microservice owns its own domain logic, so you get the smarter endpoints. Uh, typically, a microservice receives a request, takes the appropriate action, and returns a response. Uh, REST or similar versus something like WS Choreography or Beeple or other centralized orchestration tool. Um, pipelines, whether they're REST endpoint calls uh, or message queues, are streamlined and straightforward, so they're dumb, so to speak. Um, decentralized and decoupled. I, I always kind of compare it uh, like uh, dancers versus an orchestra. Uh, if you consider SOA like an orchestra, uh, anyone familiar with orchestras? Yeah, come on, right? You have a conductor right up in front. That conductor is really critical to the performance. And he practices with the orchestra, he or she. And at the time of the performance, guess where the conductor is? Right out in front, making sure everything goes right. Okay, let's compare that, our SOA orchestra, with our microservices dance team. So our dance troupe with microservices has a choreographer. The choreographer comes in and works with all of the individual dancers to make sure that they know what they're doing. 
So the dancers, in turn, when it comes to the night of performance, dance, they do their thing, they adjust to the, the dancers around them in case anything goes off, off, you know, step. But where's the choreographer? Choreographer's either in the audience or maybe even in another city, maybe even halfway around the planet. The choreographer is not there. So the choreographer basically sets the situation up for success and then leaves. The choreographer is not the bottleneck in the situation, in the, in the, the system. And that's kind of a key difference. So uh, that's how I kind of think of it anyway. So uh, microservices are built with scaling in mind from the beginning because they're smaller, they're lighter, they're bounded context, they're API driven. Uh, again, if you adhere to the contract, everything's good. <coughs> So there's always a gain, there's always a loss, right? And that's what it comes down to, is what are you willing to give up to get the benefits, if you are? Um, and there, you know, that's definitely the case. So let's take a look at a few of them. Uh, there are trade-offs, some are somewhat contradictory. Welcome to the real world. Depending on the priorities of the business. Uh, there's more scalability. Typically you isolate high demand modules, that gives you more focus. So you can scale those more readily, we've kind of talked about that. Uh, there's greater efficiency due to that increased focus. Uh, there's a greater effectiveness typically because rapid iterations of what I call nuggets of functionality results in more accurate fulfillment of business requirements. Uh, if you're working on a module and a monolith, uh, but I always just like to ask this question. If, don't embarrass yourself if you don't want to respond. But is anybody here working on a monolith or, or working in a group with a monolith, a pet monolith? Okay. What's, what's, your, what's your release cycle? Uh, is it 12 months and up? Anybody? Okay, we got one honest person here, that's good. <laughs> the rest of y'all, we'll talk later. Uh, six to 12 months? Three to six? Zero to three? Okay, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, you can have more rapid release cycles with monoliths, you just, it, you, you run into a lot of friction. So. Uh, typically what you see is longer release cycles, and many times there are really good reasons for that. You know, there have been issues, there have been breakages, there have been a lot of things that contribute to all that. <coughs> but um, what I always like to go back to is for, for your typical monolith, and, and I, I don't have the statistics right here in front of me, but a 12 to 18 month release cycle is not uncommon. It really isn't. So let's just say 12. That's easy, one year. Uh, if you're working on a one-year release cycle and you're trying to get new functionality in there, if, if you're working with a business person or a business team to get new functionality in, how long does that take? Well, at the very least, let's say they got in early in your release cycle and you've developed the requirement, you've worked up the code, you've, you've gone through the whole thing, you've done the testing, uh, you know, the, the, the unit testing, integration testing, uh, user acceptance testing, and all that stuff, you, you know, code freeze, deployment, everything's great minimum you're talking is a, is a year. So what happens, have, has anybody here on a longer release cycle model have ever had the case where your business point of contact, your, your subject matter expert, is no longer in that position at, at the time of the release? <laughs> yeah, I, I, and see, you're, all, you're giving it away. You've all been there. And, and that frequently happens. That person is either in a different capacity, a different department, maybe even a different company. So what happens then when you release the functionality that you worked with Ann or Bob so hard to get in the system? Now all of a sudden, Tony is taking over and Tony looks at it and says, that's not what we need at all. Ann was high. Bob was always out to lunch. What are you doing? So then you get this, <laughs> yeah, not that I've ever worked with Ann or Bob, of course, but uh, so you get this, this problem with requirements drift with not quite hitting the mark so many times. Uh, when you have a, you have greater velocity, you have a, a more bounded uh, bit of functionality, you can release that rather quickly, right? So you can do a very quick release cycle. Maybe it's a matter of a couple months. Maybe it's a matter of a couple weeks. So the chances of losing that subject matter expert and losing that velocity, losing that accuracy is much, much lower. Because, and as, as well as working more closely with them. So your, your misses are much smaller in a microservice world, all other things being equal. I kind of got off target there, but I mean, again, we've all lived through these things. That's why they're so funny, because we've all walked away and survived them somehow. Um, optimization. So let's see, you can choose the best language, platform, database for that particular service. And what's more, 
With a microservice, let's say that you adopt a particular bit of technology. You adopt a different language that maybe is more suitable for the statistics that's involved in this module or a different database platform that's maybe uh, better suited to how you're storing that particular data for that particular microservice. And let's say it doesn't work. Let's say that your performance is one third of what it should be and you've eked out every bit you can. What then? Your risk is so low because you can rewrite the whole microservice in a very short time. You can't do that with a monolith. Your risk is dramatically higher just due to the size of it. And you'd never even consider a change in most cases of language or platform because it's just impractical. It just can't be done. Um, again, interoperability is higher uh, because if you adhere to the API and access requirements, obviously you're in. Uh, availability is non-binary. Uh, architectures assume rapid multi-instance app deployments. Uh, has anyone heard of the circuit breaker pattern? Circuit breaker capabilities. Uh, your availability is typically much higher. I'm going to talk later in the week. I, I actually show you that. I don't know that I'm going to have time to show you a lot of that now, but we'll touch on what we can. <coughs> but the idea behind the circuit breaker, uh, with a monolith, it's either up or down, typically, right? So if the monolith goes down, what happens? Well, demand doesn't stop. Demand just builds up. So when the monolith comes back online, what happens at that point? Well, here's your demand. Here's your monolith. And that's what happens. So you get this weird situation of the monolith is up, the monolith is down. The monolith is up, the monolith is down. With a circuit breaker pattern properly implemented, as most microservices architectures incorporate from the get-go or very early on, uh, you, you start um, restoring connectivity gradually. So it will occasionally, once every however many, uh, it's typically very configurable, uh, it will try to reach out to the down service and, and find it. And once it finds it, it doesn't just reroute all traffic to it. It gives it time to heal. So it will slowly restore that traffic and bring it back online to where you don't get into this whipsaw effect. Um, so greater availability. Uh, greater independence. This is kind of fun to talk about here. Um, but uh, with, with microservices, you're typically not strapped to a particular platform or language. Again, we've mentioned that. You can develop certain microservices in one language or on a certain platform, different database, whatever, uh, and not others. That gives you a lot of leverage, so you're not tied to a particular licensing agreement or a particular vendor. You have choices. You are in the driver's seat again versus what your acquisitions folks have told you you have to use because they signed a three-year deal. Uh, there's typically cost savings, not out of the box, not out of the gate, not by default, but certainly the potential for cost savings. Uh, because again, you're not tied to a vendor or a particular licensing strategy. You can choose what makes sense for you technology-wise, license-wise. It's up to you. Uh, and potentially increased revenue. This is always a fun one to talk about because again, not out of the gate, not by default. But has anybody heard of Amazon? Yeah, a couple of people. Okay. Last year, Amazon's cloud revenues exceeded its revenues from all other business units. All others. Amazon is not a bookstore. Amazon is not an online retailer. Amazon is a cloud services company, web services, AWS, which kind of makes sense. Uh, but if you think about it, when it started, Jeff Bezos dictated that all services, and these were initially just to be exposed and used within the company, within the Earth's biggest bookstore, but all services would be, uh, or all functionality would be exposed via services. Uh, and controlled via access via API. So this became, over time, a very valuable contributor to revenue, a very valuable contributor to, to profits. So there's a very good chance that if you define an API, if you break things out more granularly, that you can create a better working environment for your systems internally, but also potentially expose more of those things to partners, to customers, and do so at a more granular level. Try that with a monolith, because you can do that, but you're going to be going to a lot of trouble to make sure that by exposing one bit of functionality within your monolith, you're not throwing out the keys to the kingdom. It's, it's a lot more difficult, or potentially more difficult. Uh, at the microservice level, again, typically much less complexity because there's a shorter ramp up, easier knowledge transfers. Uh, and then, of course, control, see above. Uh, I didn't mention things like lower complexity per unit. Uh, test cases are typically run only against, uh, you know, targeted or changed modules. Uh, faster deployments due to smaller uh, apps slash modules. 
uh, fewer tests for that particular module. It just, everything goes faster when you're having to test and, and code to this much functionality versus this much. <coughs> so what are the losses? You know, those are all great things, but is it worth it? Hmm. I don't want to give away the fun stuff. So let's see, what are the losses? Here we go. Well, uh, there is a greater complexity at the macro level. You know, make no mistake, you know, when you have 5,000 little bits of functionality running around out there, it's a lot harder to reason about for us. Uh, typically, there are, uh, there are mechanisms put in place for microservices architecture that do two things, one of two things, sometimes both, but usually one of two. One is to make it easier for your microservices to interact and integrate, and the other is to make it easier for us to reason about them and keep control over them. Uh, a colleague of mine likes to call it the meatware. That's us. You know, some, sometimes you get dashboards and control consoles. That's for us. That's not for our services. They, can, they communicate over an API, but we have to understand it. So it's a lot more complex. Uh, typically with a microservices architecture, you need better architects. Now, here's, here's the key. You may have them already. They may be in your organization, but they're operating under the constraints you're giving them. So you may already have what you need, but you don't know that yet uh, because they're dealing with an entirely different set of circumstances. Uh, single data repository for the organization. You'll give that up with a pure microservices architecture. Most people freak out on that to start with. And I'll admit, I was one of them. You know, that's something that you, nobody likes to lose control, right? And when you start having to look at, oh my gosh, you know, if all these various microservices use different data stores, how do you get a, a, a view of your whole organization? How do you get a, a, an accurate view of what's going on? <coughs> it's not so much of a concern, and I'll show you why momentarily. Uh, change. Change is tough. Organizational change, architectural change, it's, it's just not easy. And I mean, it sounds trite, but that's the toughest part. The people part is the toughest part. Uh, and then, of course, greater complexity. And I know I mentioned that up higher. It bears repeating. There's a lot greater complexity to a microservices architecture. And there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Tan Um There are many uh, advantages that it offers, but there are also drawbacks. So just be honest with yourself about that. So has anyone heard of the Plato principle? OK. Now I'm really sad. Uh, <laughs> Think of, think of these, the, the various can, you've heard of Play-Doh, right? <laughs> well, I, I, seriously, I've given this in Europe and different places, I mean, Play-Doh's a big deal and in other places it's non-existent. So it's, it's, you know, it's cultural, everything else, you know, somebody asked me if I've heard of something and if, if you know, if, if it's big in a particular place I haven't been to, I may not have. So I, all kidding aside, you know, Play-Doh's a big deal. I like Play-Doh. I still have a can sitting on my desk that occasionally I'll break out and it's my thinking buddy. Uh, but. Uh, think of, of these as bounded contexts, and they're bounded or separated by a different color, right? So uh, this, think of this as your monolith. <laughs> now, does anyone here have kids you've given Play-Doh to? Yeah. So you give, them, you give them all of these colors, just beautiful. And in 30 minutes, that's what you have, right? It's, or, or better yet, this, right over here. Yeah. yeah. How do you get that back? How do you separate the red, the blue, the yellow, the green? You don't, right? right. I mean, it's impossible. Uh, the Plato principle basically states that it's always easier to combine small self-contained code or data than it is to decouple code or to parse data. And you find that to be the case. I mean, instinctively, we know that when we think about it. It's just a discomforting feeling when we first start talking about this stuff. Uh, so, um, does anybody here, I guess, is anybody here still using the single cross-cutting database underneath? A lot of you are. I know you are. I mean, it, even in organizations that are very forward-thinking, we still have some of those, right? <coughs> so, what do you do? I mean, you, you typically are in your production database that's cutting across various bits of functionality, that's covering the monolith, so to speak. Uh, what happens? You, you run everything off of it, right? Your productions run off of it, your backups, your reports. No, no, in most cases they're not, because you don't want to report to bring down your production database. You don't want a backup to bring down your production database. So what do you do? In most cases, you have some kind of a, a backup database, a secondary, a standby database that's sitting there running at all times, so you can offload those very critical bits of functionality, but they're not critical to production. 
This is really no different. You have a little bit different way of implementing it with microservices, but you can have event sourcing. That's a, that's a very uh, important topic. There's a, in fact, one of my colleagues is going to be speaking with Chris Richardson about that at some point this week. I have to check the schedule. Um, but I would encourage you to take in that session, Kenny Bastani and uh, Chris Richardson. Uh, I, I think they're gonna be covering that uh, very nicely. Uh, but at some, at some level and some mechanism, you're going to need to maybe consolidate or, or offload some of that, I say offload, duplicate some of that data in another store that's not your production set of microservice data stores. It's very similar to the pattern that you're already employing for your monolith. So you really don't lose anything. It's just a slightly different implementation. That's why I say it's not really so much to freak out because you don't have a single source, source of truth. You always will have a single source of truth in some way, shape, or form. So what do I need to execute? How much time do we have here? We have probably enough time to actually discuss some of the concepts and maybe show a little bit of code. Uh, but again, I want to make, I would rather be clearer and cover this much than unclear and cover this. So let's charge forward and see how far we get. And again, by all means, ping me afterward and we'll, we'll continue the discussion. <coughs> so, a very simple example. I remember earlier I mentioned that in any type of microservices architecture, you'll typically have some enabling services or enabling constructs. And some of these are enabling for your microservices. Some of these are enabling for us, for the meatware. Uh, so if you have, going back to the Netflix example, where you have 5,000 instances of various microservices, uh, I guess st stepping back just a moment, has anyone heard of the 12-factor app or the 12-factor manifesto? These are, I, I feel like I'm throwing out a lot of stuff at you. Um, I, I have notes, uh, you know, if, if you want to, please do, uh, you know, look up some of these things if you're not familiar with them already, and if you are, please revisit them. Uh, typically good architecture, especially when you're deploying to cloud environments, as we're all increasingly doing in some way, shape, or form, or will be if you're not now, um, you typically look at certain uh, patterns that make your life easier, that make your code better. So I, I always kind of pull out a couple of those as the, the big hitters. You want to externalize your config because if you have your code littered with configuration, uh, that, that creates problems in several ways. One, if a backing service changes its location, then you have to go in and rebuild your code. That's not fun. That's not nimble. That's not agile. So you have to rebuild your code, retest, redeploy, and if you have a system outage, that's, that's a horrible thing. So you want to externalize that. You also, for security reasons, want to do that. Uh, kind of the litmus test is if your boss came to you and said, we need to open source our software today, this afternoon, the big boss made the decision, it's out of my hands, just do it. Could you do that without exposing credentials? Could you check all your code into GitHub without exposing credentials and risking your business? Most of the, ca and most of the time, that's not the case. But if you externalize that configuration, if, and config is basically what? It's key value pairs if you break it down to the simplest, uh, simplest mechanism. You have something that says, go here, and that's your database service, your backing, backing service for your data. Go here, and this is where to find some other public API you're going to call, some other endpoint. Uh, so by externalizing all of this, you make your code very tight, very, um, very versatile, very uh, portable, so you can deploy that in a different location, and as long as you provide those variables, it doesn't matter. It can run on anything, anywhere. Uh, so. By doing that, though, when you get into microservices world, you start talking about, if you had one monolith that was pulling a few properties from your environment, that's one thing. That's not that hard. But if you have 5,000 different instances of microservices and you're having them go out and, and you know, uh, forage about for their, their configuration, that gets to be a little harder to manage. So we need something that brings those into a manageable, centralized location without, increase, without inserting a new bottleneck. Um, I always go back to the Spring Cloud uh, OSS and Netflix OSS because, hey, I work for Pivotal, and Pivotal has a great relationship with Netflix. Uh, but all this stuff that I talk about is open source, and there are multiple other options out there, not non ours. Uh, so do yourself a favor and please just look them up and see what works for you and makes sense. But with a config service, typically you store your your configuration settings somewhere and serve them up to your various instances of microservices. So you can still manage them and maintain them and provide them. You can also refresh your various microservices uh, via things like Spring Cloud Bus or some other mechanism that says, hey, updated uh, config, go out and get it. So you don't have this giant push. Again, no new bottlenecks you're inserting. Um, 
Typically with the config service, it rests on something like Git or SVN because, hey, we use that stuff all the time to, to handle code, uh, well, text, which code is text, right? Well, so are properties, no big difference. So you have your auditing and your version controlling and, and all that stuff built in. Uh, so typically there's some kind of a config service. There's also some kind of a re service registry. Uh, I always look at this like a phone book. Is anyone here familiar with the antique concept of a phone book? Yeah, I mean, anymore we just grab our phone and say, call Bob. Uh, but in the old days, when you go to a new city, you'd find the silver box in the corner, hopefully, and hopefully you'd, you'd pop open the, hopefully there'd be a book attached to the chain. Sometimes it was just a chain dangling there, but you know, hopefully there's a book there and it has the pages and you can find Bob and then you look up Bob's number and call him. Uh, your microservices need something similar. They need a service registry, a place to see and be seen. That's really critical in the ephemeral world of microservices because if I have a, an instance of a service running here and it dies or the network connectivity is lost, your platform typically is responsible for maintaining a fixed number of those based on demand, based on numbers, whatever. So if this one dies, it may spin up another instance over here. How is that instance found by consuming microservices? Well, that's why you need a service registry. So that needs to be implemented in some way. Um, I actually throw in a couple things here very simply, uh, which is a, a quote service, a backing service. This is a database enabled service that allows me, again, I'm a movie, movie and TV fan, so I store movie and TV quotes uh, and pull those up and provide those as a backing service to an edge service, which then can be accessed via mobile phones or whatever. And then of course, uh, mentioning the circuit breaker pattern earlier, Hystrix is Netflix OSS's uh, entry into that uh, environment for circuit breakers. Uh, and that allows me or my edge service to continue functioning and provide, again, default values or some other value if the backing service is offline. Hystrix in particular is really nice because it lets you stack several or chain several different fallbacks. So you, you know, it's turtles all the way down until you get to where you just go, I give up, here's some, you know, here's an empty set or whatever you want to do. But it gives you options to fall back. Really quick overview of those. Uh, your config service, again, you basically, you have a, a Git repository, you can push updates, you can notify your various instances, they'll go out and pull refresh config. Um, I'll leave that up just a minute here. And then for service discovery, you have things like Netflix Eureka. Eureka is actually good for a lot of other things as well, Netflix uses it extensively. Uh, but I typically, in my examples, use it just for the service registry and discovery um, capability. But each, uh, each different producer registers with the registry. All that information, by the way, and this is kind of critical when you're talking about the microservices, you, again, no new bottlenecks, right? So if that goes offline, you want all of your consuming microservices to have cached that information. I mean, typically you still you know, uh, implement it in a high availability type of situation where you don't just have a single service registry running, instance of it running. But let's say everything just you know, falls on the floor your other microservices should still have that information cached and be able to reach out to their backing services. And then when, at some point, when your service registry comes back online, they reestablish and refresh. Same with the config server. Uh, with a client-side load balancer, and it's client-side, again, um, uh, client-side meaning your client, your consuming microservices, um, there's a load balancing that goes on. You don't insert a new bottleneck for your backing services because typically with your load balancers, uh, on the back end that, that if something goes down behind them, they not, may not necessarily know. They're just funneling traffic. Uh, if that goes down, you can't get to your, your services behind there. Uh, whereas a client side load balancing balancer, again, you have that cached. So if it, it's very much more survivable. And with the intelligent router, sometimes you hear, uh, have people ask, how do I get away from my monolith if I'm looking to migrate from that? Uh, you may have heard of the, the uh, strangling the monolith expression. Uh, with intelligent routing, you can define routes outside of your software, outside of your monolith, uh, outside of your microservices that are then employed to, uh, to route traffic, to route calls, uh, still to your monolith, but over time as, as you build out your microservices portfolio to reroute those without having to change the code. A uh, quick look at the circuit breaker. Uh, again, typically with your circuit breaker, you have an open or closed status, but you also have a half open status so it doesn't immediately slam it with traffic when it's coming back online. It gives it time to heal properly um, so that uh, it doesn't get into the whipsaw effect of a, of a monolith. And then 
there's typically some kind of a circuit breaker dashboard so that you can see what's going on with your various edge services, your backing services. Um, this is for us. This has nothing to do for our microservices. This is just for us to see and understand what's going on behind the scenes so we can see when something's down. We, we can see when it's coming back online. So I, I actually don't have, I, I just have a couple of minutes. So I don't really have any time to, to launch into code. So what I'll probably do is just kind of wrap up here and then field a couple questions and then we can take it offline, you know, ping me afterward. Um, this is Adrian Cocroft. He, he just spoke uh, a couple months ago in Vegas at our conference. Um, and he made the comment I thought was really good because I've said this, but of course it means a lot more from him. Uh, monolithic apps only look simple from the outside. And anybody who's worked on them knows that's the case. I and mean, it's very simple to reason about when it's one big thing. Uh, it's just when you get in and, and try to, to, to peer under the covers that it scares you. Uh, microservices enforce separation that makes them less complicated. And, and again, the argument is you can make a very structured uh, monolith to where it's not as complicated, but it never, never stays that way. I mean, even in the best of hands, it just can't. It's the world we live in. So uh, with that, I guess I will stop talking and um, I'll throw this out there. These are, are just some, some points. Uh, typically, the examples that I go through, and again, later this week, I have another session where I actually do pretty much full live coding, uh, and I use a lot of these things. My repo is down at the bottom. I do have slides and materials and stuff out there as well. Uh, but MK Hack on Twitter, that's the best way to reach me if you have any questions, comments. If I glossed over something too quickly that you wanted to hear more about, again, happy to discuss it at length. So any questions? Yes. That, uh, the question was how about the added latency? That can be an issue. You know, all kidding aside, that can be an issue. Uh, typically, uh, and, and you have certain things that are being, different architectural styles that are being implemented or, or different solutions that are coming to bear on that now. What I always kind of go back to is that in most cases, your simple HTTP REST is not a problem. In most cases. We always worry about that because of course we're always, you know, we're trained and we've, we're experienced in, in trying to est expect the worst. But in most cases, it's not a problem. Now, how do you know if it is? And that's where you get tools like Zipkin, uh, where you can uh, do network tracing across your various microservices, which also makes you ask, OK, or somebody will ask, well, then that, that adds some, some overhead. Well, that's why you have to have a good set of tools that add minimal overhead while giving you uh, as much information as possible, similar to the, the profiling tools that are built in and baked into the JVM. Uh, so. Uh, with, with Zipkin or things like it, you can, you can trace, you create a trace or follow a trace throughout communication across various microservices in your system. And then you can have spans within that. So you can s establish your baseline to see, okay, is two milliseconds okay for this or is that large? Is 200 milliseconds okay for this or is it large? And it, establishes, it allows you to establish a baseline so that you can determine what the problem is. In a lot of cases, and we've all seen this too, um, it's not so much a problem of you, you create new problems, but you're able to find them that you couldn't have found as easily before. So even though you're talking some out of process communication, you can also maybe establish some networking issues that you didn't realize were there sometimes, ironically. So, uh, yes? How can you maintain the transaction across several microservices? Aha, glad you asked. Uh, the question was how do you handle transactions? Uh, there are ways you can do like distributed transactions, but typically what you learn to embrace is your eventual consistency. Um, and and I, I, that always makes people a little uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable. I, I always used to kind of have the saying, eventual consistency means inconsistency. And that is true at its very highest level. Um, but I, I always kind of go back to the, the model for banks and ATMs. And a lot of banks use eventual consistency. They use, um, they don't use distributed transactions, and, and that's because the cost is so high for the risk involved. Uh, if you have an ATM and your wife has an ATM, and the odds of you withdrawing $1,000 cash on opposite sides of town at the same exact instance, instant are pretty, pretty slim, uh, or within a few seconds. Again, really slim. So what typically happens is they, they accept a certain degree of eventual consistency knowing that the odds of that being gamed, being played, are pretty low. 
but it allows you also to be very agile uh, in terms of responsiveness, very responsive in your system. So you don't have to wait for a transaction to go through all of the various hoops before you issue the cash. Uh, and, and there are many other transactions where that's just a killer. You can't wait for several seconds or minutes for a transaction to complete, even if you could, you know, uh, extend the timeout that far <laughs> practically. You'd, you'd never, your, your customers would never tolerate it. So again, it's kind of a different way of looking at it. Uh, you can, with microservices, do distributed transactions. It's just really typically not recommended you do. Because uh, you get into the thing of if this fails, this fails, and you're, how do you get that back? because they're operating independently of each other, not just down a chain, but independently entirely. So different, different can of worms, but very achievable if you change the way you're architecting your system. So, um, Yes, I'll take one more really quickly. How would you handle the requirement to paginate your data across multiple microservices? To paginate? Oh, wow, sorry. Paginate the story. Uh, typically, what you'd have to do is, is in a case like that, you know, where I mentioned you'd have a some kind of a collector where you create an external store that, that aggregates that data in some meaningful way, you typically wouldn't go out and hit your various production microservices and assemble it yourself. You could, but in many cases, you're also creating that secondary data store anyway. So I, I would point you to that as your source of truth for reporting and things like that. That would give you, that, that completely avoids having to, to go out and ping everyone individually. It's, the work is already done for you. So, all right, um, everybody again, please follow me on Twitter, email me, whatever, it's all good. Uh, happy to talk about this at length, but thank you for attending. Thanks. I'm out on SlideShare, and yeah, right. I, I, haven't, uh, up, I haven't put the latest version out there, but some of them are already out there, oh, and good. I will tweet the, the updated deck um, at some point this week. Yeah. What's your Twitter handle? MK Heck. Short for Mark Heckman. MK Heck. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to make it as short as I could. Which one's the biggest? Oh, H-E-C-K. Yeah, no, that's all right. That's all right. Yes, sir. Do you have a practical experience uh, when I will be always above the uh, service with the database as a service? We have services that share the database, but one service has two wide other services. Yes. Yes.
go. Hello. Testing one, two. So that works. Good. All right. Cool.
Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Linda DeMichel. I'm one of the specification leads for the Java EE8 platform. Um, my fellow specification lead, Bill Shannon, is here in the first row. Say hello, Bill. <laughs> so um, the purpose of this talk is to give you an update on Java EE8, where we are today, and then an adjustment in focus that we're proposing to make to address current trends in cloud and microservices. Um, usual disclaimer, what I'm going to be talking about is either work in progress or work that we're proposing to do. So don't base financial decisions on what I have to say. Um, I'm going to start with a brief uh, recap, some background material. And then we'll review our original proposal for Java EE8 and what we've accomplished so far. Um, I'll turn then to the ways in which we're proposing to modify these plans to address recent and emerging trends in the industry towards cloud and microservices. <clears throat> and finally, since this is very much a big picture talk, um, I'll conclude with some pointers as you, how you can learn more about the details of some of these proposals at other talks here at Java One how you can contribute, and then how you can influence uh, what we're proposing to do. <coughs> so the road to Java EE8, of course, started with Java EE7. Um, our initial goals for Java EE8 were built on the success of Java EE7, um, focusing on and building out work we had done in the areas of HTML5 and web tier enhancements. Um, ease of development, which has been an ongoing theme with us, and improvements to the Java EE infrastructure. Um, we generated a lot of excitement with the EE7 release, and that's seen in the adoption that we've had. Um, there are hosts of compatible application servers that you can use for the platform. Um, you can develop and deploy to any one of about 20 um, compatible Java EE6 and, jo or, and or Java EE7 compatible application servers. Um, there are hosts of user groups. I've listed a small subset here. Um, many have adopted JSR projects, which we really welcome for their feedback. Um, there are hundreds of publications, job opportunities, and so on. So, Let's turn now to where we are with Java EE8 um, today. When we started to formulate our plans for Java EE8, we had a, this agenda of items we wanted to build on from EE7. Um, at the time, many, many, many of them along the same lines and themes. Um, but before we launched the EE8 um, proposal and before we defined any specific JSRs, we started with an extensive community survey. And we got thousands of participants in the survey, somewhere over 4,000 participants to the three parts of the survey. And we fed the results of this into our planning efforts. And the results of the survey had major influence on the shape of the JSR uh, proposals for EE8 when we launched EE8 about two years ago. So I'll, I'll be talking about some of these. So these are the major JSRs that we identified as part of the plan for EE8. Um, CDI, which since its inception has played a central role in providing ease of use for the developer. Um, JSONP, the JSON processing API, building on the work that we had done in EE7. And um, JSON binding, which is a new JSR which complements JSON processing with a um, JSON to object mapping facility. Um, Servlet with an ambitious agenda for HTTP2 support. Um, JAXRS for reactive clients, server side events, integration with JSONB. Um, a new action based MVC JSR to complement um, JSF, the component um, based MVC framework that we've had for many years. Um, Updates to JMS to continue the trend towards modernization and simplification that we began in EE7. Um, an updated management JSR and a new security JSR to um, simplify and modernize uh, security in the platform. 
And then finally, bean validation, which was just launched in the last couple of months, which we had anticipated for some time, um, which is, again, a new 2.0 JSR. So in addition, there are a number of planned smaller updates, um, maintenance releases to existing JSRs that are part of the platform. And these maintenance releases, um, we've already done one of them with common annotations, will be driven by the needs of the major JSRs of the platform. We're not otherwise planning any other maintenance releases. So I want to look at all these JSRs, what their goals are, and where we are with them as of today. So the goals for CDI were focused around making CDI more modular and for supporting use of CDI outside of Java EE containers. And this was in response to strong feedback, both from within the Java EE community and from the jo broader Java community as a whole. Um, this work has entailed the split of the CDI spec to make clear which aspects of the CDI spec are core CDI that is common to both Java SE and Java EE um, environments. And then those parts that are specific to use in SE, for example, the bootstrapping API for bootstrapping a CDI container in an SE environment, and which parts are specific to Java EE. So in addition to that, um, the CDI expert group has been addressing a number of requests for enhancements. Um, from the community, such as um, asynchronous events and uh, observer ordering. And these are um, both in the recent um, early draft two, which the CDI expert group has um, just published. So JSON processing was added to the platform in EE7. Um, it's obviously a key technology um, and is becoming increasingly important for modern applications not just um, at the browser or the data export level for, um, for these applications, that is through REST or through WebSocket, but also at the data tier level um, with the emergence of many NoSQL databases that, that use JSON as part of their underlying data model. So the goals for JSON one, uh, JSON P11 were to keep it up to date with emerging standards. Um, JSON pointer, JSON patch, and JSON merge patch um, to add editing operations um, for JSON object and JSON array, and helper classes and methods to utilize the Java SE8 lambdas and stream operations. And there's a very nice, you can think of it as a query um, capability over, over um, JSON documents that um, was introduced as part of this. Ah, what happened? Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. Okay, so Jason P has published an early draft two um, last year, but it's essentially completed all of the uh, agenda items in its JSR proposal. When we did our community survey, um, JSON binding API was one of the most requested features um, from that survey. It was the number one requested feature in that survey. Um, so what this does is it provides a mapping between JSON data and Java objects. So it complements the JSON processing API and thus closes the gap in the platform support for JSON technology. Um, to facilitate ease of use, it provides default mappings between classes and, um, and JSON text and, and then customization APIs so you can customize this mapping. And it gives us a standard support to handle application JSON media types for JAXRS. So um, JSONB has been making great progress. It's completed its public review and it's a very active expert group. So um, JAXRS, REST has become central um, not just for the HTML5 support, but it's becoming increasingly important for service-to-service -service communication, for communication among microservices. Um, some of the um, areas on the JAXRS agenda include server-sent events, uh, support for a reactive client API, hypermedia improvements, and integration with other JSRs and frameworks, in particular um, CDI. 
Um, Jack's arrest has not yet released a draft, although the expert group has been very active. Um, but the RI for Jack's arrest, namely Jersey, is, um, is, has been making good progress, and in some ways it's ahead of the spec because of exploratory work that was done um, within Jersey. So that RI already has implementations for some of these features, including server sent events and uh, reactive APIs. Now, for those areas where we haven't yet brought them into the standard, of course, what's been done in Jersey um, could be considered preliminary work. It doesn't entail that the end result will be what's in Jersey today, but rather that's, of course, up to the expert group. Uh, the big ticket item for Servlet 4.0 is support for HTTP2, which is now a proposed standard um, from IATF. And um, the stated goals of HTTP2 are to address the limitations of HTTP 1.1 in particular um, for performance. That is reducing latency, supporting parallelism without requiring you to have multiple connections to achieve the parallelism, um, addressing the head of line blocking issue, giving you some facility for server push, um, at the same time, retaining the user visible semantics of the uh, existing HTTP 1.1 uh, protocol. So in addition to providing server-side support for HTTP 2, um, the Servlet expert group has a task of figuring out how to best expose uh, relevant features of this protocol so that they can be leveraged in the programming model. Um, for example, server push which, was, which allows the application to determine the order in which data is exported to the client. And in fact, um, in the early draft that was released by the Servlet Expert Group, there is in fact a push builder API uh, that was done, was added in that draft. Okay, JSF is um, certainly mature technology. It's, um, this JSR is intended to address smaller scale features rather than um, big ticket items. And um, it's driven mainly by requests from the community. Um, some of these enhancements have, that have been made are better integration with CDI, uh, WebSocket integration, support for AJAX method invocation, class level beam validation, and support for um, Java SE date time support. So, JSF has completed an early draft too, but actually it's addressed uh, much of its agenda, nearly all of its stated agenda. We filed a new JSR for um, an action-based model view controller framework. So the idea here was to provide a complement to the JSF component-based um, MVC framework. So in this case, it's the task of um, the application to turn, um, to turn the HTTP2 requests into actions. Um, this isn't intended to be a JSR out of whole cloth, but rather to leverage existing technologies. So for the model, leveraging CDI and beam validation, and then uh, at the templating level, facelets and JSPs. So this JSR has published already uh, a public review draft. GMS 2.0 did some great work in terms of simplifying the core JMS APIs and leveraging CDI in its programming model. Um, one of the things that it didn't address was what we have today with message-driven means. And ironically, message-driven means were once the simplest DJB type, but by far no longer. Um, so one of the major agenda items for this expert group was to continue this work with the simplification and generalization of message-driven beans. Um, in addition, there were some smaller items that the spec lead wanted to address, um, increased portability between application servers and um, better support for JMS and XA and bad messages. So um, JMS unfortunately hasn't made much, much progress, although it's completed its early draft, and that early draft has um, the addition of flexible MDBs. Um, 
the Java EE Management API, this is a 2.0, um, but it's a rename of the existing old J2EE Management um, API, which as you can imagine is um, quite antique at this point. Um, so the idea here was to provide REST-based management APIs as a replacement or rather to supersede um, the old style EJB-based um, APIs of the J2EE management JSR. Um, it was intended to be a superset of that functionality, to basically capture all of the functionality in that earlier JSR, but simplify it and make it REST-based. And in addition, um, this JSR had hoped to uh, include a simple deployment API. Um, unfortunately, this JSR really hasn't gotten off the ground. Okay, security. Um, the security JSR has a really ambitious agenda. Um, the goals were to simplify and modernize Java EE security, in particular by leveraging CDI, some of the CDI features such as interceptors. Um, some of the proposed simplifications included APIs for managing users and groups, password aliasing, which was an agenda item that we had tried to introduce in Java E7 and never really were able to complete, um, APIs for role mapping, uh, metadata for authentication, um, security interceptors, much along the lines of the transactional interceptors that we had added in um, Java E7, but a really flexible way to, um, to handle authorization with support from CDI. And then finally, um, the last of these JSRs being validation, which um, is, the expert group is now up and running. Um, this was filed um, just a couple of months ago, and its main goals are to leverage updates to Java SE8 and address uh, requests from the community for additional features. And, and these are some of the features that the JSR lists as being relevant to the EE SE8 agenda. Um, namely constraints that can be applied to collection items, uh, support for the date time API, um, use of optional, um, Java SE optional, repeatable annotations, and other features. Okay, that was a quick tour of um, what was originally proposed for Java EE8. So, where are we today? Um, this orange dot is, in, kind of pie chart is intended to represent um, a loose capture of the status. Uh, don't take a picture of this. This is kind of, I don't want to, <laughs> this is a little loosey goosey because I'm not too good at these pie figures. So some of them should probably be five eighths instead of three quarters. Some should be one quarter. Um, but some of our JSRs have essentially completed um, the agenda items that were proposed in their JSR submissions. Even though they may be at one of the early draft stages or the public review state, whereas others have made considerably less progress. So for example, um, Jason P and um, and JSF have essentially completed the goals in their, in their proposals. Um, Jason B has been making excellent progress. It's completed its public review. CDI, this probably more accurate as a 5 8 but I can't do that. Um, so whereas some of them have not yet gotten off the ground, such as management. I'm not going to fault bean validation because that's a new JSR and that, act, that expert group is actually quite active. OK, so. In the meantime, where are we now? Well, the world is changing, or the world has changed. Um, current trends are a lot different from when we launched Java EE eight, two and a half years ago. So the industry is moving on. There's much more focus on the ability to deploy applications into the cloud. And when we launched Java EE eight, Docker didn't, didn't even really exist. So the landscape has changed considerably. And there's also a definite trend towards microservices-based um, architectures, where instead of monolithic apps, apps are architected as highly distributed, smaller scale, and reusable services. And there's more emphasis on DevOps. So while it's possible today um, to run your Java EE applications in cloud environments, 
Um, Java EE isn't really focused on supporting um, what are currently cloud native microservices style applications. So we think the bottom line is that we really need to adjust because we want the future of Java EE to be viable for these next generation applications. So they're composed and deployed differently in cloud environments. They're more loosely coupled, they're more modular, they require have somewhat different needs in terms of scalability and flexibility, composability, updatability, and reliability. Um, so we need to be able to evolve um, smaller scale independent services quickly and consume cloud services from other applications. Okay, so how do we address these challenges? Okay, so I wanna talk now about our proposals and keep in mind that these are proposals, okay? This isn't nailed down. Um, at the end of the day, the expert groups are gonna have a fair amount of say here. You can have a fair amount of say here and I'll give you pointers at the end of this talk as to how you can channel your input. Um, okay, so what we're proposing is to retarget the Java EE platform to address these shifts in cloud and microservices architecture. And we think that this can best be done with a two-fold approach. First of all, uh, a relatively constrained adjustment and focus to Java EE 8. And then for Java EE 9, um, longer term, more in-depth work targeted at what you could consider enhanced support for cloud and microservices that leverages work that we're going to be doing in Java EE8. Um, our intention is to run these two efforts in parallel so that we can get started with the longer term issues and, um, and areas before we finish Java EE8. Um, so tracking what we're doing in Java EE8 and building upon it in parallel. Um, I'm gonna cover the first of these areas, that is the Java EE8 changes in this talk, and then in the follow-on talk in this room at four o'clock, um, our colleagues, Rajiv Mordani and Josh Dorr, are gonna be talking about proposals for Java EE9. Okay, so, our goals are also to provide a migration path. So this isn't a radical departure, it's to provide a migration path to cloud development and deployment for our existing Java EE customers, and to provide a migration path to microservices-based architectures for our applications, um, thus retaining backward compatibility um, with Java EE. So here's what we're proposing in terms of revisions to Java EE 8. There are some additions and some subtractions um, to achieve a focus that we think is more appropriate to address these emerging trends. Um, our plan is to basically more or less tie off JSRs that are almost complete. And in that category, I would put JSONP and um, JSF. Um, JSON-B, as I said earlier, is a new JSR. It's been making great progress. We believe it's essential um, in this new environment. Um, for Servlet, it's critical that we complete the work um, for HTTP2 support. So that'll continue as the number one focus of the Servlet expert group. Um, REST is obviously a key technology in cloud and microservices. So we'll be reinvigorating the JAX RS work. Um, with a focus on reactive programming model and for greater resiliency, the addition of a circuit breaker API within, uh, within JAXRS. Um, you can, so for security, um, we need to reorient a bit. Um, we believe it's essential to address requirements for OAuth and OpenID and secret management. Um, the agenda for the security JSR is already extremely ambitious, I think, so we may need to adjust that agenda plus or minus for, to accommodate these new features within EE8 um, 
and areas that perhaps don't make the security JSR and EE8 will obviously become candidates for um, EE9. Um, we also need to prioritize in terms of those areas where we think we need to cut back or not pursue further. So JMS is a mature technology, and while it would have been really nice to have flexible JMS um, MDBs as part of the platform, um, our current thinking is that our efforts would be better spent if we looked at some of the newer forms of eventing and messaging um, that are emerging today. Um, and Rajiva and Josh will be talking about some of that. So we're proposing, instead of JMS 2.1 as um, the um, inclusion in Java EE8 to roll back and include um, JMS 2.0. Um, the existing management JS, J, uh, APIs aren't really extensively um, used, and the management JSR hasn't made any progress. So we're proposing to uh, stop work on management 2.0. Um, for MVC, this is, I realize this may be a little bit controversial, um, but we think that the new MVC JSR will be less relevant in this cloud environment so we're proposing, even though it's made good progress, we're um, proposing to stop work on the MVC JSR. Um, on the other hand, um, we think that we need to file some new JSRs, um, in particular for configuration, and this has been an item that we've wanted to address um, for quite some time, and that's now becoming more urgent. Um, a new configuration JSR as part of Java EE8 and also um, a, a JSR for health check APIs. Again, thinking forward to um, service-based applications that are highly decomposed where you need to worry about the health of the applications that you're talking to and the services that you're talking to. And um, in addition, some basic support for multi-tenancy, which we're thinking does not need to be a separate JSR. So, um, this slide summarizes our rationale for these proposed changes, um, that cloud apps really need to rely on remote REST calls, so we need some circuit breaker API to add to the resiliency um, in this area. And this will be introduced, our proposal is to introduce this as part of JAXRS. Um, perhaps it can be extended um, to apply to other APIs as well. And then um, focus on security with OAuth and OpenID, which have emerged as the norm in cloud computing, and um, secret management, which has been on our agenda for a while. Um, we need to externalize configuration. We need a basic config API. Um, some more sophisticated apps will require support for multi-tenancy, so we'd like to provide some base level services here that can be relied on and again for resiliency health checking. Um, in terms of dropped functionality, as I said, um, we're proposing to stay at JMS 2.0 rather than advancing to JMS 2.1. And um, we think that cloud MVC will be less relevant for cloud apps, so we think that MVC will not be so uh, important here. And uh, as I said earlier, our current management GSR is not widely used. Um, this is the slide that Anil showed in his keynote yesterday for the proposed focus areas for Java EE8 and Java EE9. Um, I've highlighted here um, in the darker blue those aspects that we're proposing to address in the context of Java EE8. Um, so this will be like the first phase and then the more advanced aspects are targeted for Java EE9. So if we look at some of these in programming model, um, not full-blown reactive programming in Java EE8, but rather a reactive client API in JAXRS, support for HTTP2, JSONB, Lambdas where appropriate, um, a new JSR for externalized configuration, and an API um, for addressing, for accessing configuration from potentially multiple sources, um, basic support for multi-tenancy, um, 
circuit breakers, and um, health check API for resiliency, and then a number of enhancements to security. So I want to look at these um, briefly in, uh, in a little bit more detail. So for reactive, um, reactive style programming is more common in cloud-based environments where the apps are more distributed and there is increased latency. So you don't want a synchronous API. You want some kind of callback uh, mechanism where threads are not going to be blocked. Um, we're going to, our proposal is a migration path to a fuller reactive programming model in Java EE9. In Java EE8, we're going to take a few steps in that direction with um, reactive clients in, um, in JAX-RS. So the idea with circuit breakers is um, they're important to improve resiliency and fault tolerance in distributed systems by isolating failures and preventing those failures from cascading. So they give you a generic way of um, dealing with failures in, in remote invocations. So we want to avoid the situation where you know, developers have to write extensive boilerplate code to hand or handle failures and standardize on um, a basic circuit breaker API. Um, we're envisioning this, as a, again, as a first step uh, by introducing this in the JAX-RS client API. Um, the approaches that I've, I've listed here are straw man approaches that our, our team has, uh, has been thinking about, um, whether programmatic or whether declarative with some annotation-based approach. And then we want, of course, this to be configurable. And again, these are straw man things that you might want to configure, like the sampling frequency or the time period, or you know, what's your threshold for um, triggering a circuit breaker. Um, I should mention that JAX-RS, the, the Jersey API, the RI for JAX-RS, um, has been experimenting with circuit breakers. It's, it's, um, you can use Hystrix um, circuit breakers with um, Jersey right now. So again, um, like circuit breakers, health checking is needed for resiliency and there's no standard here. Um, you want to be able to check the health of other applications, of resources, servers, microservices. Um, today, since there's no standard, you would expect them all to report health differently. And you'd like more than just a you know, yes or no response. I mean, ideally, you'd like some semantics, uh, health status codes, for example, or the reason for failures, or um, you know, what about the dependencies of, of the service whose health you're checking. So our idea is, um, is to file the JSR with the REST-based uh, REST API and then relying on um, JSON for the actual data that gets um, passed back. Um, we'd want to uh, have some kind of configurable context path. And um, notice that circuit breakers, for example, could leverage, potentially leverage, uh, such a health check API. Um, I talked about this a little bit already. You know, our, our JSR for security is really ambitious, but we think we need to add support for OAuth and OpenID Connect to the agenda. OAuth is, is um, complex, it's hard to use, and um, it'll be the task of the security expert group to evaluate how to improve that, how to perhaps um, introduce simpler APIs that will, will capture the semantics. Um, Ditto OpenID Connect. So um, this may or may not entail a reprioritization of the already ambitious agenda of the security expert group. So configuration. Um, configuration of an app needs to be externalized. Um, 
We want to separate the app from the configuration of the app. And we need an API to deal with multiple configuration sources to perhaps uh, support layering and override of these sources so that you can not only configure an app, but potentially reconfigure an app as it moves to a different environment. You might have multiple instances of an app um, that need to be um, configured differently. Um, and you may have different stages of your app where each stage of the app, for example, um, a development stage of the app versus the production stage of the app would need to be um, configured differently. So we want to standardize um, a mechanism for configuration, um, define how you can inject configuration information into the app itself, um, how you can layer configuration, and how, um, how you can work with issues of mutability. So um, there's been a fair amount of community effort in this area. You know, Apache, Tamaya, um, Delta Spike, Spring Config. So we need to leverage what's already been done and learned in this area. And I expect that our spec lead for the configuration work will try to bring together um, experts from these various communities to, uh, to help with this effort. And um, finally, multi-tenancy. We'd like to do something simple here. I realize that this um, might be less obvious than some of the other areas. We've gotten some feedback already that, well, this should probably be optional for those servers that really want to support multi-tenancy. But the basic idea is to provide some kind of structure or some kind of information for those applications that are more sophisticated that need tenant-specific routing or need to, be need to identify um, who the incoming tenant is. We tried to do some of this in Java EE7. Um, we didn't get very far with it, but I think it's time to revisit those proposals and to see if we can converge, again, on something fairly straightforward that can be leveraged uh, by these more sophisticated um, applications. Anil showed this slide in his keynote. Um, these are the JSRs that are part of the Java EE7 platform. If you look in the platform spec, you can find the long laundry list of APIs that are required pieces of the full Java EE7 platform. In Java EE7, we enhanced some of these as full JSRs. In other cases, some of them were just uh, maintenance releases. And a couple of these technologies were defined as optional. So it's optional for a platform, um, an application server vendor to implement some of these APIs. Some of the older ones like JAXRPC, um, JAXR are optional for a vendor to implement, but they're still part of the platform and they're still um, part of the reference implementation. This slide summarizes what we're planning to do, or what we're proposing to do, I should say, in Java EE 8. This is our revised proposal. So, and apologies to anyone who is colorblind here. Um, the ones in dark blue are existing JSRs that are being updated in Java EE 8. They're part of the list of main JSRs that I went through in the beginning. So these JSRs are like .1 or 2.0 releases, or in the case of Surlet, a 4.0 release. Um, down at the bottom, JSON B and security were newly introduced in the Java EE 8 platform. Um, our intent is to enhance and continue that work and complete those JSRs. Security will also be part of a uh, big part of Java EE 9. And then configuration and health check are new JSRs that we are planning, proposing to file as part of the EE, reinvigorated EE8 work. So this is the roadmap. Again, if you went to the keynote, you saw the slide before. So where we are today, um, we're gathering feedback. And I will, in a minute, give you pointers as to how you can give your feedback. Um, and we want to get those new JSRs off the ground. And then as we go forward, we'd like to complete Java EE8 
by Java 1 next year. You know, that's specs, R-I-T-C-K, the whole thing complete. In parallel, we want to advance work on Java EE9, have that work well up and running and have some kind of EA um, for Java EE9. And then, uh, I realize this is quite ambitious, but we'd like to um, complete a Java EE9 release within two years. That's the goal, okay? So, how can you contribute? Um, first of all, take the survey. You know, we really want developer input. The survey is now live. Um, it asks you basically how you would view as important or not important some of the features that we have and some of the APIs that we're proposing, um, existing ones in Java EE8 and some of the new ones, some of the areas we could address, and uh, longer term items for Java EE9. So please go take the survey. We'd love to get as many responses as we did to our EE8 survey. Um, if you have technical comments or even political-based um, constructive comments about some of the proposals that we're making, you know, what should be in, what should not be in. Um, in addition to blank fields in the survey where you can fill in in the survey, you, you can also um, send technical comments to the users list for the platform JSR. Um, you can join the JCP. It's free. Um, there is a JCP membership drive that's going on right now in the Hacker Garden area uh, in Java Hub. You can join the JCP. JCP now has different um, contributor levels. So um, if you don't want to be a full-fledged expert, you may not have the time to be an expert, you can register as a contributor um, to various expert groups and be acknowledged that way. Um, so go find out about joining the JCP. Um, the URL here lists the JSRs that are part of the platform, where they live, how you can track their progress, um, so it gives you access to, um, to uh, the JSR project pages. And adopt a JSR. We think adopt a JSR is another really great program for channeling feedback. You can get together with other um, like-minded people or not like-minded people and disagree, and as a group, um, channel feedback uh, for an expert group. Um, our spec leads really like this, this adopted JSR mechanism because it gives very constructive feedback. Okay, so what I'm gonna leave you with here is a long list of talks where you can learn some of the details. I realize what I've said has been extremely high level. Um, the next talk here in this room uh, will do a deep dive into some of the longer term proposals for more advanced platform work. Um, the speakers for this had so much to say that they've actually split their talk into two pieces now. The second part of that talk is, again, I believe it's here in this room, and it's the one called Portable Cloud Applications with Java EE. So um, part one right now and then part two tomorrow afternoon at this time. And um, we have a boff tonight. Um, I forget exactly where the boff is, whether it's here in the Hilton, but um, the Java EE for the cloud boff where you can um, meet with a number of the spec leads and again, give feedback on these proposals if you like them, if you don't like them, if you have questions and want to understand more. Um, that's a good, um, really low-key way to, to get your questions and, and answers insofar as we can give you answers. Um, and that's basically it. I'll take any Q&A and, yeah. Linda, uh, factual question. When is this a survey ending and what, are, what steps are you doing to get the word out about the survey? Well, we're trying to advertise it as much as we can here at Java 1. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, the question was, what are we doing to advertise the survey? You all can help advertise the survey. Um, where every one of our uh, speakers on this list should be advertising the survey because we really want to get a lot of feedback. So you should see a slide that is the next step slide in most of the, the, the talks that you're going to be going to um, from our team with the, the new proposals. Part of the question, how long is the survey going to be open? Um, how long is a survey going to be open? 
I would anticipate several weeks, but I don't have that information. That's a great question. Yeah, Werner. Okay, the short form of this question is what's happening with java.net and what are we doing about it? Uh, we have a team that's currently looking at how do we deal with this and where are we moving stuff to, and I think it's a little early for me to say exactly what those guys are thinking, but yes, we're working on this. Uh, to be quite honest, I wasn't aware of the JSON B move, so I can't really comment on that. Yeah, Reza. Uh, Ressa just raised the issue of the Guardian uh, survey and the microprofile.io survey. And yes, we've been looking at both of those, so thanks for posting that. Um, the, if you go to the, let me go back here. If you go to the Java e spec, uh, java.net project and you look at the mail archives, there's uh, an email there that Reza just posted on the users list that has the URL for the survey results. So um, that's the way I go to look at the survey results. You can look at the survey results to the Guardian survey there. Um, microprofile.io has their survey results and I forget whether you need to go to Google Groups or, uh, or where to access those, but John who is back there can tell me how you access the microprofile.io yeah, survey. Well, we But you have them up today, where can you see that on your website? Oh, I thought you had preliminary results up. At yeah, least I had seen something. Results, but yeah. Anyway, go to microprofile.io and if you sniff around there, you can find some information as to the feedback they've gotten. Let me see if anybody else has a question before I take you again. Is this the only guy asking questions? <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, so, uh, Vanessa, to uh, help you answer an obvious question, to what degree are the results of these surveys that they occurred at the exact position that E8 in the United States? And when can we expect those that solidify the set of descriptions that we have? This is definitely what we're doing. We're done surveying. This is a, this is well, a we have a go number. Okay, so. I think our EE8 plan is a fairly modest plan, um, which, you know, given the goal, seems pretty straightforward. And the new JSR is config we've been trying to draw in for some time. The health check JSR is a pretty constrained JSR. And then some of the emphasis has shifted, like for what we want to do with security and a little bit of what we want to do for JAXRS. Um, I realize that a few of the things that I've said or that we're proposing might be a little controversial. For example, I heard that there was some controversy around um, our proposal not to continue MVC. So I, we're, we want to hear from the community. We want to hear about what we've proposed, which will influence the outcome. But um, I think for Java E8, you know, this is pretty much the direction we want to take. For Java EE9, um, that's longer term, and there's still, you know, there's still a lot of investigation that needs to be done before we file the JSRs. We need to actually address what's going to be covered in what JSR, what those JSRs are. So there's a window where that still needs to be nailed down. Um, come to the talk that's being given in the next hour so that you get a feel for what's being proposed and you can channel your feedback. 
Um, I think that question is better, um, better asked to that spec lead. Yeah, it is very ambitious. Um, well, I can't really comment on the resourcing at this point. We're still kind of working out who would be spec lead for what JSR and how the emphasis is going to go. So it's it's a little early to do that. Um, I think the EE8 is much more predictable. We have a fairly high degree of confidence that we can do Java EE8 in, in a year. Yeah, Werner. In the microprofile sense, is for EE8 also a profile ambition that could be a little smaller? Regardless of what exact JSR would be in there, but some, something below the web profile that already exists. Uh, or is that something that you only plan for EE9 where you can more or less mix and match well, okay, so Werner raises the issue of profiles over what we're proposing basically for EE8 and EE9. So of course we already have the web profile, so could we, so how are we gonna address the potential issue of subsetting, I assume, or it could be subsetting plus supersetting, um, for EE8 and EE9. Um, this is something we've been discussing Internally, I think it's fairly safe to say as to whether um, whether or not we should think in terms of a profile, um, but I think it's really premature to to get into that at this point until we get further along, and then obviously these decisions get influenced by our expert group. So for EE9, we have the whole issue of you know EE8 is building upon um, SE8, EE9 builds upon SE9, this should be no surprise at this point, SE9 is adding modularity. How do we leverage that? Um, these are still longer term open issues. Back row in the blue. I'm sorry, but you're so far back, I really couldn't understand your question. Oh, Jcash. Um, yeah. So we would love to see Jcash make progress. Um, we had hoped to bring in Jcash in EE7. There are some integration pieces that needed to be addressed for it to be part of the platform. Um, if that expert group can get reinvigorated and do that, then I think that would be a good addition. And I think our expert group, our platform expert group, would certainly welcome that. Yeah, way back. Sorry, the guy way back last row. Oh. Sorry. Um, well, it depends on when they actually get the work done. <laughs> Um, insofar as we were thinking, you know, JAX RS, that's um, near term, but we'd really like to have some kind of more generalized circuit breaker that could be leveraged elsewhere as well. So your answer, short term versus longer term, I think it's kind of both. Um, it could. I think once we get into the work within JAX-RS, then we'll know better. And a follow-up question to what you just said. So I'm personally also in the JAX-RS expert group. So when can we expect the JAX-RS um, spec leads to continue the work, I guess? 
<laughs> Sorry for that direct question, but um, I think that's a quest good question for him. <laughs> Actually, there are two of I them. Tried several times. Oh, recently? A lot of times. Recently? In the last half a year. Uh, I would try next week. <laughs> 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 Reza. So if you go along with the aggressive schedule of E8 and E9, can we also expect an aggressive schedule for web logic and the commercialization of new vehicles for uh, E8 and E9? And how do we find out if that's the case? Um, hmm. Who's the... I think you should talk to Anil. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I should have left those logos on when I, when I took those slides. I know Anil had the logos. Yes, we expect Glassfish to be the reference implementation. Those are goals. <laughs> those are targets. Yeah. Well, you have to you have to put stakes in the ground because otherwise people don't don't see the urgency. Uh, but we think there is some urgency here. Certainly for EE8, we want to be aggressive with EE8. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think that's where the Java.net question. Some of our um, some of our expert groups are already using GitHub for mirrors of their projects. So I think you know that that can be on the table. Um, I think it's too early to predict that we would do that, but I think that's certainly a, a viable option to consider. Yeah. Well, some of these, at least for EE8, these are already existing JSR with existing JSR agendas. Um, in terms of the ones that we, and in fact, except for some additions like to security, where we do expect the expert group to have considerable input there, that's quite an, an active expert group, even though they haven't released a draft yet, but there's a, a lot going on in that expert group. Um, so, the expert groups definitely address um, the JSR agendas. Now, for the ones that we're proposing to stop work on, I think um, under the JCP rules, we could just simply do that. And I'm looking here at Patrick. Um, we could just simply do that. Um, but before going there, we, we want feedback from the community. Do you, do you folks agree? Is, you know, give us your feedback. Yeah. So third question, so why is the application is running in the front end, so like the last page of the project or like the wider GitHub or Python, so in order to access the Microsoft script, right, so, so do you have a plan to have the uh, Java application running on the without the front end, like a fast job? Um, I think your questions will be answered in about an hour if you stay in this room. <laughs> okay, I got two more minutes. Yeah. So for your JSR for RESTful support, um, is there a way of doing the application using anything on Java.net or is it going to be having to use the support that it has in the Um. Until we have another solution, I would expect them to get started on Java.net. So there is no but that's just me. I don't make that decision. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, well, there are a lot of contributors to microprofile.io who are historically also contributors to our expert groups. Some of them are former colleagues who are here in the audience. And yeah, we, you know, we certainly expect that collaboration to continue, that they will continue to provide input to our expert groups. Um, you know, some of the, the member companies are leading JSRs that are important JSRs for the platform, and those JSRs are continuing, and we're folding them into the platform. So I think, uh, you know, obviously there's a little bit of disagreement between the, 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 the um, some of the approaches here, but I think the end goals of you know having a platform that's viable for microservices and well targeted for microservices is the same. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Yeah, good discussion and channel your discussion, please.
Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Rajiv. I'm from Oracle, and with me I have Dheeraj and Josh. And we are going to be here presenting on Enterprise Java for Cloud, or uh, what's going to be effectively a proposal for some of the things that we want to do in Java EE 9 going forward. So um, there's this safe harbor statement, which is the standard Oracle safe harbor statement. But along with that, I want to say that you know, right now what we are talking about here are very initial thoughts and proposals that we think we want to take forward as part of Java EE 9. It'll go through the regular community process, the Java, through the Java JCP, where you know it'll be vetted through the expert groups and uh, be made. And only when you have consensus in the expert group, it'll be really the direction that we want to take. So these are pre preliminary proposals based on feedback that we've received, talking to uh, partners and customers, and uh, also to, uh, to to community members. So I just wanted to just put that out there um, uh, before we get started, so that uh, you know we get the right set of the, uh, feedback as you go through the whole process of, of uh, taking these proposals forward. So here's a quick rundown of the agenda. So we, we have a lot to cover today, as you can see. Um, we're going to start off with uh, the proposed changes that we want to make in the programming model. And uh, we'll cover some of the other services as, or areas that go along with it for uh, using in the cloud, such as uh, state management, configuration, or externalizing of configuration. Um, we'll touch upon multi-tenancy and then the security needs. And uh, we'll touch a little bit about packaging and orchestration as well, of how you, once you've developed your application, how you actually go about running the application, um, packaging and, you know, de and deploying and running in the application in the, in the cloud. But there's actually a full talk on that that we have tomorrow. Josh and I are, and Joe are, are going to be presenting on that uh, tomorrow afternoon. So for those who are interested in that, um, there's a talk there. I have, the, I have that at the end of the, of the slide deck to show all the relevant talks. <coughs> so uh, we wanted to start out by acknowledging that you, you know, we know that the programming model for how application is, applications are developed is changing in, in it currently. And these changes are driven by a lot of the business needs that you have today for pack, how, you, how you package, how you deploy the applications, and use them in the cloud. What used to be a typical standard Java EE application package as years and wars had all the EJBs and the servlets and other, other jars in it, um, you know, packaged uh, with tight dependencies and configuration all bundled up in the years and wars <coughs> is, so, is starting to change. And the reason for some of the changes are basically, you know, driven by the new style of programming. So you have the microservices way of doing programming that you have these days. where the apps are essentially divided into many, many small services as opposed to being packaged up all in one war file or one year file or multiple wars and years. And uh, the reason why that's becoming popular is really because um, you want to be able to evolve these applications independently and quickly and have them delivered uh, in independent of, the, of each other. You also, uh, we're also utilizing a lot of the distributed computing capabilities of cloud today. So you don't, you don't have multiple data centers that span different regions and zones. So um, people want to utilize that as well. And of course, there are many new technologies that are becoming more and more relevant in this space, whether it's how you package it in a container, um, the DevOps of you know, not only developing the application, but also op how the operations go on, and all such uh, requirements of, of basically the uh, application development cycle. Um, this also has introduced uh, what is commonly referred to as the 12 factors. Um, I'm not going to go into details of each of the 12 factors. You can find this online. But how you actually develop and, uh, de and make these services available and run on, in the cloud is uh, basically changing how you do all your development as well. So um, in short, basically, the cloud is becoming the platform here for, for development. Right? You write your application. Um, basically, and the application, the way you write it today is that it consumes services that are part of the cloud infrastructure. The, <clears throat> the services could be standard services or the services that the cloud provider provides for people to use. You may have things like caching, messaging, log, uh, logging, how the analysis of the log files are done. All of those are externalized services, and application development can essentially use all these services. And application developers can use these services as part of their application. 
This also poses another problem, though, um, or at least creates some amount of confusion. Um, there are way too many choices for all the frameworks and other things that you want to use to do your application development. So there's no real standard. While there are a lot of frameworks that exist that are very good for people to use, but there is really no standard. They have too many choices, and sometimes that can be that can lead to a lot of confusion in how you what's the best practice for doing your application development. So that's where Java EE provides some value. So you know Java EE has been the uh, been the backbone of how some of the enterprise development is done, where you write to some of the standard APIs and then you choose an, an app server of a particular vendor um, to run and deploy against. But it gives you a certain amount of, of, uh, of guarantee of what your application can have and run in almost all environments. Of course, if you utilize um, the uh, APIs from the uh, particular app server, then you have to make sure that those are isolated in a way where you can package it separately. So with the shift to cloud, basically, the type of applications and requirements for the applications are essentially changing. And uh, we want to make, sure, so make the uh, uh, microservices and cloud style of application development be more relevant in, in Java, using, when you're using Java EE. And that's where Java EE 9 has an opportunity to create a, a standard platform for building applications using the microservices style of uh, development. So the same application which we saw earlier, uh, where we had the apps just deployed as, as war and ear files, if you took that and broke it down into many, many uh, my small microservices, it could potentially look like something like this, roughly, right? Where you have multiple services that are written, uh, written separately, and they all communicate to use, uh, to, uh, with each other using HTTP2 and uh, JSON, and uh, they're all written in such a way that it's all asynchronous. So you're not blocking on any of the any of the calls that the applications are making, essentially. And all of these could then consume the services. So all of these services are exposed as REST endpoints, and they can be consumed by the other services and consume services from the cloud providers. <clears throat> so. Basically, what this is showing is the where we think that the proposed platform architecture should be going towards. So you see that uh, you, ha the, you have the typical OS or hypervisor. On top of that, you have some form of container like Docker, for example. And then on top of that, you have the Java EE runtime. And along with that, then you have other services that you can use that span across all of these, all, all of your platform, all of your run, uh, all of your runtime essentially. Like you have uh, security, logging, orchestration. And then um, the front end, end of, the of the platform itself, some things like the API gateway and uh, the load balancer, and et cetera, et cetera. On the right hand side, what you see is uh, over here is the, basically the services that you could consume from, uh, from a cloud provider. For example, a database, whether it's a RDBMS or a NoSQL database, and uh, whether you know, the other services that you may want to use there. Um, probably people have seen what the technical focus areas are going to be um, in, in uh, multiple talks. So we want to focus on programming model, um, the packaging, and uh, also look at the other areas as well for things like configuration, resiliency, um, security. So we'll try to cover some of these in, the, in this talk as well as in the talk that I mentioned we have tomorrow. <clears throat> so let's start off with the programming model changes that we're thinking of. So uh, like I said, in this new model of, of development, you're going to have uh, basically a lot of REST services that are talking to each other. So we need to be able to have uh, applications that are, dis that are distributed and communicate with each other using REST and uh, JSON, basically. However, when you do that, you end up having a lot of remote calls that you're making as part of, your, as part of the services as well that talk to each other. So there's a, there's a, lot, of, uh, a, a lot of places where things could fail because not because the application was misbehaving, but more because of the infrastructure that you're running in because of network latencies or network outages. So you need to be able to handle things like outages, um, et cetera, in, your, in the application itself. <coughs> We've also seen that you know, people are moving away more and more from the typical asset transactions-based approach to more of an eventual consistent uh, system where 
you know, even when the services are sharing some state across uh, each other, um, it's okay for them to be eventually consistent. So they're not really looking for you know, it to be an asset transaction-based uh, system where the transactions run globally across multiple services. So we want to ensure that we add support for um, the um, eventual consistency style of programming in this new environment. Um, reactive is another important aspect. So reactive programming basically where everything is processed asynchronously in a non-blocking way, along with uh, you know, everything being processed as a stream, as opposed to uh, making method, uh, synchronous method calls. So uh, with the new style of programming, we want to make sure that the platform is relevant in being able to do some of the reactive style of programming as well. And for the resiliency part, we're looking at adding uh, capabilities for things like circuit breaker uh, um, patterns, bulk head patterns, as well as doing health check um, in, in such a way that you can make sure that the applications are not cascading failures across the multiple services when you have um, uh, outages for, for whatever reason that you may have. In the security front, of course, um, you know, um, many of the, of the new uh, services that you write are more and more moving towards utilizing the more standard and uh, more protocols that we will support in terms of uh, for authentication like OAuth and OpenID Connect. So we would like to make sure that the platform supports, uh, has support uh, in the security space as well. And there's this actually a separate talk that is on security related uh, infrastructure. So for people that are interested in that, they should definitely look at attending that talk as well. So that's sort of a high level view. So we'll start moving more into uh, each of the areas as we go through the talk um, of what we think could be put in, uh, the proposals in, in, in the Java E9 platform as we are proceeding for, uh, with these GSRs. So um, HTTP2 is now a standard, so we want to make sure that as the platform evolves, we add capabilities for HTTP2. It's essentially built on the same semantics as HTTP1 um, with additional things like adding support for binary protocols, uh, multiplex communication over the same channel, so when you have the same TCP connection, you can send multiple requests uh, or, um, in parallel on the same connection as opposed to all it being fully request response where the connection is just used for that uh, particular request and response. And uh, you can compress headers, and of course you can also use uh, server push which allows you to do caching of content on the, uh, on the client side where you can send the content before the, the client actually requests it if, uh, if you want. So in, uh, in the HTTP and uh, DREST and JSON areas, so one of the, some of the proposals are basically that, you know, before, uh, in, in the web container today, with the servlet API, we already have a lot of support for asynchronous processing, uh, which was introduced in servlet 3.0, but we want to take that beyond and make sure that you can actually support HTTP 2 and make it more, uh, add support for things like non-blocking and make it so that you can also integrate with the reactive style of programming for um, the web container itself. On the REST and JSON side, we have um, JAX-RS, where um, basically JAX-RS has been part of the platform, and we're trying to evolve the uh, JAX-RS as well as part of the platform, um, where we add support for non-blocking, we uh, update it to support the, more of the security standards, and on the client side, we're looking to see how we can incorporate uh, things like circuit breakers and the reactive, side, reactive style of programming in there. In terms of the JSON support, so in the platform we have um, support for both JSON, pro uh, have, we have had support for JSON processing which is being enhanced as part of Java EE8. Uh, we're also adding uh, JSON binding as part of Java EE8. And uh, as we move forward, we'll evolve these APIs as well as part of the Java EE9 platform. <clears throat> Another area of, uh, of interest is basically um, uh, to have eventing capabilities in, in the platform. So um, what are some of the use cases for eventing? Uh, you want to be able to handle very large amount of data that you're, of messages that are being driven by things like analyzing, the, uh, the, uh, analyzing <coughs> web traffic and uh, you also for handling things like uh, gaming data that you get and in general more, you know, metric and log data aggregation systems that you want. <coughs> so, um, 
the proposal here is to come up with a new API that's to, uh, that is basically meant to be for, ha for handling of events in, in the platform in a unified way. So today we do have some support for eventing. Um, it is distributed throughout the platform in different aspects of the stack. So we want to make sure that we handle that in a unified way in, in the platform as we go forward. What we've also done along the way is uh, not only see, uh, you know, think of what the proposals are, but we're also evaluating what exists today in the community, right? So there are a lot of things that people are using. We, like I said earlier on in, in the talk, we acknowledge that there are a lot of existing frameworks that people are using, and that leads to some amount of the confusion. But we also acknowledge that there are existing systems that, uh, that people have been using. So uh, what we can see here is we're basically trying to see what are some of the, the, the well-known systems. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means. But you know things like Kafka, um, Amazon Events, and then the Azure Event Hub, and what support that they have, do they have, and see what we can leverage or, or, or bring into the platform as we, as we move forward. We also would like to encourage people from these, com these com companies and community to participate as part of these uh, specifications when they are launched so that uh, we can have the right set of people in, in driving some of these, uh, some of these things in the, in the platform. So uh, like, here, like you can see here, you know, we've tried to see what the features are for toler HA and fault tolerance, for, um, uh, uh, for scalability, and deliver what are the deliverable semantics. I'm not going to go into details for, of, all the, uh, of all, the, uh, the, all, all the frameworks that exist, um, but people can take a look at it and see you know, tip the typical um, type of things that uh, these eventing platforms today support. <coughs> We also know that there are existing um, things in the platform itself. So you have JMS today, right? Um, it is designed for enterprise messaging. Um, we also have CDI eventing support um, that is added. But that today is basically spans just the JVM. It's just within the JVM. It doesn't span across JVMs. And then we have for WebSocket uh, protocol, we have support in the platform via the Java API for WebSockets. And uh, we already talked about JAX-RS as the um, API for um, REST web services. <clears throat> so uh, here's what we, uh, we are thinking in terms of a proposal for what it might be that we want to do for Java EE9. So we want to produce a simple event API, um, which will basically provide maybe some things like you know, very high level objects for uh, producers and consumers that are injectable. And uh, then also we want to be able to do uh, declarative message listeners by using annotations in, in the API itself. And uh, let's not forget the reactive style of programming. So we want to leverage things like Java 9 Flow. Since EE9 will probably most likely be built on Java SE9, we can start thinking about features that we can even leverage from Java SE9 when they're out, like uh, uh, the Flow API. And of course, we want to make sure that you know, the various implementations are pluggable in, in the system as well. Let's move on to some of the resiliency topics that we have, uh, now that we've been talking about in terms of adding support in the platform. <clears throat> so in terms of the uh, areas of, of uh, concern in resiliency, is basically you need to make sure that you know, the, the uh, distributed services that you have are highly available, they're reliable, and uh, you, I also want to isolate all the failures so that you don't have cascading failures when you're going through the going through multiple microservices in this, in this, in this environment. We want to able, be able to do metric collection and then react to that in the system, whether it's, whether it's for isolation in terms of resource starvation or for scaling operations that you may want to do. And also integrate that with other systems, other parts of the system, which you are, could be used like load balancer for making sure you route the traffic appropriately as well. <coughs> So the proposal here is really to see how we can do things like uh, connection and response timeouts, uh, how we can handle that, um, retry for uh, the transient failure. So if you have a failure that ha happens because of network latency, how we can add capabilities for doing retries for that. Caching responses on the client that are typically done like in, in the circuit breaker pattern, for example, so that if you hit a certain number of failures, then you can ca you either use the cache response or not make further calls. And uh, overload protection, so you don't want to, to have too much of that. And then use bulk bulkhead for resource isolation in, in the system as well. 
And of course, we want to continue to have the async and non-blocking approach of uh, you know, reactive throughout the system, like we mentioned a, many, a couple of times now. So in terms of uh, some of the, uh, the popular patterns in, in this area, you have the circuit breaker pattern, which is used. It's basically a generic way of how to deal with failures um, when you're invoking re remote services, essentially. So um, you want to protect the resources and the clients from having to go through many failures. And the failures can be for a variety of reasons, whether it's a network timeout or a latency in your network or just something else that's happening. So when the client sees multiple failures um, in, in this in environment, the, what it does is basically it doesn't make any further calls and tries to either return the cache response it has or um, basically uh, return immediately so that you're not cascading failures to the client at all um, through, the, through this. Um, the, like I said, the failures could be because of either uh, network failures or it could be because of the service temporarily not being available. So you could even be getting back HTTP fail, uh, failure codes, for example, when you're talk, trying to talk, invoke another, so one service from another. Again, in this, we've done some investigation in terms of where um, the ex existing frameworks are. So in the circuit breaker uh, for the circuit breaker pattern, you have uh, the common ones are Hystrix. Uh, we've seen fail, fail safe. And we've seen the ACA circuit breaker uh, uh, support that is there. And uh, you can see that uh, they provide various levels of uh, support for async and the reactive model as well, and uh, how you actually configure some of these things while, when, you're in the, in the, when you're writing the microservices as well. <clears throat> so um, the very initial thinking are along is basically, you know, in Java E9, we want to introduce some, some things to do for how you can be more resilient in these, when you start writing more and more of these smaller services. It's basically, try, we want to provide annotations for defining resiliency po policies. So for example, you could do, uh, on the right-hand side, like you can see in some, some of the code, you could have a retry policy or what the, what the circuit breaker annotation is there. Or when you have bulkhead where you want to control the resources, you can say the, what the thread count is and what thread pools to use and things like that. Um, we want to also be able to do response caching. So along with uh, circuit breaker and the bulkhead, we want to be able to do response caching so that if you're not getting the, if you're not able to reach the service, you can at least get an, a, a cache response um, in the meantime on the client side. And you could utilize all of these resiliency properties, uh, policies that you have, even to do things like you know, a graphical dashboard and, 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 uh, so that you can show the health of the, of the various services in, in the system. So, uh, reactive programming is another area where people are starting to use more of the reactive style of programming. There is some amount of, ext uh, of uh, uh, standardization done in the space. So you have reactive streams. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we have the Java SE9 flow API as well. And then there are several other frameworks we have, uh, we've seen in the, in, the, uh, in the open source and other places, such as uh, RxJava, Akka, Reactor, and Spring Framework. Um, basically, we want to see how we can pull in the reactive style of programming into Java E9 as well. When we do all of this, of course, we want to make sure we leverage SE9 and where I think the SE9 Flow API um, already implements the reactive streams uh, uh, spec. So it's building on the existing standards. So we will be using Flow and, and the reactive streams um, in, in whatever we do for the reactive style. <clears throat> In this also, you do know that there are existing frameworks that are, that are there. So you have RxJava, uh, Reactor, Akka Stream, and the Java SE9 Flow. And like you can see, they are, most of them have a specific architecture. Most of them are actually event-driven, uh, with, the, with the exception of Akka in this case, uh, where it's an actor-based system. And uh, they have support for things like back pressure, um, you know, concurrency, as well as clustering. Um, I think Akka is the only one that supports clustering currently. And um, in the reactive model, you want it to be asynchronous and, and in parallel be able to do things um, non, in a non-blocking fashion. So most of these frameworks already support that in, in, the, in, their, in the implementations as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So here also we have, uh, the proposal is essentially to look at how we can bring in some of the standard, standard uh, enhancements for reactive in addition to what already exists for Java AE9. 
right? So we want to be able to add capabilities for doing publisher and subscriber APIs. We want to make sure that you know, we have the ability to handle back pressure in a standard way in, at a higher level in Java E9 programming model. And all of, them, all, all of this will, of course, leverage what we have in SE9 in terms of flow, uh, flow APIs and um, in, in, in the um, SE9 APIs. So I'm going to hand it over here to Dheeraj to talk a little bit about the state and how we're going to handle state management. And then we'll have Josh cover some of the other uh, configuration and multi-tenancy and security areas. Hi, hi. Uh, my name is Dheeraj, and uh, like Rajiv said, I also work in Oracle Engineering. Um, <clears throat> and let's talk about state management a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so in this section, uh, under state, we'll talk about four things. Um, first of all, we'll talk a little bit about um, um, standard uh, API for supporting NoSQL databases. I mean, currently, you know, <clears throat> For those of uh, you who are writing microservices and using NoSQL databases, which are very popular uh, for uh, you know, managing data and storing it, you have to use vendor-specific APIs for those. So we'll take a look at how we can address that, maybe come up with a standard API for that. Um, secondly, we will talk um, <clears throat> about if there is a need for even a higher abstraction than that. I mean, if there is a need for a state management API, which is not tied to so much uh, how you store state or how you access a data store, but rather you just think in terms of uh, constraints of state management generally. And so <clears throat> that's the uh, second one. And then next we'll talk about a very popular pattern which is talked about a lot when people are writing, talking about microservices, um, and that's the CQRS pattern. By show of hands, how many of you have used it, heard it, or read about it? Anybody wanna? So not that many. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> uh, one or two hands of them. So basically, a very very brief description of what CQRS pattern is, and um, <clears throat> you know, and possibly what could we do uh, with it in Java E9, or maybe not. So that's something uh, where the feedback of the community would come in. And then finally, a little bit I'll touch upon um, you know, eventual consistency. What are the techniques and the technologies that are available today to the developers? And um, the again. And the intent there is to see if there are enough commonalities between them, if there's a pattern emerging, and if, uh, and if there is such a pattern, then we could, if there is room for putting forth a standard for that. So, um, right. <clears throat> okay, so, so let's look at uh, the proposal for uh, managing the NoSQL databases. So what's the problem here, right? Um, so on the left-hand side, like you see then, uh, the existing uh, E standards that we had, they, they were all designed for um, the, RDBMSs, right? I mean, uh, the JPA was not designed with this NoSQL landscape in mind. So that was the biggest one, of course, right? Um, so there is no single API that we can use to um, <clears throat> you know, access a variety of NoSQL databases that are available out there and becoming very popular, of course. Um, <clears throat> and then if you do want to fit in those NoSQL databases, uh, you know, access to those NoSQL databases into the JPA, then the annotations and the API that, you know, it's it might feel a little unnatural, so maybe we, you know, that's something to be looked into and something that we can address. Right? Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, I mean, there have been. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay. Ah. Apologies. <laughs> and uh, like I said, there are the number of uh, diverse number of NoSQL, um, you know, providers. So how do we? come up with something, uh, a consistent API that we can use with everything, so. And the proposal going for, forward is just that, right? I mean, let's address those issues. I mean, you know, provide a consistent programming API, um, you know, common abstractions for uh, CRUD operations, um, <clears throat> for the NoSQL databases, um, and <coughs> while we are doing that, I know it's, it's we don't want to have a grand unification API because, and you know, those things are, generally tend to be leaky and you know, you don't want to hide 
or you know, go down to the lowest denominator. So we do want to allow to be able to go down to the vendor specific uh, functionalities or the drop down to vendor specific implementations if one needs to, right? Mm -hmm. And then finally, simplify the um, querying mechanism uh, when you are utilizing these databases. Mm -hmm. So here's a picture here uh, with a proposal um, that um, sums up what we're thinking about, at least the proposed thing is talking about. So at the bottom most row that you see on the right hand side is basically the different um, database uh, vendors and the specific APIs that one has to use today. Um, <coughs> And on the row above it, where it says the NoSQL category APIs. So if you see, those are the four popular categories uh, that the NoSQL databases fall into. Right? Um, the <coughs> columnar databases, the document databases, uh, the key value stores, and the graphical databases. And in, if you notice carefully, the, you know, the row below that just lines up with you know, the, the products that support those styles of uh, storage. So, so that's the next row of uh, the layering. And um, <clears throat> finally, at the top, we want to support uh, basically a core set of APIs that uh, <clears throat> are agnostic to all these uh, NoSQL vendor implementations, right? Uh, and, and those core APIs essentially are CRUD for, you know, for paging, querying, <clears throat> and, and sorting, and, and, and so on and so forth. The things like you typically do that and configuring your database thing things that you do with your databases and your data, essentially, right? So if we, it would be good to have you know, a standard API that you can utilize across uh, the breadth of uh, databases, that NoSQL databases that are out there. Just like we have that for um, the RDBMSs that are shown on the left-hand side uh, using JPA and JDBC uh, APIs. Right? And I forgot to mention, of course, that uh, REST is very important, right? So, we want to be able to query these databases using REST APIs as well. So. Okay, so let's see. Um, you know, <clears throat> what does a basic uh, NoSQL query API look like? Very minimal, right? I um, mean, that's just a. So before we move on, I, I think we've been saying this over and over again. These is, these are just proposals, these ideas, and tentative APIs that we are thinking of putting forward, and we go go through the JSRs and then you know get feedback and then finalize them. them. So don't. Uh, Consider them uh, set in uh, stone or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, a basic uh, NoSQL CRUD API just has four operations, right? I mean, uh, <coughs> that we all uh, know and love. <laughs> and here, what we see is a category-specific API that is an extension of the CRUD store. Essentially, in, in this case, a key-value store API that extends the CRUD store, and uh, <coughs> so which are um, I'm looking at this, but <laughs> trying to do. Right. So if you look at this, is so you know one of the categories like categories like we said is the key value store. Um, so you know how it could extend your basic uh, CRUD store API and uh, <coughs> could add an um, capability and you know, of key value stores typically, for example, support the expiry of data. Right. So if you and that can be extended to add that capability in there. So that's just, just one example of the expire method there and, and uh, saving the um, <coughs> key value, basically you know, adding an object into that store using the persist method. And on the right hand side that we see is essentially you know, how this could be extended further to a particular implementation. Right? That's, that's just an example of that. So if there are, you know, as you say, there are multiple implementations of uh, a key value store, I mean, they could uh, look like something what, what is shown on the right hand side here. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. Um, see how do these APIs, uh, you know, get used essentially. Um, so in this, what we have seen here on the example on the left hand side is basically a user store defined method in an application that extends the Mongo store, which is one of the uh, um, <coughs> databases that is a provider specific. Um, uh, one of the things that 
to notice here again is that the as an application user, you don't have to write any of the um, CRUD uh, operations code. To, right? You only provide the query capabilities um, that you um, on the surface in your application, and those are um, uh, you know, basically implemented, and, and you know the, the results of the query uh, are uh, <coughs> obtained from the, the underlying database. So if you look at those, there are two examples in here. Uh, one is basically a pattern based where um, <coughs> You know, user can define finder methods, and we can automatically look those up to query the underlying database. And the other alternative is the use of a query notation, uh, which could uh, be used to provide a query language, supply query language from the application that can be uh, fired onto the underlying store and, and get the results from there. So those are two proposals that uh, we could utilize. <laughs> So that's how you could an application would define an application store. And on the right-hand side, you see that how is that store uh, used. So you, know, you could have you know, that definition injected into the application uh, right there. And below that is, is how uh, you, <coughs> you could uh, call the methods that you're defined on the definition using the injected uh, instance. Right? Okay, so that was the NoSQL, uh, you know, standardization of the NoSQL API. Moving on, um, <clears throat> so like I said, uh, perhaps there is a need in the land of microservices, right? Uh, there is a need for a higher abstraction of the API. I mean, higher abstraction for managing state, right? And and so, what, what does that mean, really, right? Um, <clears throat> so, in 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 that landscape, you know, the, what we have is we have the JDBC APIs, we have the JPA APIs, but these are not always sufficient because you know, your microservices are managing and owning all of their data and you know, there are no distributed transactions, so things like this. So you want to, even though there's a lot of talk about having stateless uh, services and no state in there, but there is state that it needs to be managed and shared across and communicated across services. So that's a problem that we have, we need to somehow solve. So we need to come up with some API that lets you do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> most of the APIs that we have today are um, you know, blocking in nature, which is less than ideal for uh, microservices, I could say, because we want to be able to run uh, all these APIs asynchronously for, uh, <clears throat> to jive with the reactive programming model that we are putting forth and uh, for better scalability as <clears throat> uh, in the system as well. Right? Mm -hmm. The second, uh, or the next drawback, that is this, you know, what is cached and what is persisted. There are you know, different ways of handling those two things. So transient and persistent state is managed differently. So that sort of points to the fact that, hey, maybe we need something that does that transparently for you. So. <clears throat> okay. And so the proposal, obviously, on the counter side is just to you know, come up with an API that addresses those things. Uh, as an application or as a microservices developer, you don't have to you know, deal with those issues or go through these diverse APIs, but rather come up, you know, deal with the program to an API that lets you uh, handle all these things. And what would that kind of API look like, for example, right? I mean, so it could be based on um, some primary key-based reads and writes. I mean, and this is again, <laughs> uh, on query, and it, the API could offer you queries and aggregates for you. Yeah. It could provide you events for the data events, essentially. Um, so whenever you, an entity is added or deleted from uh, the underlying store, you, know, you could, as a user of the uh, API, you know, register for uh, interest for such events and you know, be notified. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have to provide the uh, you know, <coughs> synchronous and uh, asynchronous uh, uh, APIs for that. I mean, the, both of them, we talked about that already. Um, this API could also let you actually allow different kind of stores underneath it, the in-memory in grids or the RDBMS or even the NoSQL API. So this is sort of a little alternate to the previous one that we talked about, but then again, uh, like I said, I think these are a couple of proposals we have on the table, so and then we could you know, go through the community and see what, what makes most sense. Right? <laughs> All right, jo uh, Rajiv is telling me we're running out of time, so I'm going to try and speed this up a little bit. <laughs> okay. So um, let's see. Quickly, CQRS, what is it? What does it stand for? Command Query Responsibility Segregation. So this is a very popular pattern, and um, 
That's what it is. So in its most simple form, CQRS is nothing but saying that, hey, um, I want to run my uh, read and write capabilities on different interfaces. That's all. On the left-hand side, you see an interface, which is a very typ typical interface that is used with CRUD operations that we all have utilized at some point in time. Right? Um, you have the query methods, and then you have the update methods. If you split it up into two interfaces, so uh, example service here is user service. If you split it into the use the read user service and the uh, or the user read service, user write service. You know, on one side you only have the um, read capabilities. On the other side you have the write capabilities. That's all the CQRS pattern is all about, essentially, and in its simplest form. Right? So you just split the two. And why would you want to do that? Because uh, the read and the write capability, uh, the demands on the read and the write side of the uh, application may be quite different. And now this is not the only way to split those things, but this is one of the ways which is talked about quite a lot. Right. So, Okay, um, same thing in pictures, essentially. On the left picture, you see a CRUD uh, model, um, <coughs> interface. Um, you know, there is an interaction from the UI presentation layer that's going through the uh, CRUD service, and underneath there is a data model, uh, and the, both the read and the write operations are, are being performed on the same data model. On the right side, you see a picture that is, you have, you know, you have two services, you have the read service, um, which is operating on the read model, and the write service, which is operating on the write model. Since you have two services, then the model can be different underneath it. Not necessarily, but they could be, right? So this is where the interesting stuff could happen. Um, um, so, but, and like I said, we, you know, we don't have much time to talk about the whole thing, but uh, in very simple words, uh, you know, sim CQRS is nothing but essentially a pattern where you can separate read and write. And, it is very commonly talked about with uh, talk, you know, with the event sourcing and and uh, what is and <clears throat> what is an event sourcing? You know, basically, event sourcing is a way of maintaining um, all your state in a system as a sequence of updates, essentially, right? And so, and it <clears throat> and that is typically used with commands, domain events, and an event store. Right? So that that's all there is. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I know I'm kind of going fast here and, and you know, introducing new concepts, so apologize if it's a little confusing, but uh, we can ask, if you have time, maybe you can you know, ask questions and explain these things further. <laughs> uh, so quickly, uh, so what are commands, domain events? So in the CQRS model, the writes essentially are nothing but commands. So instead of uh, calling an API, uh, you, know, you send commands to the right side, which uh, say, hey, an update needs to be done onto the right model, and those commands then get converted into an event, and those events are uh, <clears throat> stored in an order fashion in what is considered is to be an event store. And every time, any time that you want to build a state of the system, you one can go through the event and, and build it from the uh, recorded events that you had in the past. Right? Uh, one word of caution, CQRS is not for everybody. <laughs> So I don't think uh, you know we can just blindly apply to any system. So it, it uh, because the write and read side are, are split, uh, you know, lots of uh, consistency issues can arise and, and and so on and so forth. So it's not applicable for every application, but it could be useful for some parts of the application and and which work, uh, which have a very consistent model under, uh, internally and and uh, something which is uh, you know, talked about quite a lot in the domain driven design, which is called a bounded context. So it. It could be useful in those. Uh, and okay, so what can we do in Java E9? Maybe you know natively support it, uh, help uh, come up with APIs that could uh, um, you know help uh, users develop a CQRS pattern. Things that can be done on the application side, and things that could be done on the um, runtime services that uh, <coughs> the environment could provide. <laughs> okay, so running out of time here. So let's see. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, let's talk about eventual consistency. Uh, why is it important? Uh, anytime you know there are microservices, uh, an application com is com comprises of many many microservices. There is state uh, that is needs to be handled. You know there are state communication happening uh, with the objects, and uh, <coughs> so. <coughs> Basically, and, and there are updates that need to be you know, uh, tracked, and, and, and 
and propagate it to other microservices, and then they do the latency, right? Um, these changes may not make it to the other end at all times. So it's not um, guaranteed, because it's not an asset transaction. It's a weaker model. It's not guaranteed that any changes that you make are, are visible to you right there and then. Um, so what are the techniques um, today um, the services are using to you know, handle uh, the cases of the, um, you know, the eventual consistency? I mean, basically, they've embraced eventual consistency, yes, that we need a better scaling, and, and you know, <clears throat> so, but how, how do I deal with the problem, essentially? So on this uh, slide, it's a pretty busy slide here. Um, <laughs> on the left, what are the issues that we have and where the data is stored, and you know, what happens when you add an object to the store, and, and how do you update it? And how do you propagate the changes to an object? And, and so these are the, if you think about it, those are the basic uh, functionalities that you need, right, um, when you're talking about state. And the three columns that we say, there's a three technologies, or three ways one could, uh, um, you know, communicate these object changes between microservices, right? So caching is one, which is the in-memory in grid. Uh, messaging pattern is another one. And finally, you know, you could all share all the state through a database, right? I mean, even though it's not the prescribed uh, um, pattern uh, by the microservice purist, uh, because every service should own all of its data, but it's possible to do it, right? I mean, there, there could be use cases where they could just simply share all the state through a database. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what could we do? I mean, so like I said, I mean, you know, one could uh, the use case there is that you know. One could think of a common API which basically abstracts these things away from uh, from the application. So a simple way of uh, you know adding objects uh, into the store, listening for those changes, and getting notified uh, right, between microservices. That's something we could do. Um, so once you are doing this, and there could be multiple changes going to objects uh, which are identified uh, you know, uniquely across the system from different services. So obviously. Uh, and they are arriving, those changes are arriving on services at different uh, times, thus leading to conflict. So maybe we could uh, come up with an API that will help uh, the application to provide the implementation for how those re uh, conflicts are resolved. So that's something we could uh, do in the standard. Mm -hmm. I know I jumped through very quickly <laughs> for the last few slides. <laughs> but, uh, so this is uh, something what we could, uh, I think I'm just going to. Finish there. So just to summarize, in terms of state, four things, right? We talked about uh, we could have a standard uh, NoSQL uh, uh, API. Um, <clears throat> we could look at a higher abstraction API for state management itself. And the third thing we talked about, we could uh, have a <clears throat> API to help implement CQRS patterns in your services. And lastly, uh, how do we handle uh, eventual consistency uh, in a fashion that is not uh, dependent on a particular style of technology? All right, so I'm going to hand over to Josh real quick. <laughs> and he's going to talk about the sections. All right, so thankfully, uh, the areas that I'm going to cover are going to go into more detail in talks uh, throughout the conference. So uh, my name is Josh, and I'm going to cover some of the areas that are outside of the programming model but are nonetheless important to applications to support uh, standards for today's applications. The first area is configuration. And in the cloud, we primarily want to abstract the uh, configuration out from the application. So we want to introduce a new JSR. I believe this is going to be the EE8 timeframe. Um, this is inspired by some of the popular frameworks today, Apache Tamaya, um, uh, Delta Spike, Netflix Ar Archaeus, Archaeus, excuse me, uh, Spring Config. Um, let's see. Like I said, primarily we want to take the configuration outside of the application. We want to provide a unified API for access to the application. The, we want to support multiple mm -hmm. formats out of the box, including uh, XML, JSON, properties. And we also want to, um, as I mentioned, externalize that so it uh, can reside in outside sources. And we also want to support multiple locations for the configuration. So uh, when you have multiple locations, then you need some kind of uh, ordering. And this introduces the layering and ordering concept where higher order, higher order layers will override uh, lower order layers. Uh, there's also a, a schema configuration that specifies what can be configured in the application, uh, as well as uh, some of the properties <coughs> metadata. The polling and dynamic properties, this is from the Netflix Archaeus uh, 
model is the ability for the application to react to uh, dynamic configuration changes. Here's a, a quick uh, example API. You can see on the right hand side, there's a, a simple properties file with foo equals Java 1, uh, foo.bar equals 9, foo.bar.baz equals uh, 2016. And the API on the left, you can see it's primarily string based, but uh, it also allows you to um, get type specific information. And the, the proposal is that there will be, the framework will have some default types uh, with the ability to um, specify custom types. Will this be somewhere along the lines of what JCP is proposing for some of the default types and other tool sets? Um, yeah, so the question was uh, if that's along the lines of uh, JSONB and some of the types. And I'm, I'm not sure of the specifics with regard to that. But um, the, this talk, there's, there's another talk that goes into more detail with this on Wednesday. So uh, I hope that he could have, have the answers for you. Um, there's another, the other area is uh, multi-tenancy, and this is uh, something we've seen with regard to the efficient um, writing of uh, software as a service applications. And in that case, we, we primarily want to be able to uh, support applications, um, the, the efficient deployment of software as a service applications, so you do not have to duplicate your entire application for different tenants. And this, uh, some of the use cases include um, custom UIs, uh, tenant-specific data, databases and data sources, as well as tenant-specific security. So in this example, uh, a tenant context would be key to this. You can see on the right there's an interface with a tenant context. This would give the application the ability to access the tenant-specific information. Uh, this would be provided uh, associated with the inbound request and made available to the application through the container. The tenant context would hold the identity to the, to the tenant, so it can be accessed and then the, uh, the application can use that for, for different uh, processing. In this example, we show how the, uh, the application could, could use uh, multiple data sources through uh, annotations that would declare it to be multi-tenant, uh, and then they, that specific information could be used either through the application itself or through vendor-supplied uh, data sources that support multi-tenancy. In security, uh, we want to enhance the existing JSRs. So uh, the, the proposal is a standard uh, API for the identi identity store abstraction, um, standard API for authentication mechanisms, as well as um, the security context for the application to uh, uh, access the identity. And this would also be uh, for OF client registration, um, would make easier use of OpenID Connect, and also an API for uh, the token representations for accessing the tokens. Sorry if I'm going over this a little bit quickly. <laughs> EE9, is this part of it also supposed to be for EE8? Or? Yes, we, yes, there's an existing JSR for EE8, and we do want to enhance it. The exact specifics of what falls into EE8 and what falls into EE9 will be decided. Uh, another large area, and I'll be going over this area in more detail, is the packaging and orchestration uh, of the application in a cloud environment. So uh, even once you write uh, all of your business logic with the, with the uh, programming model standards that uh, Rajiv and Diraj went over, there's still other uh, uh, concerns that you have when you're, when you're deploying an application, you want it to be portable. One is to define the provisioning details. How does the application define the resources that it requires in a, in a cloud environment? How do you influence service placement in case you need to uh, require low latency between multiple services? And how do you uh, effectively utilize the service registry through service discovery in a way that makes your application portable so you don't have to rewrite your client calls? Also, you want to ensure high availability through uh, metrics collections, health checks. Uh, so those, those concerns still represent an area where we can provo provide some kind of standardization so that the application can move from environment to environment. Here's a, a good example a high level architecture where your service would be placed within a cloud environment. So you can see that uh, multiple applications can come in through a single entry point through an API gateway. And that can uh, leverage vendor cloud services such as logging and security. It can aggregate calls, uh, but you notice that it utilizes some kind of a, a load balancing or a router that uh, can speak with the service registry. Uh, 
and your services are, are kind of ephemeral and in, in, in the back end, and they, they need to be uh, provisioned appropriately and be able to access each other. So the, the simplified <laughs> the summary of what we propose for uh, standards in this area is to have some kind of service metadata that would allow your application to specify the uh, requirements that it needs, the resources, how it's going to get provisioned in the cloud environment, um, maybe if it needs to be grouped with another service. We also need some kind of standard way of uh, interacting with the service registry, some kind of standard way of, of making your client calls so that you can uh, safely move from environment to environment without having to rewrite those client calls. And also uh, some health checks and performance uh, checks. Uh, those would be um, separate standards, but uh, they would also help the, the cloud environment interact with the application and make sure that the application stays uh, highly available in that environment. So I'll hand it over to Rajiv to wrap things up. Thank you, Dheeraj, for uh, helping me with this presentation. So to summarize basically what we want to do, right? we want to enhance Java E9, uh, Java E in, in the, as a platform for developers to be able to utilize all the new ways of uh, application development. We want to bring the standards around microservices and how you build these applications and, and guarantee some amount of portability. Uh, like we said, we acknowledge existing solutions. We've seen, we've done some comparisons. We would like to see what we can bring from that into standards. We would like to encourage people from these communities to participate in the process and help us drive the standard. And uh, to basically try to solve the, st the f commonly faced problems that developers are having in this space you know, of doing microservices style of development. So that's basically um, the summary. So we do have a survey where we are trying to gather more community input. I would highly encourage all of you all to take the survey. And then there are other ways you can get involved as well. That We have the spec leads mailing list, which is pretty much open to uh, people. You can join JCP if you want to participate. Um, and, or you can just pro pro track the progress and provide input as the, as the milestones become available. There are a lot of talks um, around Java, both Java E8 and Java E9 um, in this conference. Um, I just wanted to encourage, basically put up a list here, encourage people to uh, go view these uh, talks and listen to them. And that basically wraps up our presentation. So we have a few minutes, I think, of, for, uh, for, the, uh, for questions. Um, I'd be happy to take some here, and, and then I'll be available even after the talk uh, for questions. We'd be happy to take. Yes, Reza. So, uh, yes, so th that's, that's where the talk tomorrow comes into picture, with, where we talk more about p packaging and orchestration. Yes, we want to leverage modularity from Java SC9 and you know, use the J-Link to package just enough runtime. For more details on that, please, I would highly encourage people to come to the talk tomorrow um, that we have. They will be available. I don't know the time, fr time frame when they get posted, but they will be available online. Sorry, the question was, are the slides available online for people? who are listening live and being, it's being recorded, so. Yes. So the question was, uh, are the state management and CQRS, are we doing it only for NoSQL or for, or for RDBMS as well? I think it's, Viraj, if you want to comment, yeah. uh, it's yeah. it's to be determined. So early days, we don't know yet. Uh, we just we we not been sure if we want to make it uh, you know mandatory or not. If if it will be, it'll be something optional. And what the underlying store will be and how the store could be implemented, uh, we haven't even thought about that yet. Yes. Uh, from state management, uh, you may probably know there was a state management GSR left by Oracle. Yes. It was withdrawn. Yes. Yes, we are. So, so the uh, question was, uh, I'll just repeat the question for people who are listening live, sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. So the question was, uh, there was a state management JSR. Is there anything we are trying to leverage from that? Um, Dheeraj, you wanted to comment? Maybe you can um, comment? Sure, yeah. Um, short answer is no. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> No, I mean that that uh, JSR was. Uh, you know, we looked at it, and and uh, I think one of the things that we realized is uh, it was geared a lot towards session management, and you know, uh, <clears throat> extending the app server for managing state for applications and the like. 
I think the goal uh, for this uh, part of the state man was the you know API management API we're looking at is you know slightly at a higher level I think so it's it's a it's it's, it's a different beast in a way. So. Reza, hold on. There's one more question in the back, and then I'll yes. Right. So that's why I think the state management uh, API comes into picture. Um, the, the idea there is to externalize state from the runtime as much as possible so that the servers, uh, the runtimes themselves are ephemeral, um, where you have the state in a separate tier and the, uh, and the containers are running or the run, uh, have their, are pretty much immutable or uh, and ephemeral as they come and go. Reza. Right. Are you prepared to answer that question? Do you know the answers to that question? So we've talked about it a little bit. Um, there's, there are different ways we can uh, approach this problem. Um, we can work with CDI to see if CDI 2 or next does um, some enhancements where it's not, it's not just within the JVM but goes across JVMs. We, we could enhance JM, JMS APIs where it's more friendly for the cloud. Or we come up with something that's totally different like we, we showed here, a uh, very simple, simplified version of that. It's to be determined. It'll be determined sort of by the expert groups that will drive the conversations or by discussion with the, in the case of CDI, if you work with a CDI expert group, for example. It's too early to, in my opinion at least, to answer that question at this point. So what happens if two years after CDI Yes, and the, the programming model changes, yes, over, over time. And so the question is what happens if uh, microservices isn't relevant anymore? Um, hopefully it'll be more than two years before something new that changes drastically. But again, we want to basically, the, we want to be able to support the cloud environment. There's nothing that's specific here that couldn't be, you know, in terms of the proposal, be applied in general, it's not just to microservices, right? Microservices is a style of programming. The APIs that we provide could be used in many different ways. We are, we've discussed, Dira, do you want to answer? Or can I? <laughs> we've discussed that internally a little bit, whether to enhance JPA. We feel that it'll be, there'll be a lot of things that from the JPA API that don't necessarily map in the NoSQL world. So at least the initial thinking that we have is that we we'll do a separate API that's basically focused on NoSQL. But again, it's very early days. You know, these are proposals. They'll go through expert groups and discussions and Maybe if we create a separate expert group for NoSQL, I'm sure it'll go through in the platform expert group. So it's too early to say one way or another at this point, in my opinion. Okay. What about general about JPA? Will there be any updates? So JPA is already, I think there are some amount of updates that are happening. I don't know if Linda is here. Yeah. Bill is here, Linda is here. So if you all have any additional things you all want to say to that. Um, yeah, there are small updates happening at this time in, in JPA. I'll take one last question if there is any. Uh, we are over time, so if not, um, I'd like to thank you. I'd highly encourage you to attend sessions and also to take the survey. We really need your help to know that we are heading in the right direction with the survey. So.
Hello? Hello? Hello, sound, check. Great. Huh? Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all here to talk with, uh, to our session, which is Go Reactive with Vertex in our application container cloud. So uh, it's just one of the possibilities. We're going to talk mainly about Vertex. And Vertex is a so flexible in, uh, f a framework or application or a toolkit. You can run it anywhere on premise in, in any kind of cloud, including Oracle Cloud. So I'm Ed Suyanaga. I'm a director of developer experience at Red Hat. I'm also a Java champion and a Microsoft MVP. And to present the session with me, I have here today my great friend, Brazilian too, Eder Ignatovic. And I hope I have said his name right for the first time. He's also a senior software engineer at Red Hat. He is also part of the program committee of QCOM Sao Paulo. So I hope you can deliver some great content for you today. I always like to start my talks with this uh, sentence from Forbes. Uh, now every company is a software company. I used to say that people, you don't work for an industry, you work for a software company. You don't work for a bank, you work for a software company. We live in a different world, uh, we, different, we live in a different economy. So in this digital economy that we have today, we have some different things happening. And some of the examples that we have today is that the largest car transportation company in the world owns no cars, which is Uber. The largest lodging company in the world owns no real estate, which is Airbnb. The largest online retailer in the world owns no stock, which is Alibaba. And the largest content network in the world produces no content, which is Facebook. All of these companies have something in common, is that all of these companies only exist because of software. So software changes the world. And we here, as software developers, particularly Java and most of us enterprise developers, uh, I like also like to introduce myself as a software craftsman. And the best definition that I have of, of software craftsman is that someone that cares about the, uh, his job or her job, and I care about what, they do, uh, what I do, because I know that we can change people's lives for the better with software. We can also make them miserable, but I prefer to, be, to, to have a choice. I, make, I prefer to do the right choice to make people's lives better. And we can always create better and, and craft better software. That's why we're all here today. And for that, we've been discussing a lot in the last uh, couple of years or couple of months about uh, DevOps and microservices and now reactive programming. You're also a hot topic discussing today because we're talking about distributed systems, message buses, uh, uh, scalability, portability, and everything else. But so reactive programming is something that every developer is looking for. Maybe I should start to try some reactive programming to craft better applications, to support the new kind of applications that we have to, here today. And a very interesting uh, option for uh, using reactive programming and creating reactive applications is Vertex, which is a Eclipse Foundation project. And we have a lot of Red Hat engineers working on that. Uh, Vertex have, has evolved a lot in the past few years. So uh, we uh, strongly believe that Vertex is the right platform for delivering this reactive application that we have uh, today. But we're not just going to tell you that. Uh, I hope we'll be able to convince you that because we have a very cool demo to show you. Yeah, and if you think about just one thing to learn here about Vertex is the first thing is what is Vertex? It's five important points. First, Vertex is application far platform. It's a gener in the general way, you can create your business, your web, and in a, in build your games, your mobile software, your financial systems. And in a way, there is agnostic. You see in that talk that you can write your applications in a whole lot, in a, in a lot of languages, in a lot of platforms, and take the, the advantage of each one. And also, that's why we are here, Vertex runs in JVM. So I'm a Java fan, fan and that is a real important thing to me to have uh, this kind of support that we see in that talk in Vertex. And also, Vertex is built in a synchronous API at the core. And why is the, that so important? We have to wait a few minutes, but we will show that in a demo how you can we can transform your application with uh, asynchronous APIs. And also, Vertex is polyglot. 
you can write Vertex in Java, JavaScript, Ceylon, in Python, in Ruby, in a lot of languages using the same development model. And also, for me, is the most important one, is that Vertex is really simple. It's simple, but not simplistic. In a way that can, um, we can write better software in a cleaner way, but without removing the power for the developers. I think that the first uh, opinion that people have about reactive programming, maybe this is a back-end thing because people are saying about distributed systems, but Vertex is a so flexible tool that you can use to develop your applications. You can do web applications, you can do back-end applications, you can integrate with a lot of different stuff. So you can use Vertex for almost anything that you, you, you're thinking about. And we're going to show you our demo of, 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 of some very uh, common use case that you, that you can use Vertex to solve. So don't think only about distributed applications or backend applications, because Vertex can be applied in a lot of different scenarios. And also, that you have to be clear, why the, the, is the reason to use Vertex? The first one is you can create, as I already said, your general apps and solve um, similar problems that you solve with Node.js, with Akka, and with Play, but I think it's a better way, why? Because Vertex has a great set of core APIs, like TCP, SSL, in the client and server, you show that also, HTTP, HTTPS support in web sockets, a great event bus API, fail system, file system API, and all that core APIs at 100%. All that APIs are one, sorry, all that APIs are 100% async. And so it does mean no blocking in any way. But you can also have your own APIs blocking a, with a special vertex, uh, uh, vertex file. And, but you see that. But so you're telling us that uh, even though Vertex is a reactive application uh, platform, you can also use the existing Java libraries that most of them yeah. are blocking and you can integrate and they work uh, correctly? Yeah, for sure, you see that in some minutes. But we can talk a lot about that, but as a developer, I always want to see some code. So we try and, and you have to pray with me to the demo gods because we a lot of moving parts here. So the first one, is the hello world for Vertex. What I'm trying to build here is to show how to create, sorry, thank you. Here we go. How to, how to build a simple HTTP server using Vertex. In the line 22, you can see I create and list in a port, HTTP port, then I create in 15, I take a Vertex instance. Then I create a HTTP server and I add a, a sync request handler. That's the base for the Vertex APIs. Always handlers in a sync way. Then when I receive a request, I build a response calling the hello world Vertex. So it's almost 10 lines to create a full HTTP server. I will run here. Run here. Okay, 10 lines, you could be doing that in two. Okay. Yeah, for and, sure. And different than the other, uh, Vertex can generate a fat jar for you to run your application since everybody seems to like fat jars today. But unlike other options like Drop Wizard, Spring Boot, and Wildfly Swarm, where the fat jar can be a bit fat, yeah, like consuming like hundreds of megabytes, yeah, the Vertex is a very, very, very time, yeah, uh, generates a very, very tiny, I, I don't know if we could even call that fat jar because that's a slim jar. That's a very small jar uh, for generating like a REST endpoint. So it's a full web server in just some lines of code. Let's come back to the presentation. The next why to use Vertex is, is you have to understand what is a vertical. A vertical is the executing unit of vertex. You can see how a vertical works here in a Java, but you can write your vertical in Java, JavaScript, uh, Ruby, Ruby, and usually your, applica your application will be composed with a lot of verticals. So you have a lot of small verticals, small units of code running in, in, in the vertex environment and providing is, is isolation. 
you, are, you, are, you have no uh, shared state between the verticals. That's one of the most important parts of the platform. So we have concurrency for free. And in order to, to run a vertical, my next hello world here, here you can see a vertical. To create a vertical in Java, you have to extend the abstract vector. And here, we are showing out other feature that vertex. You have the event bus, you know. That part here that I show you is just to create a, a call each second and publish in the event bus in which queue, the queue hello bus, and publish this message hello world from Java. Here, I consume the same event bus in a decluped way and do a made a system log for that event bus. Because we are creating not uh, main applications, we are creating vertex, we have to run that. With vertex, sorry. Where did it go? Wrong folder. Hmm? Wrong folder, just a second. All that codes in is on the GitHub, my GitHub account. We can check the code in just like 10 or 15 lines of code. It, that's because we're doing a lot of uh, carriage returns there. Uh, you, can, you have a distributed message bus. You're publishing to a message queue and reading for the queue in just a very small slim jar, not such anymore, a very small slim jar that you can run, or you can even run by the the command line. In order to run in command line a vertical, it, you, you do vertical run the name of your vertical. We will start to publish messages and receive messages. This ID, ID here is just to use in the next example is our handle number to show vertex in the cluster away, so it doesn't pay attention too much on that from that point. But you can see how the, the verticals works. And that's really nice because I can make small units of code in a simple way and have uh, the thread model for free. Other important thing about Vertex is that Vertex implement a threading model calling reactor pattern. For someone uh, who knows how Node.js works, Node.js implements a kind of same pattern, but you have a thread loop, a event loop inside a, a, a cord of a processor, but just one thread, and you are uh, switching the, the verticals, in, in the case of vertex, to be executed. But the issue is, uh, with Node.js, we only can use one processor at a time for, with, each, which is, uh, with each instance. But with Vertex, we implement a different uh, reactor pattern. We call it multi-reactor pattern, pattern, that when you run a Vertex, for each core of your machine, it creates an event loop. In our event loop are connected. So you can use your hardware in a better way than Node.js and make uh, applications more scalable. OK, let me try to explain you how this works using a very common API that we, we're, most of us at least, are very used to, like the servlet API. When you have a servlet, to create a servlet, we just extend ser uh, HTTP servlets. So we have this configuration, the request method, and everything else. So the traditional application model, you just instantiates a large pool of threads. Uh, it doesn't matter how many cores you have for processing, you just instantiates a large pool of threads, and you just keep recycling the request between these threads to reach your single, uh, your single servlet instance in your application server. So usually the state that you have to run your application is inside your, your stack, okay? Uh, so each one of these stacks is, is a separate thread, so you, do, you, you, don't have the, you don't have the shared state between the, each one of the requests. But since we have a lot of different threads trying to access uh, just a, a small amount of cores, of course you have context switching and everything else, Vertex uses a different approach for scalability, and that's why it scales much more and much better. So you have like you can uh, configure your, your, your running instance to have like, I want to consume four verticals, each one of them is gonna run 
in like uh, uh, four different instances running in different cores. So each one of them has its own asynchronous uh, threading model for processing the request. And that's one of the reasons why Vertex is so performatic. It's, it performs much better than a traditional thread model using in application service. And you think about how that works. We already told that everything in Vertex is asynchronous. But we are not uh, letting go all the, the synchronous library that we are having had in Java, like JDBC and other stuff, or for instance, to write a file in that kind of stuff. Vertex, you can create, you, you, you have the regular, the async, the verticals that runs in the event loop, event loop threading model. But if you want to block this, this the, the, with a blocking API, you can create a special vertical called work ver worker vertical. That work vertical, vertical uh, runs in a separate, isolated thread, so we don't have to block your, your thread model in the vertex APIs. Yeah, comparing, uh, using the examples again, is like you can you use a, a multi reactor uh, thread model using verticals in vertex, but for using this legacy APIs which are blocking, you can use a traditional thread model which you have a very, where you have a pool, and these, each of these threads are recycling and executing the blocking code. And also, we have other cool feature of Vertex, in my opinion, that's one of the best ones, is the auto-scaling. I will show you the demo, that's the best way to, to show how that works. Just find the, the right directory. Here you see the same kind of hello world that we did in Java, but write it in a vertical in pure JavaScript see the, the message handled here, and the request for the AD80 or AD80 port. So the best part for me is that you write the same code in Java in almost the same code in JavaScript because you are following the same vertical uh, programming model. So if anybody likes the pain of programming in JavaScript, he doesn't have to run to Node.js, you can, you can do that in Vertex? Yes, for sure. Okay. And especially to use the best tool for the best job you see in the demo. For that, some use case even better to use JavaScript, and you have the open the option to that. But the fun part, the, the fun part for me, or Vertex, to run, uh, if I want to run the, this, let me put in a bigger. If I want to run this JavaScript code to create a HTTP server, it will be the same as we do with, with Java. But if I want to scale that, I put instance and for that will create for instance of my vertical running in my machine. And when I open uh, my codes here, I see hello world, my same hello world, and with a random number there. But if I open a Firefox, I do the same hello world, I receive other number. You know why yet? No, oh, that's a good question, why? This happens because the uh, vertex instance make load balance HTTP for free for you. Each request is reaching one vertical and you are have auto scaling. That's really good for microservers, for instance. When you are in a high uh, traffic day, you can run more verticals and put connect everything together, auto balancing. So you have a Zlin jar that can run anywhere using the JVM. You have a distributed cluster, you have a message bus, you have an HTTP server that gets you scaling and auto balancing for free in just this line of codes. Exactly. And talking about the Distributed uh, event bus of the vertex is one of the best parts also. The event bus for me is amazing because you can have the event bus not just in your machine. You can have a, your event bus distributed as you are showing the demo here in the same machine but in different JVMs with the JVMs passing mesh in each other. And also you can have distributed in a lot of machines in the network because Vertex can connect in a clustered way all the machines and pass events and machines. I will show that how to do that. Just have to find the right director again. If you remember, that is our last code for the, um, the vertical. I run the same code in a clustered way. How I do that? vertex run hello world vertical.java minus minus cluster. That will start a cluster of vertex. I will copy the code here. 
See, it's passing message with the same ID, not the ID, a handle ID, not a real ID, just for the demo. And it's the same because it's just one machine. When I create, I'm in the red directory, other machine, other JV, not, it's the same, I'm in the same machine, but in the different JVM, I will start to run the code, connecting the, the cluster. And then this machine is the 15. They will start to ch exchange message and pass the message through the JVM. That's really cool for me. You can create clusters even in different machines and have your distributed event bus. Yeah, wait, you have two different processes, two different JVMs, they're exchanging message for message bus, but you didn't configure anything. How did they find each I, other? I have to do minus me, uh, dash dash cluster. That's everything. Okay. For sure you can expand that configuration because by default you use Hazelcast, but you can use other cluster provider, like uh, Zookeeper and other kind of stuff. There's a lot of implementation you can choose, but, but, but by default we are using here the, um, the Hazelcast. But the cluster goes beyond of what you show here because I can extend the cluster to my browser. How can I do that? I can create a, 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 vertex, a vertical that can run a bridge from my vertical to a JavaScript browser. And that's really cool to make real app, real um, world, uh, real time applications, for instance, for a game or for a financial to see stocks. Because an event passing in a cluster through the JVMs can be transported from a browser and I can see that in a real time. You have to wait to see that happen. We'll do that in a demo because if you stop here, we don't have enough time to show everything. Let's go to the demo. Yes, please. Get the water. That's the base architecture for our demo. It's a little big and Edson told me to put the, that, that picture in, at first. At the right, is right, you can see a lot of legacy systems that you want to integrate, for instance, in a scenario of a migration of data. And that, that legacy system will be consumed and, be in, and we will use Vertex to create a REST API in Oracle Cloud, okay? Then that you create, you use Vertex to create a REST client to communicate to that systems and then distribute that message in, inside our cluster. Everything in the left, in the left side, it will be a one big cluster of vertex that will have some processor to do routing, some auditing, some a bridge for JS, and a bridge for a log. Okay, let's build that. Yeah. So first part, I'm, we're gonna I'm gonna check my code here. The, okay. We just created a REST endpoint using Vertex. So uh, for the sake of this demo, it's not connecting to any legacy systems, but just to show that you, can, you could use your connectors here to connect to a legacy application and create and, pu and publish your own uh, uh, REST with JSON endpoints. Here we are just creating some random data. We are, this is just a, a bunch of numbers and strings in a file so that we can publish anything and deploy somewhere maybe in the Oracle Cloud. So uh, we have this application, I'm gonna get here. Java one, REST API. If you get to see the pwn.xml, uh, it's out, uh, we just configured that to generate a fat jar. We ju just used some tweaking in the Maven pwn.xml to create a main class. If we package that, Can get the dependencies if I get to see my jar. You get to see the, you, you have now two jars, the, the traditional jar and the fat jar that we created here, just to, ch for ch to check the size. You're gonna have, I have a fat jar with only 14 megabytes to deploy everything that we, we were providing. And for the deployment part, uh, I, I got to, show you the Oracle application container clouds. Particularly we want to deploy everything these days in containers, so I want to show you the Oracle approach for deploying applications in their cloud. Basically we have a lot of different services. This is the main pane of the Oracle application container cloud. You have a, a different set of data centers that you chose, have chosen one previously. I also have deployed some 
applications here that we're going to uh, use later. In fact, I would like to thank Oracle Engineer for helping me to set up the, this environment. We had some issues, but uh, they're evolving fast because it's getting cor uh, corrected fast too. But for the, for the deployment model, we're talking about applica Oracle Application Container Clouds, but we're not building containers the traditional way that we think because everybody's talking about Docker and everything else. Mostly likely Oracle is using Docker inside the container clouds. But for us, for the developer experience for creating a container, uh, it's much uh, different from what we used to because the packaging and the base images, they're provided already by Oracle. So we don't have to create our base image, which is a good and also a bad thing because we lose the flexibility. We can only use the provided images, which in the case of Java, we have Java 7 and Java 8 as the default environment for, cho for choice. And how do we choose our base image uh, as, uh, as we would in a Docker image? We have just a JSON file with the manifest.json. As JSON, I can only choose the major version that I want to use, seven or eight. We're choosing Java 8 to run that. And the only thing that I can configure to is the command that I want to run, to run my, my image. So we have to java-jar, my fat jar, and some properties that I'm gonna use in our REST endpoints. So that's the only configuration available because all of the other uh, properties are just like notes, release version, everything else. But for the, for the concept of creating a, a, an image of a container to be run on the cloud, that's all of the, the, the parameters that we need to configure. So having all that, we don't have a tool to build that. So the standard packaging format, it's a zip file or a tar file. Uh, so we have to just uh, create a, a zip file which contains the manifest.json in the root and everything else we have to package inside the zip file. In our case, we're using a fat jar. So we're gonna just put the fat jar, but if you, we could be using like a, an application server, but it would have to be packaged every, every time and again uh, using a, a zip container. So I'm gonna zip example.zip my manifest and my jar, fat jar one. With the zip file, also the only uh, option that I have to create application, I have to go through the interface, create application, oops, create application. No, it's okay. Uh, I choose Java, you can know Node.js and PHP, you know, bad life choices. And you just have to wait. And for my experience in testing the Oracle application container cloud, uh, performance uh, fluctuates between the days and the weeks, and I guess that uh, all of the Oracle guys at Open World must be demo, de demo, de uh, doing demos with that. That's why it's taking a lot of time. They have to sell some. And uh, you get an uh, example. Uh -huh. And you have a sample application, a default one, which is an HTTP application. You can use a storage path, which is something that I haven't tried because it's too much work. You don't have a CLI for Oracle Application Container Cloud, so I have to use curl to update a file to the Oracle storage, and then uh, it doesn't. Uh, I have to provide the path inside the Oracle storage to deploy my application. I thought it was too much work, so I just chose to upload directly here for the web interface. I choose the file, example, and create. And that's the part that usually fluctuates. It can take like 15 seconds to 30 minutes, at least today. So we're not trying to, we're not gonna wait for the deployment to, to, to run successfully. We're just gonna use the two previously deployed endpoints that I've deployed, we've deployed like half an hour ago. Let me try here. Okay, all set. Um, now you have a red builded vertex, or the, the right side, the rest at the point that integrates a lot of systems and you can imagine how much system you want and integrate in the, in, the, in the single rest ending point. Then our next task will be create a rest client that connect in that end, rest end points and then transform each uh, type of customer that we are being generated by our legacy systems to a message in our bus. The name of the message will be system.process.in. Let do, let's do that. Rest client. 
Here is what we do. We create a, a, a periodic team. A period, you use the periodic function in Vertex just to pull, uh, pull the, to make a pool in, in the REST APIs in a different time, just to show in the demo that we are connecting a lot of different systems, and then you get the data from the REST APIs. We use here the get now HTTP that receive the, the full response, but if you want to improve that, you can use observables because Vertex already supports JAX, uh, Rx Java. And then we, cr we process that data. How we process that data? That is a debug in our, in our test to deploy. And then um, for each JSON that I'm receiving here, I, I create a new message in my system.process.in. That will put uh, the vertex team, uh, the, the, the JSON that they're taking from the legacy systems inside my vertex, Let, inside my uh, distributed bus. Let's run that. The and debug, we have put that like half an hour ago because we were deploying the, in the Oracle application container, container cloud and we were testing our application. But the end, uh, uh, for each container that you deploy in the Oracle container application cloud, it exposes a port, which in this case is an HTTP port. But if you expose through HTTP, they automatically upgrade that to HTTPS connection. That's why we were only testing with HTTP, you know, the development and production things, issues. So it's, it's, that's HTTPS, it wasn't working, that's why we have to configure HTTPS in Vertex, which is very simple too, because we just had to create an object with the parameters saying that's uh, SSL enabled and it just works. And now we are consuming the, the APIs and creating the rest, uh, the, the, the message inside the distributed event bus. Uh, one important point is that I already told you is everything in the left to be in a cluster way. So when we follow, we, we, we fire an event inside the bus with a JSON from the customer in the system dot process that we queue, everything that will be uh, connected in the same cluster, we receive that message. Our first uh, task will be to rate a processor vertical, what pro that processor vertical does. Data you take for each legacy system, we will have one uh, uh, separate queue. Why? Because it's important to have these queues, uh, for, uh, you have the ability to consume for each server a different event. So we'll take a big system.process.in event and split that event in three new queues. One queue for each uh, server. Let's do that. Processor vertical. How I do that? That's the important part. I will run as a cluster vertical because I can run that in the main or you can make an abstract vector here, vertical here and run in command line. And what we do, we consume the system.process.in um, queue and then for each server, we take the system from the JSON because we put in the other parameter in the JSON for customer, the system that they are connected and we create a, a bus in a dynamic way, you see? Because wh why you do that? When you put a new system in the, in the right side, a new, a new legacy system that you're going to integrate, we will create dynamically a new bus. In that way, we can extract and can use a lot of things. Let's run that. So I, I can see in the code that basically this processor vertical, it just gets the, some messages from the input queue. It just checks the, the, the source of the, 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 of the message and distributes it to another queue. Uh, that's kind of, I don't know, maybe uh, it's the, too much for a vertical or too less. It couldn't be, that be done in the, the REST uh, uh, client vertical? Yeah, that's a, a good question, right? So, but is, that's really the reason that I love that kind of approach for programming that Vertex, and fo Vertex follows. You can write your verticals just to do one thing, you know, when you do one thing well. For instance, you have one vertical to consume the REST APIs and create the, the, the first message, and we have another vertical that takes the message and split in different queues. And why is the he reason for that? If you, in a real world with microservice, if you, are fall, you have, if you are falling in a high traffic day, for instance, you are selling a lot of stuff, you can run more uh, from your verticals to connect in that uh, in that uh, that distributed cluster, and you can, for instance, you have 
this this will become slow you can create 10 more verticals as you do in the in the process the http you can create more and scale in an isolated way and in my opinion when you can create microservice microservices really small and just doing one thing well you have the ability to scale up or scale down your microservice and that's why i put just one thing to do and one thing to, to do right in which vertical. So it seems that some concepts that we have in the software development world just gets, just keeps gets recycled. So you're basically telling me that the single responsibility principle from clean code applies also to reactive programming for and sure, verticals? And also for me to microservice in my opinion. Because in that way you have the free to do whatever you want and scale how you want your microservice. Okay, and in case any of you are aware of enterprise integration patterns, we just implemented the SQL router yeah, in this process, process of vertical. The next job that we have, we have to write an audit vertical. Because some customer comes with us and say, ah, oh, in some server, there is someone that probably hacking or stealing some stuff, we want to log that thing. That will be the, the real reason because you, you will create that halter to split. Let's create an audit vertical that lists and for some events from some verticals and you can process that data. That is really easy. Let's create and open a new one. Everything's still running. Sorry for the tabs. What? Uh, is the main purpose of our, uh, of our audit vertical. We connect in the cluster and then we receive a message from system one. You know, when we receive a message for system one, we can do some processing, for instance, put in another database or file some alarms or do a, a, a lot of kind of stuff. Let's run that. You see everything plugged in a dynamic way. I will run my auditing here and you start to listen for system one and system two events, see? And what is the best part of using that programmer model in a clustered way? If I finish my, my, my auditing process or I already have a lot of sample data and it's enough for me to process, I just come here and stop the vertical. Of, or if I want to scale up to create more verticals in order to make my, more, uh, uh, more audits, I can create more verticals and build a lot of kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the, the sorry. Okay. When the queue is the integration point between your verticals, you allow the, your architecture to be really loose, uh, loosely coupled instead of uh, so you have a high cohesion, loose, uh, loosely coupled software, and it's much easier for you to integrate new stuff or to remove the things that's just like the other side. Everything is decoupled. You can uh, plug your microservice and plug your stuff in, in a way that you want and scale everything. The best part for me I will show you right now is how I can use a JS bridge from Vertex in order to send the events to a JavaScript. We will create a new JS bridge vertical that will take our events and put in JavaScript. What I do here is, is create a HTTP server. I will go run the, the cluster vertex and come here and see Ah, I create a HTTP server and, and in, in port 9001, okay? Then I will put a new thing. I will create this halt for the assets because Vertex can also um, provide you a way to share and to have static assets inside your HTTP server. I will just serve in that file, an in index HTML file that have a, 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 a div for logs we will use that in some minutes. And one important thing, other important thing here is that I create a route for the event bus. That event bus will be the web socket that the browser will connect to my distributed uh, bus for the vertex. And other important part is here. In order to use uh, and consume the, the message in JavaScript, I have to add the outbound and the permitted queues that will be exported in that web socket. Vertex does that to make the web more secure, you know, because you are not in, a, not in the same server and you don't want to share everything that, uh, that every message that pass inside your, your cluster for the JavaScript. So in the back end where you have supposedly uh, secure environments, uh, you have everything allowed and when you go to the web using JavaScript particularly, maybe you, can, you have to allow each one of the queues to be exposed. Yes. Let's run that. 
Let me see where I am. That run dot sh is just uh, uh, I run the 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 fetch jar. And when I go to the here, let me open for you, app.js, I consume the, I connect to the event bus, okay? And then consume the queues here. In the same way that I did in Java, for each message in system.1, I add in a total and draw a chart. Let's okay, see. Okay, so the same events that we're producing in the back end using Java, you're, uh, you, you're telling me that they are being consumed and the messages are being exchanged in JavaScript? Exactly. That's weird. Let's see if that works. Did you run that? Yeah. Well, I have a runner here. Let me try. Tension moments? Yeah. Hmm. Is the port correct? Yes. Just a second. Is the presentation moved? Come to side more than something. Exit. Just you have to check. As we said, lots of moving parts. We have like four or five things running at the same time. I just check it for consumer. Oh, it's the consumer. Thank you. Let me try again. Here you go. <laughs> and now, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I was running the wrong example. Here, what has happened? I taken the message that I received in, in the um, in the distributed cluster from the vertex, porting that in the bridge for JavaScript, and and just counting and use the Google chart. I'm a developer, not a UX guy, and that graph is horrible. You see the x uh, uh, axis is incre increasing. For instance, now it's 60 and 65, but I can count. It's it auto scales, it's a yeah, feature. Yeah, it's okay. a feature, it's my, my yeah. graph, auto scale graph. Here I, is the number of the message that I'm receiving in the server one, and the number of the message that I receive in server two, and the total of the messages. So what's the great part of that demo? That part of demo. I, I take in the right a lot of legacy systems, integrate that in the decluped the clup way, I can put any time, any number of the service that I want, and then I create a REST API, and then I create a, a, with Vertex a client REST API in a cluster, and then I start to consume everything. I create a lot of messages and create a distributed bus for that. That for me is awesome because the same message that I pass through the cluster can be consumed in JavaScript. And the last one is a polyglot thing. My, 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 my boss told me that you, they want to log some vertical, you know? I already created the message, and I want to log the message in a MongoDB. The best tool, at least my opinion, to connect in MongoDB is JavaScript. So vertical, a vertex, let me stop. Why JavaScript and why MongoDB in particular use case? Because the random point is supposed in JSON, which is basically JavaScript. You're consuming and processing the messages in the back end also in JavaScript. So in particular in this case, it makes sense. So why can't we use the same data model uh, in the whole stack? So we're also storing these log messages in JavaScript using MongoDB. But the main point is, as Vertex is polyglot, I can consume in the best way that I can have, you know, the best tool for the best job and have an integrated environment. So I use the, a, a model that, uh, that is a plugin for Vertex that consumes Mongo clients, and you see running just with JavaScript is the same API of the event bus that you connect in system.process.in uh, uh, queue and then save the message in the MongoDB. 
Okay, and I'm seeing JavaScript again. I can see a pattern. Do you like JavaScript? A little, just for some. It's some my dirty secret. And let's run that. The same thing, the same way to run vertex run mongo bridge dot dot cluster it. And then. That's the Oracle Cloud, okay? See, they started to consume the same message and start to save in the MongoDB in a polyglot way. So I can have a lot of different ways to consume my message. My, my main point here with that demo and, and with Edson is to show you that with Vertex, you can plug in and plug out a lot of stuff inside of your bus. When you transform your data and your JSONs in messages, you can be creative and innovative to create, to navigate to a lot of possibilities in a lot of platforms. So uh, that's what I had to talk about Vertex. So we, we, uh, I hope we, had, we, we have given you a very introductory uh, session about Vertex, how you can deploy that easily in many different clouds, including the Oracle Application Container Cloud. I also hope we have provided some of the concepts of the deployment between the Oracle Container Application Cloud. We expect that to evolve, mainly because uh, some of the tools, they're not optimal for development uh, nor deployment. And if you, if you are interested in Vertex, uh, we recommend you to check some very good sessions they're gonna have this week at Java One. So we're very lucky to be here today at the first day because the rest of the week you'll be able to check some sessions like Reactive Microserver with Vertex with Burr at Thursday. We're gonna have also a hands-on lab and a session by Clement on Wednesday and Thursday. So we have some very good experts of Red Hat providing some great sessions about Vertex in the next week. And I hope you can all uh, join that. And also, we have to talk about the micro profile. I don't know how many of you have passed in the booth or the, in the expo today, but you might have seen some very cool t-shirts talking about micro profile. Micro profile has been launched very recently, so that's something that everybody must be talking about since we're talking about Java E. Have you seen the keynote yesterday? So uh, that's one of the videos you might really want to check the micro profile. Uh, sessions, microfile presenters, and if you get by the Red Hat booth and get a, a, a folder and you get like four stamps, you'll be able to get one of the very cool microfile goodies that are being distributed there. I got mine already, so I hurry to get yours and some nice shirts. And I also like to say that not only Vertex, but we have, we're, we at Red Hat, we are creating a story around DevOps and microservices and cloud computing and best coding practices and everything else reactive programming in the, also on one of these topics, and we're publishing a lot of uh, contents at developers.redhat.com. We also have made all our software stack available for free for development at, at the site. You only have to register there, and if you want to provide us some uh, valuable feedback, our Twitter handles are either IGN and at Yanaga, so feel free to, to come and talk to us because we would, we would love your input about about our session, about our content. And that's all that we have to show you today. And thank you very much for now. <laughs> and we might have some minutes for questions. If anybody has any questions, we're available. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just repeat the question so uh, it's being streamed live so uh, the people can hear at home. So basically, he's, saying he's been work, working with Vertical for two years. Yeah. Okay, so you have an architecture where you expose the REST endpoints, but you have a lot of different data sources that you need to, to, to deal with to create your, your REST response. So now, so now you have a vertical, and we were talking about the single responsibility principle. So we said that maybe it's a good practice to split the logic of each one of these pieces instead of having just one big vertical. We still believe it's true, but then you have a deployment issue. If you just keep one of these, um, uh, instead of just exploring a huge endpoint, if we provide a one endpoint for each one of the things, you can't bind an HTTP setter in one of this, each one of these ports. Then it generates a DevOps problem because people don't want to have multiple ports being, uh, having to be managed and everything else, okay? Uh, so that's the question. And one of the answers for that, maybe each one of these endpoints could be a microservices. We were talking about microservices. So there's no reason that they could be, uh, they, they, they are required to be in the same jar. It could be each one of each, on its, each own artifacts. So it could be deployed independently. So if you're deploying independently in just one host container, you have the problem of the ports. So maybe you have to create like multiple bindings and, and, and expose that this service works on this, this service works on that, which if you do by hand can be very uh, uh, too much work for, for being done. That's one of the reasons the ops guy might complain and they might be right too, because maybe that's not the reason. One of the things that you can do, instead of integrating all of this logic using REST, you could use it, be using the Vertex event bus for exchanging this kind of information because HTTP in this case is just one of the protocols that you could be using to exchange information. So you could be using the Vertex event bus for that too. That's one of the points. But then you're incurring in a distributed system, a synchronous communication. Then you might want to dig into the world of event or consistency and everything else, which has this, his whole, this whole set of problems and solutions too. So just uh, pick your poison. And, but if you want to manage automatically these multiple artifacts in production environment we have to, without having to manage the sports, one of the things that I could recommend is that instead of having multiple moving parts be exposed to outside, you just create a, a, an API gateway that can aggregate all of the information behind. And for you to, to not have much trouble uh, aggregating, gen generating the ports, uh, everything else, if you're using containers, you could be using an, 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 uh, um, uh, a platform as a service layer. Of course, we, we recommend OpenShift for you because it runs on top of Kubernetes and you get all of that for free. Yeah? I'm not saying because OpenShift is a Red Hat uh, project and product, but because uh, Kubernetes, since OpenShift runs on top of Kubernetes, lots if not of many or all of these problems that we're describing, managing artifacts and ports and routes and everything else, they are already solved on Kubernetes and possibly in other container orchestration platforms in the markets. So maybe the path to solve these problems instead of doing all of this infrastructure by hand is to just create, pick one, we recommend Kubernetes, okay, to be running on your infrastructure. Yes, yes. The comment is to uh, the resuming uh, just a, a compact version of what I said is to, to create a new vertical, which would be an API gateway, then aggregating the different data sources using the event bus. Yes, yes. Perfect. I have another question. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can yeah. talk we'll, we'll come back. We'll, we'll come back. back. So, uh, do you recommend Kubernetes for uh, architect tables in Kubernetes? Yeah, yes, because Kuber, uh, Kubernetes can orchestrate any kind of artifact. What is running inside doesn't matter to Kubernetes as long as it's exposing or doing something. So it's a perfect match for a Vertex 2. So why do you call Vertex React? What's special about the Okay, the question is why we should be using Vertex because we have different... No, you said it's a React event, so yeah. what's special about for being React? How is it different for, from being non-React? 
Mm. The question is, what is special about reactive, and what's the difference between being non-reactive? From the vertex point of view. I'm going to try this one, no? Vertex, um, in, in, it's, it's a kind of uh, controversy what exactly is reactive programming. Some, some, in some place, you call reactive just an event, a distributed event in, in that kind of the architecture that you built right here. But also that other uh, point of view for the reactive, when you use observables, when you use promise, with, for instance, with the Rx Java. We don't show that here in, in our demo, but Vertex also support, Clement, I think it's in version 3 of the, the Rx Java. Yeah, but we do Yeah, we have, you can have obs observables, and instead of doing the, the full HTTP call and receive the response, you can connect to the ob observables and then take that result of that observables and put in the event bus. So you can, it's, it's, your type of question is why, if I got it the correct, why is reactive? Depends on the point of view. For some uh, authors, that what we show that with the event in a distributed event bus where you can connect a, a, a big system is a reactive, but also for other guys that will have to have obs observables and programming that uh, programming model and also vertex support in with uh, ReactJS. I'll answer that question too uh, using a developer point of view instead of a computer science point of view, a distributed science point of view. Since we're, uh, one, of the thing, one of the ways that you can see reactive programming is like, uh, I like to say that you're doing callback based programming. You're just passing a callback that will be invoked when something happens. It may sound weird these days because uh, we've been using Java E, which is all synchronous for uh, many years. But if you get back to the roots, I, I don't know how many. Uh, uh, how many of you are old or, or young as, my, as me? Okay, uh, but uh, we use in the past to program in different programming language, which were interface, desktop interface based. So everything was callback programming because you were just creating handlers to be invoked when something happened, and you never knew that. We just, you know, uh, software development, the, usually the concepts are very cyclical because you always keep going back and forth, and now we're getting back to call base. Uh, callback based programming because of different uh, requirements. And now these requirements that blocking operations on this, with this huge amount of requests that we have today uh, are not enough. We need a way to scale better our resources. So using asynchronous programming, which is harder than synchronous programming, I won't lie to that, uh, about that. Uh, asynchronous programming is harder than that, but we need some parts at least of our software to be written in a reactive way so we can handle at least this huge amount of requests. So if I have to say why any developer should be using reactive programming and uh, Verdex, not because it's cool, but there are some kinds of workloads that the only reasonable way of solving that problem is with reactive programming without paying too much to your cloud provider. Okay, then we are out of time, but feel free to talk to us here. And we have a lot of Vertex experts here, Clement included. Uh, it's the one of the guys that does, the, makes the thing work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for everybody who was watching live. I uh, hope you have enjoyed. Thanks again. Thank you.